The Hanging Stranger by Philip K. Dick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Ed had always been a practical man. When he saw something was wrong, he tried to correct it. Then one day he saw it hanging in the town square. The Hanging Stranger by Philip K. Dick Five o'clock. Ed Loyce washed up, tossed on his hat and coat, got his car out, and headed across town toward his TV sales store. He was tired. His back and shoulders ached, from digging dirt out of the basement and wheeling it into the backyard. But for a forty-year-old man he had done okay. Janet could get a new vase with the money he had saved. And he liked the idea of repairing the foundations himself. It was getting dark. The setting sun cast long rays over the scurrying commuters, tired and grim-faced women loaded down with bundles and packages students swarming home from the university mixing with clerks and businessmen and drab secretaries he stopped his packard for a red light and then started it up again the store had been open without him he'd arrived just in time to spell the help for dinner go over the records of the day maybe even close a couple of sales himself he drove slowly past the small square of green in the center of the street, the town park. There were no parking spaces in front of Lois TV Sales and Service. He cursed under his breath and swung the car in a U-turn. Again he passed the little square of green with its lonely drinking fountain and bench and single lamp post. From the lamp post something was hanging. A shapeless dark bundle swinging a little with the wind like a dummy of some sort Lois rolled down his window and peered out What the hell was it? a display of some kind Sometimes the Chamber of Commerce put up displays in the square Again, he made a u-turn and brought the car around He passed the park and concentrated on the dark bundle it wasn't a dummy and if it was a display it was a strange kind the hackles on his neck rose and he swallowed uneasily sweat slid out on his face and hands it was a body a human body look at it Lois snapped come on out here Don Ferguson came slowly out of the store buttoning his pinstripe coat with dignity this is a big deal, Ed. I can't just leave the guy standing there. See it? Ed pointed at the gathering gloom. The lamppost jutted up against the sky, the post, and the bundle swinging from it. There it is. How the hell long has that been there? His voice rose excitedly. What's wrong with everybody? They just walk on past. Don Ferguson lit a cigarette. Take it easy, old man. There must be a good reason, or it wouldn't be there. A reason? What kind of reason? Ferguson shrugged. Like the time the Traffic Safety Council put the wrecked Buick there. Some sort of civic thing. How would I know? Jack Potter from the shoe shop joined them. What's up, boys? There's a body hanging from the lamp post. Lois said, I'm going to call the cops. They must know about it, Potter said, or otherwise it wouldn't be there. I've got to get back in. Ferguson headed back into the store. Business before pleasure. Lois began to get hysterical. You see it? You see it hanging there? A man's body, a dead man. Sure, Ed, I saw it this afternoon when I went out for coffee. You mean it's been there all afternoon? Sure. What's the matter? Potter glanced at his watch. Have to run. See you later, Ed. 
Potter hurried off, joining the flow of people moving along the sidewalk, men and women passing by the park. A few glanced up curiously at the dark bundle, and then went on. Nobody stopped. Nobody paid any attention. I'm going nuts, Lois whispered. He made his way to the curb and crossed out into traffic among the cars. Horns honked angrily at him. He gained the curb and stepped up into the little square of green. The man had been middle-aged. His clothing was ripped and torn, a gray suit, splashed and caked with dry mud. A stranger. Lois had never seen him before, not a local man. His face was partly turned away, and in the evening wind he spun a little, turning gently, silently. His skin was gouged and cut. Red gashes, deep scratches of congealed blood. A pair of steel-rimmed glasses hung from one ear, dangling foolishly. His eyes bulged. His mouth was open, tongue thick and ugly blue. For heaven's sake, Lois muttered, sickened. He pushed down his nausea and made his way back to the sidewalk. He was shaking all over with revulsion and fear. Why? Who was the man? Why was he hanging there? What did it mean? And why didn't anybody notice? He bumped into a small man hurrying along the sidewalk. Watch it, the man grated. Oh, it's you, Ed. Ed nodded dazily. Hello, Jenkins. What's the matter? The stationery clerk caught Ed's arm. You look sick. The body, there in the park. Sure, Ed. Jenkins led him to the alcove of Lois TV Sales and Service. Take it easy. Margaret Henderson, from the jewelry store, joined them. Something going on? Something wrong? Ed's not feeling well. Lois yanked himself free. How can you stand there? Don't you see it? For God's sake! What's he talking about? Margaret asked nervously. The body, Ed shouted, the body hanging there. More people collected. Is he sick? It's Ed Lois. You okay, Ed? The body! Lois screamed, struggling to get past them. Hands caught at him. He tore loose. Let me go! The police! Get the police! Ed, better get a doctor. He must be sick or drunk. Lois fought his way through the people. He stumbled and half fell. Through a blur he saw two rows of faces, curious, concerned, anxious. Men and women halting to see what the disturbance was. He fought past them toward his store. He could see Ferguson inside, talking to a man, showing him an Emerson TV set. Pete Foley was in the back at the service counter, setting up a new Philco. Lois shouted at them frantically. His voice was lost in the roar of traffic and the murmur around him. Do something, he screamed. Don't stand there. Do something. Something's wrong. Something's happened. Things are going on. The crowd melted respectfully for the two heavy-set cops moving efficiently toward Lois. Name? The cop with the notebook murmured. Lois, he mopped his forehead wearily. Edward C. Lois. Listen to me. Back there. Address? the cop demanded. The police car moved swiftly through traffic, shooting among the cars and bushes. Lois sagged against the seat, exhausted and confused. He took a deep, shuddered breath. 1368 Hearst Road. That's here in Pikeville? That's right. Lois pulled himself up with a violent effort. Listen to me, back there, in the square hanging from the lamp post where were you today the cop behind the wheel demanded where lois echoed you weren't in your shop were you no 
he shook his head no i was home down in the basement in the basement digging a new foundation getting out the dirt to pour the cement frame why what has that got to do with was anybody else down there with you no my wife was downtown my kids were at school lois looked from the one heavy set cop to the other hope flickered across his face wild hope you mean because i was down there i missed the explanation i didn't get in on it like everybody else after a pause the cop with the notebook said that's right you missed the explanation then it's official the body it's supposed to be hanging there it's supposed to be hanging there for everybody to see and lois grinned weakly good lord i guess i sort of went off the deep end i thought maybe something had happened you know something like the ku klux klan some kind of violence communists or fascists taking over he wiped his face with his breast pocket handkerchief his hands shaking i'm glad to know it's on the level it's on the level the police car was getting near the hall of justice the sun had set the streets were gloomy and dark the lights had not yet come on i feel better lois said i was pretty excited back there for a minute i guess i got all stirred up now that i understand there's no need to take me in is there the two cops said nothing i should be back in my store the boys haven't had dinner i'm all right now no more trouble is there any need of this won't take long the cop behind the wheel interrupted a short process only a few minutes i hope it's short lois muttered the car slowed down for a stoplight i guess i sort of disturbed the peace funny getting excited like that and lois yanked open the door he sprang out into the street and rolled to his feet the cars were moving all around him gaining speed as the light changed lois leapt onto the curb and raced among the people burrowing into the swarming crowds behind him he heard sounds shouts people running they weren't cops he had realized that right away he knew every cop in pikeville a man couldn't own a store operate a business in a small town for 25 years without getting to know all the cops they weren't cops and there hadn't been any explanation potter ferguson jenkins none of them knew why it was there they didn't know and they didn't care that was the strange part lois ducked into the hardware store he raced toward the back past the startled clerks and customers into the shipping room and through the back door he tripped over a garbage can and ran up a flight of concrete steps he climbed over a fence and jumped down on the other side gasping and panting there was no sound behind him he had got away he was at the entrance to an alley dark and strewn with boards and ruined boxes and tires he could see the street at the far end a street light wavered and came on men and women stores neon signs cars and to his right the police station he was close terribly close past the loading platform of the grocery store rose the white concrete side of the hall of justice barred windows the police antenna a great concrete wall rising up in the darkness a bad place for him to be near he was too close he had to keep moving get further away from them them lois moved cautiously down the alley beyond the police station was the city hall the old-fashioned yellow structure of wood and gilded brass and broad cement steps 
he could see the endless rows of offices dark windows the cedars and the beds of flowers on each side of the entrance and something else above the city hall was a patch of darkness a cone of gloom denser than the surrounding night a prism a black that spread out and was lost into the sky he listened good god he could hear something something that made him struggle frantically to close his ears his mind to shut out the sound a buzzing a distant muted hum like a great swarm of bees lois gazed up rigid with terror the splotch of darkness hanging over the city hall darkness so thick that it seemed almost solid in the vortex something moved flickering shapes things descending from the sky pausing momentarily above the city hall fluttering over it in a dense swarm then dropping silently onto the roof shapes fluttering shapes from the sky from the crack of darkness that hung above him he was seeing them for a long moment lois watched crouching behind a sagging fence in a pool of scummy water they had landed coming down in groups landing on the roof of the city hall and disappearing inside they had wings like giant insects of some kind they flew and fluttered and came to rest and then crawled crab-like sideways across the roof and into the building he was sickened and fascinated cold night wind blew around him and he shuddered he was tired dazed with shock on the front steps of the city hall were men standing here and there groups of men coming out of the building halting for a moment then going on were there more of them it didn't seem possible what he saw descending from the black chasm weren't men they were alien from some other world some other dimension sliding through this slit this break in the shell of the universe entering through this gap winged insects from another realm of being on the steps of the city hall a group of men broke up a few moved toward a waiting car one of the remaining shapes started to re-enter the city hall it changed its mind and turned to follow the others lois closed his eyes in horror his senses reeled he hung on tight clutching the sagging fence the shape the man shape had abruptly fluttered up and flapped after the others it flew to the sidewalk and came to rest among them pseudo men imitation men insects with the ability to disguise themselves as men like other insects familiar to earth protective coloration mimicry lois pulled himself away he got slowly to his feet it was night the alley was totally dark but maybe they could see in the dark maybe darkness made no difference to them he left the alley cautiously and moved out into the street men and women flowed past but not so many now at the bus stops stood waiting groups a huge bus lumbered along the street its lights flashing in the evening gloom lois moved forward he pushed his way among those waiting and when the bus halted he boarded it and took a seat in the rear by the door a moment later the bus moved into life and rumbled down the street lois relaxed a little he studied the people around him dulled tired faces people going home from work quite ordinary faces none of them paid any attention to him all sat quietly sunk down in their seats jiggling with the motion of the bus the man sitting next to him unfolded a newspaper 
he began to read the sports section, his lips moving. An ordinary man, blue suit, tie, a businessman, or a salesman, on his way home to his wife and family. Across the aisle, a young woman, perhaps twenty, dark eyes and hair, a package on her lap, nylons and heels, red coat and white angora sweater, gazing absently ahead of her. A high school boy in jeans and black jacket. A great triple chinned woman with an immense shopping bag loaded with packages and parcels. Her thick face dim with weariness. Ordinary people, the kind that rode the bus every evening, going home to their families, to dinner, going home with their minds dead, controlled, filmed over with the mask of an alien being that had appeared and taken possession of them, their town, their lives. Himself, too, except that he happened to be deep in his cellar instead of in the store. Somehow he had been overlooked. They had missed him. Their control wasn't perfect, foolproof. Maybe there were others. Hope flickered in Lois. They weren't omnipotent. They had made a mistake, not got control of him. Their net, their field of control, had passed over him. He had emerged from his cellar as he had gone down. Apparently, their power zone was limited. A few seats down the aisle, a man was watching him. Lois broke off his chain of thought. A slender man with dark hair and small mustache. Well-dressed, brown suit and shiny shoes. A book between his small hands. He was watching Lois, studying him intently. He turned quickly away. Lois tensed. One of them? Or another they had missed? The man was watching him again, small dark eyes, alive and clever, shrewd, a man too shrewd for them. Or one of the things itself, an alien insect from beyond. The bus halted. An elderly man got on slowly and dropped his token into the box. He moved down the aisle and took a seat opposite Lois. The elderly man caught the sharp-eyed man's gaze. For a split second, something passed between them. A look rich with meaning. Lois got to his feet. The bus was moving. He ran to the door, one step down into the well. He yanked the emergency door release. The rubber door swung open. Hey! the driver shouted, jamming the brakes. What the hell? Lois squirmed through. The bus was slowing down. Houses on all sides. A residential district. Lawns and tall apartment buildings. Behind him, the bright-eyed man had leapt up. The elderly man was also on his feet. They were coming after him. Lois leapt. He hit the pavement with a terrific force and rolled against the curb. Pain lapped over him. Pain and a vast tide of blackness. Desperately, he fought it off. He struggled to his knees and then slid down again. The bus had stopped. People were getting off. Lois groped around. His fingers closed over something. A rock lying in the gutter. He crawled to his feet, grunting with pain. A shape loomed before him. A man, the bright-eyed man with the book. Lois kicked. The man gasped and fell. Lois brought the rock down. The man screamed and tried to roll away. Stop! For God's sake, listen! He struck again, a hideous crunching sound. The man's voice cut off and dissolved in a bubbling wail. Lois scrambled up and back. The others were there, all around him. He ran awkwardly down the sidewalk, up the driveway. 
none of them followed him. They had stopped, and were bending over the inert body of the man with the book, the bright-eyed man who had come after him. Had he made a mistake? But it was too late to worry about that. He had to get out, away from them, out of Pikeville, beyond the crack of darkness, the rent between their world and his. Ed! Janet Loyce backed away nervously. What is it? What? Ed slammed the door behind him and came into the living room. Pull down the shades, quick. Janet moved toward the window. But... Do as I say. Who else is here besides you? Nobody. Just the twins. They're upstairs in their room. What's happened? You look so strange. Why are you home? Ed locked the front door. He prowled around the house, into the kitchen. From the drawer under the sink he slid out the big butcher knife and ran his finger along it. Sharp. Plenty sharp. He returned to the living room. Listen to me, he said. I don't have much time. They know I escaped, and they'll be looking for me. Escaped? Janet's face twisted with bewilderment and fear. Who? The town has been taken over. They're in control. I've got it plenty well figured out. They started at the top, at the city hall, and the police department. What they did with the real humans, they... What are you talking about? We've been invaded. From some other universe, some other dimension. They're insects, mimicry, and more. Power to control minds. Your mind. My mind? Their entrance is here in Pikeville. They've taken over all of you. The whole town. Except me. We're up against an incredibly powerful enemy. But they have their limitations. That's our hope. They're limited. They can make mistakes. Janet shook her head. I don't understand, Ed. You must be insane. Insane? No, just lucky. If I hadn't been down in the basement, I'd be like all the rest of you. Lois peered out the window. But I can't stand here talking. Get your coat. My coat? We're getting out of here. Out of Pikeville. We've got to get help. Fight this thing. They can be beaten. They're not infallible. It's going to be close, but we may make it if we hurry. Come on. He grabbed her arm roughly. Get your coat and call the twins. We're all leaving. Don't stop to pack. There's no time for that. White-faced, his wife moved toward the closet and got down her coat. Where are we going? Ed pulled open the desk drawer and spilled the contents out on the floor. He grabbed up a road map and spread it open. They have the highways covered, of course, but there's a back road to Oak Grove. I got onto it once. It's practically abandoned. Maybe they'll forget about it. The old ranch road? Good Lord, it's completely closed. Nobody's supposed to drive over it. I know. Ed thrust the map grimly into his coat. That's our best chance. Now call down the twins and let's get going. Your car is full of gas, isn't it? Janet was dazed. The Chevy? I had it filled up yesterday afternoon. Janet moved toward the stairs. Ed, I... Call the twins. Ed unlocked the front door and peered out. Nothing stirred. No sign of life. All right so far. Come on downstairs, Janet called in a wavering voice. We're going out for a while. Now, Tommy's voice came. Hurry up, Ed barked. Get down here, both of you. Tommy appeared at the top of the stairs. I was doing my homework. We're starting fractions. Miss Parker said if we don't get this done... You can forget about fractions. Ed grabbed his son as he came down the stairs and propelled him toward the door. Where's Jim? He's coming. Jim started down the stairs. What's up, Dad? We're going for a ride. A ride? Where? 
Ed turned to Janet. We'll leave the lights on and the TV set. Go turn it on. He pushed her toward the set. So they'll think we're still... He heard the buzz and dropped instantly the long butcher knife out. Sickened, he saw it coming down the stairs at him, wings a blur of motion as it aimed itself. It still bore a vague resemblance to Jimmy. It was small, a baby one. A brief glimpse, the thing hurtled at him, cold, multi-lensed, inhuman eyes. Wings, body still clothed in yellow t-shirt and jeans, the mimicked outline still stamped on it. A strange half-turn of its body as it reached him. What was it doing? A stinger. Lois stabbed wildly at it. It retreated, buzzing frantically. Lois rolled and crawled toward the door. Tommy and Janet stood still as statues, faces blank, watching without expression. Lois stabbed again. This time the knife connected. The thing shrieked and faltered. It bounced against the wall and fluttered down. Something lapped through his mind. A wall of force energy, an alien mind probing into him. He was suddenly paralyzed. The mind entered his own, touching against him briefly, shockingly. An utterly alien presence settled over him, and then it flickered out as the thing collapsed in a broken heap on the rug. It was dead. He turned it over with his foot. It was an insect. A fly of some kind. Yellow t-shirt, jeans, his son Jimmy. He closed his mind tight. It was too late to think about that. Savagely, he scooped up his knife and headed toward the door. Janet and Tommy stood stone still, neither of them moving. The car was out. He'd never get through. They'd been waiting for him. It was ten miles on foot, ten long miles, over rough country, gullies, and open fields, and hills of uncut forest. He'd have to go alone. Lois opened the door. For a brief second, he looked back at his wife and son. Then he slammed the door behind him and raced down the porch steps. A moment later, he was on his way hurrying swiftly through the darkness toward the edge of town. The early morning sunlight was blinding. Lois halted, gasping for breath, swaying back and forth. Sweat ran down in his eyes. His clothing was torn, shredded by the bushes and thorns through which he had crawled. Ten miles on his hands and knees, crawling, creeping through the night, his shoes were mud-caked. He was scratched and limping, utterly exhausted. But ahead of him lay Oak Grove. He took a deep breath and started down the hill. Twice he stumbled and fell, picking himself up and trudging on. His ears rang. Everything receded and wavered. But he was there. He had got out, away from Pikeville. A farmer in a field gaped at him. From a house a young woman watched in wonder. Lois reached the road and turned into it. Ahead of him was a gasoline station and a drive-in. A couple of trucks, some chickens pecking in the dirt, a dog tied with a string. The white-clad attendant watched suspiciously as he dragged himself up to the station. Thank God! He caught hold of the wall. I didn't think I was going to make it. They followed me most of the way. I could hear them buzzing, buzzing and flitting around behind me. What happened? the attendant demanded. You in a wreck? A hold up? Lois shook his head wearily. They have the whole town, the city hall and the police station. They hung a man from the lamp post. That was the first thing I saw. They've got all the roads blocked. I saw them hovering over the cars coming in. About four this morning, 
I got beyond them. I knew it right away. I could feel them leave. And then the sun came up. The young attendant licked his lips nervously. You're out of your head. I better get a doctor. Get me into Oak Grove, Lois gasped. He sank down on the gravel. We've got to get started cleaning them out. Got to get started right away. They kept a tape recorder going all the time he talked. When he had finished, the commissioner snapped off the recording and got to his feet. He stood for a moment, deep in thought. Finally, he got out his cigarettes and lit up slowly, a frown on his beefy face. You don't believe me? Lois said. The commissioner offered him a cigarette. Lois pushed it impatiently away. Suit yourself. The commissioner moved over to the window and stood for a time looking out at the town of Oak Grove. I believe you, he said abruptly. Lois staggered. Thank God! So you got away, the commissioner shook his head. You were down in your cellar instead of at work. A freak chance. One in a million. Lois sipped some of the black coffee they had brought him. I have a theory, he murmured. What is it? About them, who they are. They take over one area at a time, starting at the top, the highest level of authority, working down from there in a widening circle. When they're firmly in control, they go on to the next town. They spread, slowly, very gradually. I think it's been going on for a long time. A long time? Thousands of years. I don't think it's new. Why do you say that? When I was a kid, a picture they showed us in Bible League, a religious picture, an old print, the enemy gods defeated by Jehovah. Moloch, Beelzebub, Moab, Baalin, Ashtaroth. So? They were all represented by figures, Lois looked up at the commissioner. Beelzebub was represented as a giant fly. The commissioner grunted an old struggle. They've been defeated. The Bible is an account of their defeats. They made gains, but finally they're defeated. Why defeated? They can't get everyone. They didn't get me, and they never got the Hebrews. The Hebrews carried the message to the whole world. The realization of the danger. The two men on the bus. I think they understood had escaped like I did. He clenched his fists. I killed one of them. I made a mistake. I was afraid to take a chance. The commissioner nodded. Yes, they undoubtedly had escaped, as you did. Freak accidents. But the rest of the town is firmly in control. He turned from the window. Well, Mr. Lois, you seem to have figured everything out. Not everything. The hanging man. The dead man hanging from the lamppost. I don't understand that. Why? Why did they deliberately hang him there? That would seem simple. The commissioner smiled faintly. Bait. Lois stiffened. His heart stopped beating. Bait? What do you mean? to draw you out, to make you declare yourself, so they'd know who was under control and who had escaped. Lois recoiled with horror. Then they expect failures. They anticipated. He broke off. They were ready with a trap. And you showed yourself. You reacted. You made yourself known. The commissioner abruptly moved toward the door. Come along, Lois. There's a lot to do. We must get moving. There's no time to waste. Lois started slowly to his feet, numbed. And the man? Who was the man? I never saw him before. He wasn't a local man. He was a stranger, all muddy and dirty, his face cut, 
slashed there was a strange look on the commissioner's face as he answered maybe he said softly you'll understand that too come along with me mr loyce he held the door open his eyes gleaming loyce caught a glimmer of the street in front of the police station policeman a platform of some sort a telephone pole and a rope right this way the commissioner said smiling coldly as the sun set the vice president of the oak grove merchants bank came up out of the vault through the heavy time locks put on his hat and coat and hurried outside onto the sidewalk only a few people were there hurrying home for dinner good night the guard said locking the door after him good night clarence mason murmured he started along the street toward his car he was tired he had been working all day down in the vault examining the layout of the safety deposit boxes to see if there was room for another tier he was glad to be finished at the corner he halted the street lights had not yet come on the street was dim everything was vague he looked around and froze from the telephone pole in front of the police station something large and shapeless hung it moved a little with the wind what the hell was it mason approached it warily he wanted to get home he was tired and hungry he thought of his wife his kids a hot meal on the dinner table but there was something about the dark bundle something ominous and ugly the light was bad he couldn't tell what it was yet it drew him on made him move closer for a better look the shapeless thing made him uneasy he was frightened by it frightened and fascinated the strange part was that nobody else seemed to notice it. The End of The Hanging Stranger by Philip K. Dick The Beachcomber by Damon Knight This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Alice saw the beachcomber as a glorious hunk of man. Maxwell saw him as a super being from the future. Tragically, he was both. The Beachcomber by Damien Knight. Maxwell and the girl started their weekend on Thursday in Venice. Friday they went to Paris, Saturday to Nice, and on Sunday they were bored. Alice pouted at him across the breakfast table. Vernon, let's go someplace else, she said. Sure, said Maxwell, not too graciously. Don't you want your bug eggs? Alice pushed them away. If I ever did, I don't now. Why do you have to be so unpleasant in the morning? The eggs were insect eggs, all right, but they were on the menu as Oof's Procyon Thibault, and three-and-a-half-inch brown spheres cost about one thousand times their value in calories. Maxwell was well paid as a scriptwriter for the North American Unit Ministry of Information. He bossed a gang of six gag men on the comic cocktail show, but he was beginning to hate to think about what these five days were costing him. "'Where do you want to go?' asked Maxwell. Their coffee came out of the conveyor, steaming and fragrant, and he sipped his moodily. "'Want to run over to Algiers? Or up to Stockholm?' "'No,' said Alice. She leaned forward across the table and put up one long white hand to keep her honey-colored hair out of her eyes. You don't know what I mean. I mean, 
Let's go to some other planet. Maxwell choked slightly and spilled coffee on the tabletop. Europe is all right, Alice was saying with disdain. But it's all getting to be just like Chicago. Let's go someplace different for once. And be back by tomorrow noon, Maxwell demanded. It's ten hours even to Proxima. We'd have just time to turn around and get back on the liner. Alice dropped her long lashes, contriving to look inviting and sullen at the same time. Not bad at that, Maxwell thought, for ten o'clock in the morning. You couldn't get Monday off, I suppose, she said, giving him her A number one smile. We could have so much fun together. They took the liner to Gamma Tauri Four, the clearing point for the system, then transferred to the interplanetary shuttle for three. Three was an almost undeveloped planet. There were perhaps a hundred cities near the equator and some mines and plantations in the temperate zone. The rest was nothing but scenery. Maxwell had heard about it from people in the ministry. He'd been warned to go within a year or so if he went at all. After that, it would be as full of tourists as Proxima II. Scenery was worth the trip. Sitting comfortably on their rented air scooters, stripped to shorts and singlets, with a polarizing sunscreen moderating the blazing heat of Gamma Tauri, Maxwell and the girl could look in any horizontal direction and see a thousand square miles of exuberant blue-green foliage. Two hundred feet below, the tops of gigantic tree ferns waved spasmodically in the breeze. They were following a chain of low mountains that bisected the continent. The treetops sloped away abruptly on either side showing a glimpse of reddish-brown undergrowth and merged into a sea of blue-green that became bluer and mistier toward the horizon. A flying thing moved lazily across the clear, cumulus-dotted sky, perhaps half a mile away. Maxwell trained his binoculars on it. It was an absurd lozenge with six pairs of wings. An insect, perhaps. He couldn't tell. He heard a raucous cry down below, not far away, and glanced down, hoping to see one of the carnivores, but the ripping sea of foliage was unbroken. He watched Alice breathing deeply. Maxwell grinned. Her face was shiny with perspiration and pleasure. "'Where to now?' he asked. The girl peered to the right, where a glint of silver shone on the horizon. Is that the sea over there? she asked. If it is, let's go look for a nice beach and have our lunch. There were no nice beaches. They were all covered with inch-thick pebbles instead of sand. But Alice kept wanting to try the next place. After each abortive approach, they went up to 2,000 feet to survey the shoreline. Alice pointed and said, There's a nice-looking one. Oh, there's somebody on it. Maxwell looked and saw a tiny figure moving along the shore. Maybe somebody I know, he said, and focused his binoculars. He saw a broad, naked back, dark against the silvery sea. The man was stooping, looking at something on the beach. The figure straightened, and Maxwell saw a blazing crest of blonde hair. Then a strongly modeled nose and chin of a young man turned. Uh-oh, he said, lowering the binoculars. Alice was staring intently through the binoculars. Isn't he handsome? she breathed. Do you know him? Yeah, said Maxwell. That's the beachcomber. I interviewed him a couple of times. We'd better leave him be. Alice kept staring. Honestly, she said, I never saw such a... Look, Vernie, he's waving at us. Maxwell looked again. The beachcomber's face was turned up directly toward them. As Maxwell watched, the man's lips moved unmistakably in syllables of his name. 
Maxwell shortened the range and saw that the beachcomber was indeed waving. He also saw something he had missed before. The man was stark naked. He's recognized me, he said with mingled emotions. Now we'll have to go down. Alice took her eyes away from the binoculars for the first time since they had sighted the man. That's silly, she said. How could he? Vernon, you don't mean he can see us clearly from that far away. Maxwell waved back to the tiny figure and mouthed silently. Coming right down. Put some pants on, damn it. He said to Alice, that's not all he can do. Weren't you listening when I said he's a beachcomber? They started down on a long slant as the little figure below moved toward the jungle's edge. The who? said Alice, looking through the binoculars again. Watch where you're going, said Maxwell, more sharply than he had intended. I'm sorry. Who is he, dear? The beachcomber, the man from the future. Haven't you seen a newscast for the last five years? I only tune in for the sports and fashions, Alice said abstractly. Then her mouth formed an O. My goodness! Is he the one who— The same, said Maxwell. The one who gave us the inertialist drive, the anti-friction field, the math to solve the three-body problem, and about a thousand other things. The guy from three million years in the future, and the loneliest man in all creation, probably. This is the planet he showed up on five years ago, now that I come to think of it. I guess he spends most of his time here. But why? asked Alice. She looked toward the tiny beach, which was now vacant. Her expression, Maxwell thought, said that there were better uses to which he could put himself. Maxwell snorted. Did you ever read? He corrected himself. Alice obviously never read. Did you ever see one of the old films about the South Seas? Ever hear of civilized men going native or becoming beachcombers? Alice said, yes, a trifle uncertainly. All right. Imagine a man stranded in a universe full of savages. Pleasant, harmless savages, maybe but people who are three million years away from his culture. What's he going to do? Go native or comb the beaches? That's right, Maxwell told her. His only two alternatives, and either one is about as bad as the other from his point of view. Conform to native customs, settle down, marry, lose everything that makes him a civilized man, or just simply go to hell by himself. That's what he's doing? Right. Well, but what is he combing those beaches for? Maxwell frowned. Don't be a cretin. These particular beaches have nothing to do with it. He just happened to be on one at the moment. He's a beachcomber, because he lives like a bum. Doesn't do any work, doesn't see people, just loafs and wants to be old enough to die. That's awful, said Alice. It's such a waste. In more ways than one, Maxwell added dryly. But what do you want? There's only one place he can be happy three million years from now, and he can't go back. He says there isn't any place to go back to. I don't know what he means. He refuses to clarify that point. The beachcomber was standing motionless by the edge of the forest as their scooters floated down to rest on the pebbly beach. He was wearing a pair of stained, weathered, duroplast shorts, but nothing else. No hat to protect his great domed head, no sandals on his feet, no equipment, not even a knife at his belt. Yet Maxwell knew that there were flesh-eaters in the jungle that would gobble a man outside the force field of his scooter in about a half a second. Knowing the beachcomber, none of this surprised him. 
Whether it occurred to Alice to be surprised at any of it, he couldn't tell. She was eating the beachcomber with her eyes as he walked toward them. Maxwell, swearing silently to himself, turned off his scooter's field and stepped down. Alice did the same. I only hope that she can keep from trying to flirt with him, Maxwell thought. Aloud, he said, How's it, Di? All right, said the beachcomber. Up close, he ceased to be merely impressive and became a little frightening. He stood over seven feet tall, and there was an incredible strength in every line of him. His clear skin looked resilient, but hard. Maxwell privately doubted that you could cut it with a knife. But it was the eyes that were really impressive. They had the same disquieting, alien quality as an eagle's. Die never pulled his rank on anybody. He went native perfectly when he had to, for social purposes. But he couldn't help making a normal, human adult feel like a backward child. Die, I'd like you to meet Alice Zwirling. The beachcomber acknowledged the introduction with effortless courtesy. Alice nearly beat herself to death with her eyelashes. She managed to stumble very plausibly as they walked down to the water's edge and put a hand on the giant's arm for support. He righted her casually with the flat of his hand on her back, at the same time giving a slight push that put her a step or two in advance and went on talking to Maxwell. They sat down on the water's edge and Di pumped Maxwell for the latest news on Earth. He seemed genuinely interested. Maxwell didn't know whether it was an act or not, but he talked willingly and well. The beachcomber threw an occasional question Alice's way, just enough to keep her in the conversation. Maxwell saw her gathering her forces and grinned to himself. There was a pause, and Alice cleared her throat. Both men looked at her politely. Alice said, Di, are there really man-eating animals in this jungle? Vernon said so, but we haven't seen a one all the time we've been here. And, her gaze ran down the beachcomber's smooth, naked torso, and she blushed very prettily. I mean, she added, and stopped again. The beachcomber said, Sure, there are lots of them. They don't bother me, though. She said earnestly, You mean you walk around like that in the jungle and nothing can hurt you? That's it. Alice drove the point home. Could you protect another person who was with you, too? I guess I could. Alice smiled radiantly. Why, that's too good to be true. I was just telling Vernon before we saw you down here that I wished I could go into the jungle without the scooter to see all the wild animals and things. Will you take me in for a little walk, Di? Vernon can mind the scooters. You wouldn't mind, would you, Vernie? Maxwell started to reply, but the beachcomber forestalled him. I assure you, Miss Whirling, he said slowly, that it would be a waste of your time and mine. Alice blushed again, this time not so prettily. Just what do you mean? she demanded. Di looked at her gravely. I'm not quite such a wild man as I seem, he said. I always wear trousers in mixed company, he repeated with emphasis. Always. Alice's lips grew hard and thin, and the skin whitened around them. Her eyes glittered. She started to say something to the beachcomber, but the words stuck in her throat. She turned to Maxwell. I think we'd better go. We just got here, Maxwell said mildly. Stick around. She stood up. Are you coming? Nope, said Maxwell. Without another word, she turned walked stiffly to her scooter, got in, and soared away. They watched the tiny, shining speck dwindle and disappear over the horizon. Maxwell grinned 
and looked at the beachcomber. She had that coming, he said. Not that she's out anything. She's got a return ticket. He put a hand behind him to hoist himself to his feet. I'll be going now, Di. Nice to have... No, stay a while, Vern, said the giant. I don't often see people. He looked moodily off across the water. I didn't spoil anything for you, I hope. Nothing special, Maxwell said. Only my current light of love. The giant turned and stared at him, half frowning. What the hell, said Maxwell disgustedly. There are plenty of other pebbles on the beach. Don't say that. The beachcomber's face contorted in a blaze of fury. He made a chopping motion with his forearm. Violent as it was, the motion came nowhere near Maxwell. Something else, something that felt like the pure essence of wrath, struck him and bowled him over, knocking the breath from him. He sat up, a yard from the giant, eyes popping foolishly. What? he said. There was pain and confusion in the beachcomber's eyes. I'm sorry, he said. He helped Maxwell up. I don't often forget myself that way. Will you forgive me? Maxwell's chest was still numb. It was hard to breathe. Don't know, he said with difficulty. What did you do it for? Sunlight gleamed dazzlingly on the beachcomber's bare head. His eyes were in deep shadow, and the shadow stretched the bold outline of his nose, marked the firm, bitter lines of his mouth. He said, You've offended me. He paused. I'll explain, Vernon, but there's one condition. You must never tell anyone else, ever. He put his big hand on Maxwell's wrist, and Maxwell felt the power that flows from him. Almost hypnotically, he knew he would never be able to. He was aware his mind was being schooled in what to remember. All right, said Maxwell. A curious complexity of emotions boiled inside him. Anger and petulance, curiosity, and something else deeper down, a vague, objectiveless fear. Go ahead. The beachcomber talked. After a few minutes, he seemed almost to forget Maxwell. He stared out across the silver sea, and Maxwell, half hypnotized by the deep, resonant voice, watched his hawk-like profile in silence. Dimly, he saw the universe the beachcomber spoke of a universe of men set free. Over that inconceivable gap of time that stretched between Maxwell's time and theirs, they had purged themselves of all their frailties. Maxwell saw them striding across the stars, as much at home in the pitiless void as on the verdant planets they loved. He saw them, tall and faultless and strong, handsome men and beautiful women, all with the power that glowed in the beachcomber, but without a hint of his sadness. He tried to imagine what the daily life of those people must be like, and couldn't. It was three million years beyond his comprehension. But when he looked at the beachcomber's face, he knew that the last men were human beings like himself, capable of love, hate, and despair. We had mating customs that would seem peculiar to you, said the beachcomber after a while. Like elephants. Because we were so long-lived, you know. We married late, and it was for life. My marriage was about to take place when we found the enemy. The enemy, said Maxwell, but didn't you say you were the only dominant life form in the whole universe? That's right. The beachcomber outlined an egg-shaped figure with a motion of his cupped hands, carelessly. The universe, all of it, 
everything that exists in this space it was all ours but the enemy didn't come from this universe another dimension maxwell asked the beachcomber looked puzzled another he said and stopped i thought i could say it better than in english but i can't dimension isn't right call it another timeline that's a little closer another universe like ours coexisting with this one anyhow said maxwell no not the same as ours at all different laws different he stopped again well can you describe the enemy ugly said the beachcomber promptly we'd been searching other dimensions if you want to use that word for thousands of years and this was the first intelligent race we found we hated them on sight he paused if i drew you a picture it would look like a little spiny cylinder but a picture won't convey it i can't explain his mouth contracted with distaste go on said maxwell what happened they invaded you no we tried to destroy them we broke up the crystal spider webs they built between their worlds we smashed their suns but more than a quarter of them survived our first attack and then we knew we were beaten they were as powerful as we were more so in some ways wait i don't get it said maxwell unbelievingly you attacked them without provocation wiped out three quarters of them simply because there was no possible peace between us and them said the beachcomber and it was only a matter of time before they discovered us it was simply chance that we made the contact first what would an unspoiled south sea islander have made of the first atomic war maxwell wondered morals of one society don't apply to another he knew still was it possible that the beachcombers people maxwell's own descendants still had a taint of the old adam and was it accidental that they were the only dominant life form in the entire universe or had they eliminated all other contenders not for him to judge he decided but he didn't like it he said then what they counterattacked yes we had time to prepare and we knew what we were going to do the trouble was there simply was no defense against it he noticed maxwell's wry smile not like the planet busters there is a defense against those you just haven't found it yet but there actually was no defense whatever against their weapon they were going to destroy our universe down to the last quantum wipe it right out of the series make a blank where it had been and said maxwell he was beginning to understand why the beachcomber had never told this story to anyone else why the public at large must never know it there was a feeling of doom in it that might color everything men did it was possible he supposed to live with the knowledge that the end of it all was death but fatalism was the mark of a dying culture and there was just one thing we could do said the beachcomber not a defense but a trick at the instant before their weapon was due to take effect we planned to bring our universe back three million years along its own timeline it would vanish just as if it had been destroyed then if it worked we'd be able to return but on a different timeline because obviously on our timeline nothing like this double back had already happened changing the past changes the future you know the theory yeah so you were too late is that it you got away but all the rest were destroyed the timing was perfect said the beachcomber all the calculations were perfect there's a natural limit to the distance in time any mass can travel and we managed to meet it exactly three million years 
I wish we hadn't. If we hadn't, I could go back again. He stopped, and his jaw hardened. There isn't much more to tell, he said. I happen to be chosen to execute the plan. It was a great honor, but not an easy one to accept. Remember, I was about to be married. If anything went wrong, it meant we'd be separated forever. We couldn't even die together. But I accepted. I had one day with her. One day. And then I set up the fields and waited for the attack. Just one microsecond before it would have reached us, I released the energy that was channeled through me. And the next instant, I was falling into the ocean out there. He turned a tormented face to Maxwell. It was the worst possible luck, he said. You can see for yourself there is less chance of my landing anywhere near a planet than of finding one given pebble on all the beaches of this planet. Maxwell felt as if he'd missed the point of the joke. I still don't understand, he said. You said you landed. But what about the universe? Where did it... The beachcomber made an impatient gesture. You don't think we could bring it back into a space it already occupied, do you? It was in stasis, all but a fraction out of this timeline. Just a miniature left, so that it could be controlled. A model of the universe, so big. He spread his thumb and forefinger an inch apart. Just a pebble. Maxwell's jaw dropped open. He stared at the giant. You don't mean... you... Oh, yes, said the beachcomber. I landed about twenty miles out from shore, five years ago. He stared out across the sea, while his fingers groped nervously among the pebbles at his feet. And when I hit the water, he said, I dropped it. The End of The Beachcomber by Damon Knight The Man Who Made the World by Richard Matheson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The patient was obviously deranged, but Dr. Janoshevsky had to make sure first. So he sat back in his chair and began to question The Man Who Made the World. By Richard Matheson. Dr. Janiszewski sat in his office, leaning back in the great leather chair, hands folded. He had a reflective air and a well trimmed goatee. He hummed a few bars of, It ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. He broke off and looked up with a kindly smile as the nurse entered. Her name is Mud. Nurse Mud. Doctor, there is a man in the waiting room that says he made the world. Dr. J. Oh? Nurse Mud, shall I let him in? Dr. J. By all means, Nurse Mud, show the man in. Nurse Mud left. A small man entered. He was five foot five, wearing a suit made for a man six foot five. His hands were near hidden by the sleeve ends. His trouser leg bottoms creased sharply at the shoe tops, assuming the function of unattached spats. The shoes were virtually invisible, as was the gentleman's mouth lurking behind a mustache of mouse like proportions. Dr. J. Won't you have a seat, Mr. Smith? Smith! He sits. Dr. J. Now! They regard each other. Dr. J. My nurse tells me you made the world. Smith. Yes, in a confessional tone. I did. Dr. J. Settling back in his chair. All of it? Smith. Yes. Dr. J. And everything in it? Smith. Take a little, give a little. 
Dr. J. You're sure of this? Smith, with an expression that clearly says, I am telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me. Quite sure. Dr. J. nods once. When did you do this thing? Smith, five years ago. Dr. J., how old are you? Smith, 47. Dr. J., where were you the other 42 years? Smith, I wasn't. Dr. J., you mean you started out, Smith, 42 years old. That's correct. Dr. J., but the world is millions of years old. Smith, shaking his head. No, it isn't. Dr. J., it's five years old? Smith, that's correct. Dr. J., what about fossils? What about the age of rocks? Uranium into lead? What about diamonds? Smith, not to be bothered. Illusions. Dr. J., you made them up? Smith, that's... Dr. J., break again. Why? Smith, to see if I could. Dr. J., I don't... Smith, anyone can make a world. It takes ingenuity to make one, and then make the people on it think that it's existed for millions of years. Dr. J., how long did all this take you? Smith, three and a half months, world time. Dr. J., what do you mean by that? Smith, before I made the world, I lived beyond time. Dr. J., where's that? Smith, nowhere. Dr. J, in the cosmos? Smith, that's correct. Dr. J, you didn't like it there? Smith, no, it was boring. Dr. J, and that's why, Smith, I made the world. Dr. J, yes, but how did you make it? Smith, I had books. Dr. J, books? Smith. Instruction books. Dr. J. Where did you get them? Smith. I made them up. Dr. J. You mean you wrote them? Smith. I made them up. Dr. J. How? Smith. Mustache bristling truculently. I made them up. Dr. J. Lips pursed. So there you were out in the cosmos with a handful of books. Smith, that's correct. Dr. J. What if you drop them? Smith chooses not to answer this patent absurdity. Dr. J. Mr. Smith. Smith. Yes. Dr. J. Who made you? Smith shakes his head. Don't know. Dr. J. Were you always like this? He points at Mr. Smith's lower frame. Smith, I don't think so. I think that I was punished. Dr. J, for what? Smith, for making the world so complicated. Dr. J, I should think so. Smith, it's not my fault. I just made it. I didn't say it would work right. Dr. J, you just started your machine and then walked away. Smith, that's Dr. J. Then what are you doing here? Smith, I told you, I think I've been punished. Dr. J, oh yes, for making it too complicated. I forgot. Smith, that's correct. Dr. J, who punished you? Smith, I don't remember. Dr. J, that's convenient. Smith looks morose. Dr. J, might it be God? Smith shrugs it might dr j he might have a few fingers in the rest of the universe smith he might but i made the world dr j enough mr smith you did not make the world smith insulted yes i did too dr j and you created me smith concedingly indirectly Dr. J, then uncreate me. Smith, I can't. Dr. J, why? Smith, 
I just started things. I can't control them now. Dr. J. Sighs. Then what are you worried about, Mr. Smith? Smith. I have a premonition. Dr. J. What about? Smith. I'm going to die. Dr. J. So? Smith. Somebody has to take over. Or else. Dr. J. Or else? Smith. The whole world will go. Dr. J. Go where? Smith. No where. Just disappear. Dr. J. How can it disappear if it works independently of you? Smith. It will be taken away to punish me. Dr. J. You? Smith. Yes. Dr. J. You mean if you die the entire world will disappear? Smith. That's correct. Dr. J. If I shot you, the instant you died I would disappear? Smith. That's... Dr. J. I have advice. Smith. Yes, you will help? Dr. J. Go and see a reputable psychiatrist. Smith. Standing. I should have known. I have no more to say. Dr. J. Shrugged. As you will. Smith. I'll go, but you'll be sorry about this. Dr. J. I dare say you are already sorry, Mr. Smith. Smith. Goodbye. Mr. Smith exits. Dr. Janiszewski calls his nurse over the intercom. Nurse Mudd returns. Nurse M. Yes, doctor? Doctor. Nurse Mudd, stand by the window and tell me what you see. Nurse M. What? I... Dr. J. What you see. I want you to tell me what Mr. Smith does after he comes out of the building. Nurse M. Shrugs. Yes, doctor. She goes to the window. Dr. J. Has he come out yet? Nurse M. No. Dr. J. Keep watching. Nurse M. There he is. He's stepping off the curb. He's walking across the street. Dr. J. Yes. Nurse M. He's stopped now in the middle of the street. He's turning. He's looking up at this window. There's a look of of realization on his face he's coming back ah he's been hit by a car he's lying on the street dr j what is it nurse mud nurse m reeling everything is is fading dr janiszewski it's fading ah dr j don't be absurd nurse mud look at me can you honestly say that he stops talking she cannot honestly say anything. She is not there. Dr. Janiszewski, who is not really Dr. Janiszewski, floats alone in the cosmos in his chair, which is not really a chair. He looks at the chair beside him. I hope you've learned your lesson. I'm going to put your toy back, but don't you dare go near it. So you're bored, are you? Scallywag. You just behave yourself, or I'll take away your books, too. He snorts. So you made them up, did you? He looks around. Now pick them up, Jack and Apes. Smith, who is not really Smith. Yes, Father. The End of The Man Who Made the World by Richard Matheson A message from our sponsor by Henry Slazer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. A foot in the door technique would work perfectly for any salesman if he had an invisible foot. A message from our sponsor by Henry Slazer. And that was Smokey Donahue's Western Swingers playing Red Dust for all you Martian fans out there. Now let's take a look at the new recordings, hot off the presses this week, from all over the system. Looks like we have a real treat for you tonight, folks.
That's a brand new label from way out in outer space. Yes, sir, the very first recording put on wax by the Martian Recording Company. And it ought to be a Lulu. We'll spin it for you in just a minute. But first, here's a message from our sponsor, the Oxygen Corporation of America, Earth's oldest and finest manufacturers of compressed oxygen equipment. Friends, when you're scooting around in your little rocket roadster, do you ever stop to think that your fine vehicle deserves nothing but the best in equipment and accessories? Well, next time, take a look at your oxygen tanks. Are you still using the cumbersome, old, outmoded tank with ugly valves and low capacity? Wouldn't you rather have the new, streamlined Oxco tank that gives you a month of service without refilling? Models cost as low as $4,000, and they're guaranteed up to a full year. Call your local rocket supply store today and get all the facts. When you see the new Oxco, you'll know why we say, Oxco never leaves you breathless. Well, I see Jonesy, our control board operator, waving at me like mad, folks. He wants to hear this new disc from Mars, too. So, without further ado, here we go. It's on the canal label, and it's called Melancholy. The boss slammed the file drawer shut in disgust. The Martian, standing before his desk, shuffled his feet and rotated his cap with his third hand. Displease you, he said. Come back, other time do? No, Hubert pointed to the chair. You sit down. We're going to straighten this whole thing out right now. He reached across the desk and snapped on the intercom. Davis, he said. We're going to have a foreman's meeting this minute. Davis, at the other end, was inclined to argue, but the boss stopped him. Don't tell me we're busy. I know our production schedule better than you do. Get the foreman up here, right away. The foreman shuffled in ten minutes later. They looked sheepish, like small boys caught in the jam pot. Huber got right to the point. You boys have been picking on Chafnu again, and I won't stand for it. He slapped the desk with a board-like palm for emphasis. Curly, the foreman, said, Ah, oh, gee, boss, just a little rhubarb, that's all. Just a little kidding around. Boys didn't mean any harm. Mean any harm? Huber's eyes were so wide they threatened to pop out on the desk. Chaff knew. Show it to him. The Martian looked embarrassed. Then he slowly lifted his rope-like foot and displayed the quarter-sized burn on the heel. Kidding around? Huber looked dangerous. That's what you call kidding around? They could have burned Chaffnew to a crisp. You know how sensitive he is. Burke, the small parts man, said placatingly, Well, the boys are kind of edgy, Mr. Huber. It must be the weather or something. They need a little, what do you call it, outlet. Besides, said Curly, the goons kind of provoked him. You know what I mean? Don't ever use that word to me. The irritation that had been brewing in Huber all day now boiled over. He walked around the desk and shoved his big jawed face up close to Curly's chin. His small stature made no difference. Curly trembled nervously. They're Martians, the boss said, not goons. Understand? Martians, in that right, Chafnu. Chafnu looked as if he wished Earth had never been born. He glanced up guiltily at the assembled foreman. All right, said Huber. Now let's get this straight. One more incident like today, and I'll hold you guys responsible. Chafnu and all the other Martians in the plant are doing good work. Better, if you want to know, than most of your Earth guys. Sure, mumbled Curly. If we all had three hands, we could... That's enough, I say, shouted the boss. He swabbed his forehead with his hands. We got Oxco tanks to turn out, so let's get to it. The meeting's over. 
The foreman left, more chestfallen than when they'd entered the office. Chaffnew looked uncertain as to what he should do next. The Martian simply sat and watched Huber go back to his desk. The boss went over to the musophone and flipped the switch. My nerves are shot, he told Chaffnew. He sat back down in his swivel chair, sighed, and closed his eyes. The haunting strains of melancholy drifted through the office, and Huber lifted and slowly relaxed. The Martian just sat there, miserable. Hi there, fly boys. Time to climb into the wild black yonder again with your old skipper, Vince Finelli, bringing aid and comfort to all the ships in space. We've got a rocket chamber full of new notes and blue notes, all the latest hits from the bings of Earth to the rings of Saturn. So buckle your G belts and lend an ear to the biggest instrumental smash that's hit the system in an eon. You ask for it, spacemen. So here it is again. That ever loving outer space symphony, Melancholy. The pursuit was in order when the accident happened. Earth's gravity gripped it like a giant hand and brought it plummeting down into a granite quarry in Wisconsin. It was a Sunday, and the explosion of the ship's reactor didn't kill anybody but the two pilots. There was a routine investigation, but the evidence, as usual, was spread across too many states to make it productive. But when the Marjorie, a space freighter, got herself in trouble, the pilot managed to reach the Earth Communications Center before he disappeared forever into the Mediterranean. The voice cried out something like, Ox on bum! Then the pinafore registered an SOS. This time an accident was avoided. A tug was dispatched to the site in a hurry, and the pilots were transferred. The captain of the tug submitted his log to the Space Commerce Board, and the most pertinent page read, Pinafore's oxygen tank, manufacture Oxco, serial 2853, were defective and were seriously endangering life aboard. Diane Huber tilted the decanter and held it over the glass a little too long for her husband's liking. Easy, easy, he cried from his chair. How much of that stuff do you think I can take? This one's mine, she said, starting to pour another. Huber shifted in his seat. Aren't you overdoing it, honey? he asked uneasily. I mean, do you really think you should drink so much? It kills time, she said. It makes the hours a little shorter. What else have I got to do? You've got your job. What have I got? Well, I only meant, I mean, if the kids... The kids are pasted to the screen, she replied, meaning that they were at the television set. She flopped on an overstuffed sofa and yanked her skirt almost to her thighs. She still had lovely legs, Huber thought, but she used them like an old frump. And she wasn't even fifty, just forty-seven. Why did she have to flop around that way? Well, let's have it, she said, twirling the amber fluid in her glass. My hard day at the office, by George Huber, age eleven. He looked up almost shyly. Oh, nothing new, he said in a low voice. Same old stuff. Diane swallowed half of her scotch. She gave a little cough, blinked, and said harshly, You know that's not so. Something's up. Some kind of labor trouble. And your tanks are blowing out all over space. Is that the same old stuff, George, dear? Huber put down his paper. It's the men, he said. They've gone nuts or something. Moping around all day, singing the blues, snapping your head off if you make one little suggestion. Diane closed her eyes. I'm listening. Go on. 
Something's gone wrong with all of them, said Hubert, eager to pour out his overburdened heart. They act like they just don't want to work, turning out plain junk on the assembly line. Even the accuracy control boys are letting down on the job, and they're supposed to be crackerjacks. In fact, the only guys that are doing any kind of job are the Martians. I hired myself fifteen more today, but that's only going to stir up more fuss. I hate them, said Diane, sipping slowly and looking down into her glass moodily. Ugly, slippery things. Ugh. What? said George blankly. Your Martian friends, taking away good jobs from Earth people, never buying anything, and those awful arms. If you ask me, we ought to send them right back where they— You don't know them, he interrupted loudly. They're nice, quiet folks. They work hard, and they don't give you a hard time. They're ten times as efficient as some of the bums in— all right all right you don't have to shout at me diane stood up and gulped the rest of her drink down then she went over to the phonograph are you going to play that song again asked huber do you mind she said sarcastically i happen to like it huber said something under his breath and returned to his paper but when the record started he put it down and just listened as the strange haunting Martian melody filled the room. Blinker. Then the Martian says, For Pete's sake, why can't you clean up this filthy cave sometimes? Straight man. So what did his wife say? Blinker. So his wife says, What do you expect? I've only got three hands. Laughter. Straight man. Well, tell me, Blinker. What else do you do on your trip to Mars? Did you meet any? What's wrong? Blinker. Nothing wrong. Just don't step in front of the camera, that's all. Straight man. Ha ha. Sorry, old man. Er, tell me, what else did you do on? Blinker. Now, for Christ's sake, I told you to get out of the way. What are you trying to do? Hog the show? Director off camera Psst. blinker what are you doing we're on the air blinker i don't care if we're on the air air i won't be pushed around straight man you won't eh okay you fat tub of lard i've had enough of you director blinker adams blinker i'll punch that stupid face right into announcer ladies and gentlemen Due to circumstances beyond our control, the Universal Broadcasting Company interrupts the Joe Blinker Comedy Hour to bring you a program of recorded mood music. Our first selection is a popular record on the Canal label entitled Melancholy. The chairman rapped his gavel for order. One more demonstration like that, and we'll have to clear the room of spectators, he warned. This inquiry is a serious matter, and we cannot permit levity. Now, Mr. Collins, go on with your testimony. Montague Collins, the 51% owner of the Oxygen Corporation of America, looked uncomfortable. I beg your pardon, he said. I did not mean to be funny. I agree with the chair that defective equipment is a serious business, and my reference to the Martian's three hands was meant in earnest. We understand. Go ahead, Mr. Collins. I was merely stating that, contrary to articles in the public press, the Martian's efficiency level has been more than maintained at the Oxco plant. It's the human efficiency level that has declined. There was an excited buzzing. I believe, he continued, mopping his face, that this fact will be borne out by the experience of many other manufacturers. And I'd like to submit in evidence some replies to letters I have sent to executives all over America. 
you will see that they corroborate what I have told you. May I have the chairman's permission to read these replies as part of my testimony? It does not seem relevant at the moment, Mr. Collins, but they may be submitted for publication into the record. Please tell us about your own experience. I'm afraid I do not have much to add. As a result of our troubles, we are increasing the number of Martian employees considerably. Just how many is considerable, Mr. Collins? Montague Collins cleared his throat. We now employ four Martians for every three humans. Not even the gavel could quiet the spectators this time. Curly was about to demolish a ham and Swiss on rye, but when the Martian moved across his line of vision, he paused and called out, Hey, Chafnu! The Martian stopped and swiveled his bulbous head around at the foreman. Yes, he said. Want a bite of this? He held up the sandwich. No, your thanks, said Chafnu. Go on, take a taste. It's good for you. Do not think this, said Chafnu, trying to solve the old riddle of how to produce an engaging smile. He merely succeeded in looking like a surprised beetle. What's the matter, Chafnu? Too good to eat with your foreman? Curly flushed. The hirings and firings of the last two months had unnerved him, and the fact that he was handling his own job poorly only made the situation worse. Have not required to food, said the Martian. Best existence of silicon substitutes. Understanding do? However, your thanks, and very. He began to move on, but Curly was obviously in the mood for trouble. He got up from the bench and put his beefy hand around one of Chafnu's arms. It's pain, said Chafnu mildly. Improvement if released. Your thanks. You're a wise guy, Chafnu, said Curly. He knew that he was skirting a dangerous edge, but he was just too irritated to care. You're a bug-eyed bastard. What do you say about that? I have comment inward, the Martian answered, trying to pull away from the foreman's grip. In fact, said Curly, now squeezing harder, I got a good mind to kick you right in the seat of the pants, and keep kicking till you fly right back to Mars. Pain, said Chafnu. Can release do? And what if I don't? Am in power yours, said the Martian. You're goddamn right. And I'm going to give you a little lesson in manners, you. Curly! Huber came striding over fast, and the look on his face was sufficient to make the foreman drop both the Martian and Sandwich. Gee, boss, I... Never mind, Huber thundered. You had the chance. Now you're getting your walking papers. Get out of here, Curly. Get out of here now. But, Mr. Huber... I said beat it. You're not the foreman around here any more. And in case you want to know who your successor is, take a look. Huber pointed a shaky finger at Chafnu, who bowed his head modestly. And there it is, folks, the big one, the top one, the melody that has swept the solar system. You've proved your love for it. All the disc jockey requests, all the record sales, all the jukebox half dollars have shown that once more for the 41st week in a row the number one tune on your hit parade is melancholy but you don't have to get excited folks because i'm not going to play it for you i'm going to spin it all for myself and you can just sit there and drool and if anybody wants to fire me for it let them go ahead and see if i care <laughs> Woolsey, of the U.S. Department of Labor, zipped up his briefcase and went over to the office window. He looked outside at the Capitol building, but the location permitted only a fractional view of the impressive edifice. Anyway, the sun was shining brightly, and the grass was green. The man, sitting in the chair facing his desk, recalled his presence with a polite cough. 
Oh, said Woolsey, turning around. Sorry, mine's wandering, I guess. I know how you feel, Mr. Woolsey. My job is getting me down, too. Can't seem to get interested in the newspaper any more. Just the thought of work irritates me. Woolsey sat down, humming softly to himself. He toyed with a paper clip, then started to bend it out of shape. But I guess I better get the story, sighed the man in the chair. Boss will give me hell otherwise. Although, he added, he seems to care about work even less than I do. Yes, said Woolsey, abstractly. My, it certainly is a nice day. Damn shame to be indoors on a day like this. What say we go for a walk? asked the reporter. We can take a stroll around the fountain. We can do our business just as well. Splendid idea, said Woolsey. This place is getting on my nerves. Outside, the assistant labor secretary said, Oh, it's true, all right. The Martian labor force now outnumbers the humans by five to one. Some companies have completely converted to Martians, like the Oxco Corporation, for instance. In fact, it probably won't be very long before we'll have an all-Martian labor force across the country. The reporter said, Can I quote you? If you like, the labor man shrugged. Seems like employers just can't find men interested in their jobs. But the Martians go merrily along, using their three hands at maximum efficiency. And it's not just in manual labor that they're gaining tremendous amounts of ground. How do you mean? Woolsey paused by the flowing fountain, watching the cool gusher leap from the mouth of a stone fish. Well, he said vaguely, they're taking over other kinds of work, white-collar stuff, teaching, architecture. In fact, I heard that the Brooklyn Dodgers are considering a Martian for third base. No, Woolsey said, the water looks nice, doesn't it? I wonder if they would mind if I took my shoes off and... Mr. Woolsey! Oh, just for a minute, you know. Can't see any harm in it. Matter of fact, should be quite refreshing. Yes, but, sir... Oh, come on, said Woolsey, starting to unlace his shoes. If you'd rather work, go ahead. I want to relax. He took his shoes off and began to work on the socks humming the strains of melancholy to himself. The reporter scratched his head. I don't want to work, he confessed. I haven't wanted to work for months. The whole idea of working just makes me sore. He hesitated a moment, then reached down for his shoelaces. The Martian stood in front of the boss's desk, but this time there was no nervousness in his manner. Chaff knew, said Huber. Yes, sir, said the new foreman. Chaff knew, I have something to tell you, and I don't know how you're going to take it. Please, said Chaff knew. Huber got up and went to the table. There was a leather suitcase perched on top. He took it off and placed it on his desk. Then he opened it. He reached over and took Diane's photograph from the blotter and put it inside. You've been doing a good job, the boss continued. An excellent job, as a matter of fact. Properly thanking, said Chaffnew. I don't want you to thank me. It's only logical, after all, especially when we put nothing but Martians in your shop. We needed a Martian foreman then. He went to the bookcase and lifted out two of the books and dropped them into the suitcase. Now things have changed again, Chaffnew, changed drastically, and the Oxygen Corporation of America is going to need your help. Desirable of service, said Chaffnew, very willing of it. I know you are, and that's why the board of directors have decided that you should take over the whole show. He clicked the suitcase shut with an air of finality. Uncomprehended, said the Martian blankly. We're an all-Martian plant now, Huber said. Even the front office will soon be all-Martian. The stockholders figure that the only reasonable thing to do is put a Martian in charge of everything. You were my recommendation, and the board accepted it. 
But strange. Your work job do not? If you mean it's my job, the answer is no. It's not my job any more. Oh, don't feel sorry for me. I want to quit. I just haven't been able to pull my weight around here for the last year. I'm getting lazy or something, Chaffnew. The whole idea of working bores me silly. Huber went over to the musophone and turned it on. Melancholy, he said, as the haunting phrases emerged from the loudspeaker. That's the way I feel about work. You know something, Chaffnew? Sometimes I think that damn tune has something to do with it. Sir? Oh, I know it sounds crazy, but somehow, the way I feel about working and the way the tune sounds, they're all mixed up in my mind. Oh, well. The boss picked up his suitcase. The job's yours, Chaffnew. So's the office. Both of them aren't the greatest in the world, but I had some fun. He stuck out his hand. Good luck, he said. Cannot, said Chaffnew. What? Impossible for accepting, said the Martian. But why? You know you can handle it. Confidence, great and very, said the Martian. But reason is not for acceptance. Plentiful jobs for Martians. I don't get you. Decline offer responsible for plan change. Understand? Quitting from factory, do Chaffnew. Otherwise business. You mean you're leaving the factory? You're going to take another job? Huber looked befuddled. Excitement offer, said the Martian. Great salary remuneration. Opportunity. Well, I'll be damned, Huber grinned and slapped Chaffnew lightly on his sensitive back. I guess you know what you're doing, Chaffnew. Plenty of opportunities for Martians these days, especially since humans don't seem to want to work. Situation so, said Chaffnew. Okay, then, said Huber. Whatever you have in mind, Chaffnew, I hope you make a go of it. Good luck, old pal. Friendship, said Chaffnew warmly, clasping Huber's hand in his three and shaking it enthusiastically. Hello, you today. Time again emerging for spins on table with disc black musical. Back up and sit relax. Pipe smoke and good food eating. Abundancy of music available herein. Bring pleasure immensely into home yours. Currency latest new recordings employ old yours, Chico Chaffnew. Piping soon big favorite Martian song, Melancholy. But first, a message from sponsor ours. The end of A Message from Our Sponsor by Henry Slazer. The Reluctant Genius by Henry Slazer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. It is said that life crawled up from the slime of the sea bottoms and became man because of inherent greatness, bred into him before the dawn of time. But perhaps this urge was not as formless as we think. Reluctant Genius by Henry Slazer Buos was chastening Laloy as they sped through the ionosphere of the green planet. But, like the airy creature she was, Laloy ignored the criticism and rippled zephyr-like through a clump of daffodils when they completed their descent. So pretty, she sighed. She flung her incorporeal substance around each flower, absorbing their unified beauty of scent, sight, and feeling. Buos shrilled himself into a column of wind to express his displeasure at her attitude. Stupid, silly, shallow thing, he said, if the others only knew how you behaved. And you'll be happy to tell them, of course, she said, extending her fingers of air into the roots of the wind-bent grass. She rolled across the hill ecstatically, and Buos followed in grumbling billows of energy. I don't carry tales, he replied, somewhat mortified. But we're here as observers, and you insist upon making this world a plaything. 
I love it, she said happily. It's so warm and green. Buos whipped in front of her angrily. This is an assignment, he snapped. His emotions crackled the air around him. We have a purpose here. Purpose, she groaned, settling over a patch of crowded clover. How many centuries will this assignment last? This world is young, said Buos. It will take time. But how long, she asked mournfully. Our world will be shriveled and dead before these people have the knowledge to rescue us. Why can't we spend our lives here? And leave the others behind, said Buos, stuffily. Selfish being, he said sadly. This world cannot support one-fourth of our number. Oh, I know, I know, Laloy said. I do not mean to say such things. I am twisted by my sorrow. As to express her self-abnegation, she corkscrewed out of the clover and into a thin spiral of near nothingness. Settle down, foolish one, said Buos, not unkindly. I know your feelings. Do you think I am not tormented as well by the slow pace of these earth things? Crude, barbaric beings, like children with the building blocks of science. They have such a long way to go. And so few know, said Laloy despairingly. A handful of seeing minds, tens of millions of ignorant ones. Not even first principles. They're stupid. Stupid. But they will learn, Buo said stubbornly. That is historical fact. Some day they will know the true meaning of matter and light and energy. Slowly. Yes, slowly. But in terms of their growth, it will seem like great speed to them. In terms of our world, said Lolo, spinning sadly over the ground, they may be far too late. No! In his excitement, Buos forgot himself and entwined with the flowing form of the she-creature, and the result was the rending of the air that cracked like heat-lightning over the field. No, he repeated again, they must not be too late. They must learn. They must build from the very ground, and then they must fly. And then their eyes must be lifted to the stars, and desire must extend them to all the universe. It seems so hopeless. It cannot be. Our destiny is not extinction. They must come to us in fleets of silver and replant our soil and send towers of green shooting into our sky, breathing out air. Yes, yes, Laloy cried pitifully. It will be that way, Buos. It will be that way. That man-creature, we will begin with him. Buos floated earthward disconsolately. He is a dreamer, he said cheerlessly. His mind is good. He thinks of tomorrow. He is one of the knowing ones. But he cannot be moved, Laloy. His thoughts may fester and die in the prison of his brain. No, they will not. We have watched him. He understands much. He will help us. I have seen his like before said Buos, hopelessly. He thinks, and he works, and his conclusions will die stillborn, for lack of a moving force. Then let us provide it, Buos. Let us move him. With what? said the other disdainfully. Arms of nothing? Hands of vacuum? A breeze against his cheek? A rustle of leaves? The meaningless whispers in his ears? Let us try, let us try. This empty watchfulness is destroying us. Let us move him, Buos. Come. Faster than the sky sweeping clouds, they flew over the gentle swelling hills, over the yearning branches of the trees, over the calm blue waters of the lakes. Swifter than the flight of birds they came, searching for the thinking mind. They found him at last. He knows, he knows, said Laloy. Only now to say, this is so because, 
and this must happen when? Only to think, to understand. They hovered over his head in a pantomime of helplessness. They whirled and tumbled and shrilly circled. And then to Laloy the inspiration came. An apple, caught by a sudden gust of wind, twisted from the tenuous hold of the tree and fell to the ground. The man, startled, picked it up. He gazed at it, deep in thought. The End of Reluctant Genius by Henry Slazer Security Plan by Joseph Farrell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Security Plan by Joseph Farrell I had something better than investing for the future. The future investing in me. My mother warned me, Marilyn said again, to think twice before I married a child prodigy. Look for somebody good and solid, she said, like Dad, somebody who will put something away for your old age. I tapped a transistor, put a screwdriver across a pair of wires, and watched the spark. Marilyn was just talking to pass the time. She really loves me and doesn't mind too much that I spend my spare time and money building a time machine. Sometimes she even believes that it might work. She kept talking. I've been thinking. We're past 30 now, and what do we have? A lease on a restaurant where nobody eats, and a time machine that doesn't work. She sighed. And a drawer full of pawn tickets we'll never be able to redeem. My silver, my camera, my typewriter. I added a growl to her sigh. My microscope, my other equipment. Uncle Johnson will have them for his old age, she said sadly, and we'll be lucky if we have anything. I felt a pang of resentment. Uncle Johnson. It seemed that every time I acquired something, Uncle Johnson soon came into possession of it. We had been kids together, although he was quite a few years older a hulking lout in the sixth grade while I was in the first, and I graduated from grammar school a term ahead of him. Of course, I went on to high school and had a college degree at 15, being a prodigy. Johnson went to work in his uncle's pawn shop, sweeping the floor and so on, and that's when we started calling him uncle. This wasn't much of a job because Johnson's uncle got him to work for almost nothing by promising he would leave him the pawn shop when he died. And it didn't look as if much would come of this, because the uncle was not very old, and he was always telling people a man couldn't afford to die these days, what with the prices undertakers were charging. Before I had even started to shave, I had a dozen papers published in scientific journals, all having to do with the nature of time. Time travel became my ambition, and I was sure I saw a way to build a time machine. But it took years to work out the details, and nobody seemed interested in my work, so I had to do it all myself. Somehow, I stopped working long enough to get a wife, and we had to eat. So we ran this little hash house and lived in the back room, and at least we got our food wholesale. And Johnson's uncle fell down the cellar stairs and split his skull open. So Johnson became the owner of a thriving business after giving his uncle a simple funeral. Because he knew his uncle wouldn't have wanted him to waste any more money on that than he had to. But we have a time machine, Marilyn said fondly. That's something Johnson would give us a lot on, if it worked. We almost have a time machine, I said, looking around at my life's work. Our kitchen was the time machine with a great winding of wires around it to create the field I had devised. The doors had been a problem that I had solved by making them into switches, so that when they were closed, the coils made the complete circuit of the room. 
Almost, I repeated. After twenty years of work, I am through except for a few small items. I looked at her pleadingly. It'll run about twenty dollars, do you think? She didn't care much for the idea, but finally she slid off the wedding ring. You'll redeem this first thing, Ted, before any of the rest of the stuff? I promised and took off at a dead run. Johnson didn't have to inspect the ring. He had seen it before, and he counted out $20. That was the only item he'd give me a decent price on. He knew I'd be back for it. How's the time machine coming along, Ted? He had a little smirk, the way some people do when they hear I'm building a time machine. Get in touch with Mars yet? I have no interest in Mars, I told him. I plan to make contact with the future, about 30 years from now. And for your information, the time machine is practically finished. The first test will be tonight. He wasn't smirking now because he never forgot the way I passed him in school and he had a good respect for my brain. He looked a little thoughtful. Only a little because that's all he was capable of. You get to the future, Ted. Suppose you bring me a newspaper. I'll make it worth your while. I've always treated you fair and square, Ted, now haven't I? I looked over his shelves. Too many of those dust-covered items were mine, and I didn't have to be a telepath to know what he was thinking. Maybe you'd like a paper with the stock market quotations, Uncle? From about 30 years from now, say? The smirk was completely gone now. You get something like that, Ted, I'll pay you. Wouldn't help you out any, because you have nothing to invest. Me, now? I could buy something that will keep me in my old age. I'll give you a hundred bucks for something like that. I laughed at him. A hundred dollars? Uncle always had his nerve. He was scowling when I left, still trying to figure out how he could get in on the gravy because outside of Maryland, he was the only person who ever thought I might succeed. Marilyn cooked dinner for us while I was putting the final touches on the time machine. Tonight we celebrate, she said. Steak. It smelled wonderful, but the occasional whiff of ozone from my equipment was more exciting. I had told Marilyn we had about an hour before I could make the test, but with my working faster than I had expected, and her getting behind with the meal, she was just putting the steaks on the table when I was done with the machine. Oh, but let's eat first, Ted, she said. I couldn't eat after so much work. I stared in fascination at the master switch, the door. This is it, Marilyn, what I've been working toward all these years. She saw the way I felt, and maybe she was a little excited herself. Go ahead, Ted she told me. I closed the door. There was more ozone and a blurring in the middle of the room. We stepped away from the thickest of the blurring where something seemed to be gathering substance. The something, we soon saw, was a man sitting in a chair surrounded by strange apparatus, most of which I couldn't guess the purpose of. He was a very young man when I could see him better, probably nineteen, wearing bright clothes in what I figured must be the style of 1989. Man, oh, he said. This time machine is low Fahrenheit, oh, daddy. Right to the bottom. It's the deepest. I blinked. Parlez vous Francais? Marilyn said, I think he means he likes it. But who is he? And just where did he come from? The gaily-dressed youth got out of the chair and smiled at us. Each of his shoulders had padding the size of a football. His coat tapered from four feet wide at the shoulders to a tightly bound waist, the lapels from a foot at the top to zero. The trousers widened out to wide, stiff hoops that ended six inches above his shoes. And the shoes! But at least they weren't really alive, as I had thought at first. How is it, asked Marilyn, that a cool cat from the future comes to visit us in a time machine? I would expect a more scholarly type. 
Not so, Dollo. The angle heads don't reach the real science. The scientists' pros believe that all knowledge is known. They delve not into the sub-zero regions of thought. That is done by us amateurs. He did a short bit of syncopated tap and introduced himself. I am Solid Chuck Richards, ambassador of the past, courtesy of the Friday Night Bull Session and Experimentation Society. Are they all like you? I asked. No, oh daddy man. Some are deep, some are high on the scale, but all of them reach together on one thing. They all feel that the pro-scientists have grown angular and lost the sense of wonder. So we gather together on Friday nights to work on the offbeat side of science. We read your books. If you are Ted Langer, I admitted it. He danced a rhythmic circle around me, staring in what was evidently adoration, and kept murmuring, Reach that deep man, Ted Langer, the father of time travel. Oh, man, oh, deep, real deep. Now see here, I finally broke in. Don't they talk English where you come from? And just how do you come to be here anyway? I built a time machine to travel into the future, and instead, I get you telling me how deep I am. Are you here, or am I there? You are here, oh daddy boy, and I also am here. But to explain this, I may have to use some angle talk, which is what you mean by English. We read your books, which are collector's items, by the way, and we decided you were way under the zero mark, especially when we saw that the angle heads wouldn't touch any of your ideas. So we got together and made our time machine. But I am sad to report, Dr. O, that your theory was a bit less than 200% correct. There were a few errors, which we found. It was something of a shock to hear this future rock and roller tell me that there were mistakes in my work and I started to argue with him about it. But his attention wasn't on the conversation. He was sniffing thoughtfully, the thing that he called sense of wonder shining in his eyes. He was looking at the stakes Marilyn had set on the table. Reach that, he said, awed. Genuine, solid flesh. Man, oh. I haven't seen a stake like that in all my offbeat life. So naturally, we invited him to sit down at the table, and he didn't have to be asked more than once. It seemed that food was pretty expensive in 1991, which is the year he came from, and what there was of it mostly came from factories where they shoveled soybeans and yeast into a machine, and it came out meat at the other end, if you didn't make too much fuss about what you called meat. But with so much of the good farmland ruined by atomic dust, and so much more turned into building lots on account of the growing population. It was the best they could do. When we heard this, we pushed the second stake in front of him, and he showed he was a growing boy by finishing every scrap, along with a double order of French fries and half a dozen ears of corn on the cob. But he had to give up after two pieces of pie. He sat back in the chair, patted his stomach, and looked as if he had just won the Irish sweepstakes. He looked at the big refrigerator. When Marilyn opened it to put things away, his eyes almost popped out at the sight of the meat stored there. Man, oh, he said. You must be rich. Marilyn laughed. No, not rich, far from it. We operate a restaurant, and that's our stock, you see. Oh, Dallo, I should not have eaten so much. What do you charge for a meal like that? We would get three and a half for each order, I said, diplomatically not mentioning all his side orders, although we don't get much carriage trade here. But don't let it worry you. Nothing's too good for a guest from the future. Three and a half? He looked amazed. Why, such a feed would bring 25 or 30 where I come from, if you could find it. Let me pay, oh daddy friend. At least your price. And he pulled out some bills. I started to push them back, 
for of course I wasn't going to spoil this great moment in my life by asking a traveler from the future to pay for a meal. But then I saw what he was trying to give me. I picked up the bills and stared. Marilyn's head was over my shoulder, and she was staring just as hard. She took one out of my hand. It's not real, she said. There's not that much money in the world. She had the five. I had the ones. The five thousand and the one thousand dollar bills, that is. I looked up at solid Chuck Richards. When you said that meal would cost twenty-five or thirty, did you mean twenty-five or thirty thousand? You reach me, man. Inflation, you know, it's terrible. I remember when a G would keep the beat rocking in a juke palace for an hour. Now you pay half a G a number. It's terrible. After we explained to him that the inflation was even worse than that, he decided it was something more than terrible. It seems he hadn't paid much attention to money in his younger days, though he did recall now that when he was very small, he had been able to get a good nickel candy bar for $20, but he hadn't seen anything smaller than 100 in some time now. There should be a law against this sort of thing, he said indignantly. It's enough to turn a man into an angle head, the way they keep pushing up the price of fumes and what they charge for Bulgy Sanders' records. He picked up the bills and looked at them. But I think maybe we can find a way to profit on this, Daddy Boy. I have a deep thought. We members of the Friday Night Bull Session and Experimentation Society will come to your restaurant and pay you five G's for a steak dinner, which is a fine price for you, but very little for us. In that way, we will eat good food, and you will gather a good bundle of the stuff of life. There was a thudding noise at the window. I looked over quick. Somebody was hanging on outside, off balance, as if he had been standing on a ladder outside and had fallen against the window. I ran for the door, forgetting it was a switch. But solid Chuck Richards realized it. He dived back into his chair and called, Reach you later, oh daddy! He disappeared as I pulled the door open. The sudden flash as the time machine stopped operating reminded me about those switches on the door, but it was too late now. I ran out and around the side, just in time to see a figure disappearing up the alley. Sure enough, there was a ladder against the window. I didn't bother chasing the man very far because, after a fast look at him, I had a pretty good idea who it was. I'd speak to him later. Marilyn and I sat around looking at the big bills. They were the size of present-day currency and were beautifully made and would have passed easily except for a few things, such as that Series 1988, inscribed alongside the signature of Irving P. Walcourt, Secretary of the Treasury, and the Treasurer of the United States in 1988 would be Kuru Hamamnoto. From the state of Hawaii, I wondered, or... They're no use to us at all, said Marilyn, unless we hold them until 1988. I was talking about security for our old age. Do you suppose? You forget, I said, that stake will run you twenty-five or 30000 in 1988. This is going to be a great disappointment to the members of the Friday Night Bull Session and Experimentation Society, but I fear we must explain to solid Chuck Richards that we just cannot afford to do much business of this type. I pushed aside the money and began thinking about some of the things the youth from 1991 had told me. There were holes in my theories, a lot of holes. True, I had succeeded in building a time machine, but I could never go any place in it, because time travel was possible only by traveling from one time machine to another. The amateurs of 1991, knowing from my books must remember to write them, that I had built a time machine in 1959 were able to make contact. Solid Chuck Richards was selected by lot from several volunteers to try the machine. I met the other members of the society later and learned that and a number of other things from them. The reason Solid Chuck came back 
instead of my going forward, made solid sense. I could see it now. My time machine had never existed in 1991. His had existed in 1959, or at least its parts had. I could overcome that problem if I had the full power of the sun for several minutes to work with and a way to handle it. Then I could change things so that my time machine would have existed in the future. Even the verb tenses were going wrong on me. These amateur experimenters, it seemed, were considered a bit on the crackpot side, taking such pseudoscience as mine seriously. Not knowing enough science to realize that the ideas I wrote about were impossible, as any professional scientist would have, they followed them through. They tried to get in touch with me in their time, but I wasn't available, which saved me another paradox. Suppose I had joined the society and come back as a volunteer. But it was encouraging to know the reason I was going to be unavailable in 1991. Marilyn and I had gone on a second honeymoon on the first commercial passenger liner to Mars. And so, I told her, you don't have to worry about security in your old age. Tickets to Mars must cost a few trillion dollars. We won't be poor. Marilyn was still looking at the currency of the future. We will be, she said, if we keep selling steak for the price of soybean hamburger. By the way, Ted, I wonder who that was at the window. The answer came to me then. I put the bills in my pocket and kissed her. We will not have to eat soybean hamburger, O'Doll, and I will take you to Mars for your second honeymoon as soon as they start passenger service. I am going out to make a down payment on the tickets right now. Uncle Johnson took the glass from his eye. He looked very tense, like a fisherman with a prize catch on a very thin line. It's good, he said, and his voice trembled a little. I suppose your time machine worked. Surprised, are you, Uncle? Yes, yes, but I see your situation, Ted. You, of course, can't afford to hold these for 30 years. Now, ah, uh, I can. And I'll be glad to help you out by taking them off your hands. Naturally, I have to hold them a long time, so let's say $20 a thousand? Let's not say that. I took the bill from his hand. I figure 50 is a fair price. There'll be lots more, Uncle. And as you say, I'm always broke and cannot afford to put them away for my old age. But running the time machine is expensive, and I can't afford to take less than 50. He looked as if he were going to snatch the bill right out of my hand. He was so eager. All right, Ted. I realize there are expenses. 35. We compromised on 40. But I want to promise, he said emphatically, I'm to be the only one you sell these bills to. You reach me, oh, uncle. I handed him the bills. You're deep, man. Real deep. Real deep in the hole, that is. He mortgaged his house and his regular inventory to buy up all the money I began taking in. Once we redeemed the wedding ring and all the other articles, I got to feeling mellow and even a bit grateful. He started me in business, so to speak. I couldn't stick him with all those millions that would just about buy him a helicab ride to the poorhouse in 1988. So when Marilyn and I got just as deep in the black because the society members gave us some books on stock market statistics, I started giving Uncle tips every now and then. Not free, of course. I asked for half, and we settled on 70-30. With that, plus the ones I bought, both for now and the long pull, I guess we're the only people living today who can be sure of having a second honeymoon on Mars although solid Chuck Richards tells me he hears Mars is overrated. They're not being a juke on the whole planet. And even if there were, you couldn't jump to any decent kind of beat in that low gravity. I wouldn't say so to solid Chuck Richards, but that sounds like absolute zero to me. End of Security Plan by Joseph Farrell Read by Paul Hampton Let's Get Together 
by Isaac Asimov. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gerzinski. Let's Get Together by Isaac Asimov. A kind of peace had endured for a century, and people had forgotten what anything else was like. They would scarcely have known how to react had they discovered that a kind of war had finally come. Certainly, Elias Lynn, chief of the Bureau of Robotics, wasn't sure how he ought to react when he finally found out. The Bureau of Robotics was headquartered in Cheyenne, in line with the century-old trend toward decentralization, and Lynn stared dubiously at the young security officer from Washington who had brought the news. Elias Lynn was a large man, almost charmingly homely, with pale blue eyes that bulged a bit. Men weren't usually comfortable under the stare of those eyes, but the security officer remained calm. Lynn decided that his first reaction ought to be incredulity. Hell, it was incredulity. He just didn't believe it. He eased himself back in his chair and said, How certain is the information? The security officer, who had introduced himself as Ralph G. Breckinridge, and had presented credentials to match, had the softness of youth about him. Full lips, plump cheeks that flushed easily, and guileless eyes. His clothing was out of line with Cheyenne, but it suited a universally air-conditioned Washington, where security, despite everything, was still centered. Breckinridge flushed and said, There's no doubt about it. You people know all about them, I suppose, said Lynn, and was unable to keep a trace of sarcasm out of his tone. He was not particularly aware of his use of a slightly stressed pronoun in his reference to the enemy, the equivalent of capitalization in print. It was a cultural habit of this generation and the one preceding. No one said the East or the Reds or the Soviets or the Russians anymore. That would have been too confusing, since some of them weren't of the East, weren't Reds, Soviets, and especially not Russians. It was much simpler to say we and they, and much more precise. Travelers had frequently reported that they did the same in reverse. Over there, they were we, in the appropriate language, and we were they. Scarcely anyone gave thought to such things anymore. It was all quite comfortable and casual. There was no hatred, even. At the beginning, it had been called a Cold War. Now it was only a game, almost a good-natured game, with unspoken rules and a kind of decency about it. Lynn said abruptly, Why should they want to disturb the situation? He rose and stood staring at a wall map of the world, split into two regions with faint edgings of color. An irregular portion on the left of the map was edged in a mild green. A smaller, but just as irregular portion on the right of the map was bordered in a washed-out pink. We and they. The map hadn't changed much in a century. The loss of Formosa and the gain of East Germany some eighty years before had been the last territorial switch of importance. There had been another change, though. That was significant enough, and that was in the colors. Two generations before, their territory had been a brooding bloody red, ours a pure and undefiled white. Now there was a neutrality about the colors. Lynn had seen their maps, and it was the same on their side. They wouldn't do it, he said. They are doing it, said Breckenridge, and you had better accustom yourself to the fact— of course, sir, I realize that it isn't pleasant to think that they may be that far ahead of us in robotics. His eyes remained as guileless as ever, but the hidden knife edges of the words plunged deep, and Lynn quivered at the impact. Of course, that would account for why the chief of robotics learned of this so late and through a secretary officer at that. He had lost caste in the eyes of the government— if robotics had really failed in the struggle, Lynn could expect no political mercy. Lynn said wearily, Even if what you say is true, they're not far ahead of us. We could build humanoid robots. Have we, sir? Yes, as a matter of fact. We have built a few models for experimental purposes. 
They were doing so ten years ago. They've made ten years' progress since. Lynn was disturbed. He wondered if his incredulity concerning the whole business were really the result of wounded pride and fear for his job and reputation. He was embarrassed by the possibility that this might be so, and yet he was forced into defense. He said, Look, young man, the stalemate between them and us was never perfect in every detail, you know. They have always been ahead in one facet or another, and we in some other facet or another. If they're ahead of us right now in robotics, it's because they've placed a greater proportion of their effort into robotics than we have. And that means that some other branch of endeavor has received a greater share of our efforts than it has of theirs. It would mean we're ahead in force field research or in hyperatomics, perhaps. Lin felt distressed at his own statement that the stalemate wasn't perfect. It was true enough, but that was the one great danger threatening the world. The world depended on the stalemate being as perfect as possible. If the small unevennesses that always existed overbalanced too far in one direction or the other. Almost at the beginning of what had been the Cold War, both sides had developed thermonuclear weapons, and war became unthinkable. Competition switched from the military to the economic and psychological, and had stayed there ever since. But always, there was the driving effort on each side to break the stalemate, to develop a parry for every possible thrust, to develop a thrust that could not be parried in time, something that would make war possible again. And that was not because either side wanted war so desperately, but because both were afraid that the other side would make the crucial discovery first. For a hundred years, each side had kept the struggle even. And in the process, peace had been maintained for a hundred years, while as byproducts of the continuously intensive research, force fields had been produced, and solar energy, and insect controls, and robots. Each side was making a beginning in the understanding of mentalics, which was the name given to the biochemistry and biophysics of thought. Each side had its outposts on the moon and on Mars. Mankind was advancing in giant strides under forced draft. It was even necessary for both sides to be as decent and humane as possible among themselves, lest through cruelty and tyranny friends be made for the other side. It couldn't be that the stalemate would now be broken and that there would be war. Lynn said, I want to consult one of my men. I want his opinion. Is he trustworthy? Lynn looked disgusted. Good Lord, what man in robotics has not been investigated and cleared to death by your people? Yes, I vouch for him. If you can't trust a man like Humphrey Carl Laszlo, then we're in no position to face the kind of attack you say they are launching, no matter what else we do. I've heard of Laszlo, said Breckenridge. Good. Does he pass? Yes. Then I'll have him in, and we'll find out what he thinks about the possibility that robots could invade the USA. Not exactly, said Breckenridge softly. You still don't accept the full truth. Find out what he thinks about the fact that robots have already invaded the USA. Laszlo was the grandson of a Hungarian who had broken through what had been called the Iron Curtain, and he had a comfortable above-suspicion feeling about himself because of it. He was thick-set and balding, with a pugnacious look graven forever on his snub face. But his accent was clear Harvard, and he was almost excessively soft-spoken. To Lynn, who was conscious that after years of administration he was no longer expert in the various phases of modern robotics, Laszlo was a comforting receptacle for complete knowledge. Lynn felt better because of the man's mere presence. Lynn said, What do you think? A scowl twisted Laszlo's face ferociously. That they're that far ahead of us. Completely incredible. It would mean they've produced humanoids that could not be told from humans at close quarters. It would mean a considerable advance in robomentalics. You're personally involved, said Brackenridge coldly. Leaving professional pride out of account, exactly why is it impossible that they be ahead of us? Laszlo shrugged. 
I assure you that I'm well acquainted with their literature on robotics. I know approximately where they are. You know approximately where they want you to think they are, is what you really mean, corrected Breckenridge. Have you ever visited the other side? I haven't, said Laszlo, shortly. Nor you, Dr. Lynn? Lynn said, no, I haven't either. Breckenridge said, has any robotics man visited the other side in 25 years? He asked the question with a kind of confidence that indicated he knew the answer. For a matter of seconds, the atmosphere was heavy with thought. Discomfort crossed Laszlo's broad face. He said, as a matter of fact, they haven't held any conferences on robotics in a long time. In 25 years, said Breckenridge. Isn't that significant? Maybe, said Laszlo reluctantly. Something else bothers me, though. None of them have ever come to our conferences on robotics, none that I can remember. Were they invited? asked Breckenridge. Lynn, staring and worried, interposed quickly. Of course. Breckenridge said, do they refuse attendance to any other types of scientific conferences we hold? I don't know, said Laszlo. He was pacing the floor now. I haven't heard of any cases, have you, Chief? No, said Lynn. Breckenridge said, wouldn't you say it was as though they didn't want to be put in the position of having to return any such invitation, or as though they were afraid one of their men might talk too much? That was exactly how it seemed, and Lynn felt a helpless conviction that security's story was true, after all, steal over him. Why else had there been no contact between sides on robotics? There had been a cross-fertilizing trickle of researchers moving in both directions on a strictly one-for-one -one basis for years, dating back to the days of Eisenhower and Khrushchev. There were a great many good motives for that, an honest appreciation of the supranational character of science, impulses of friendliness that are hard to wipe out completely in the individual human being, the desire to be exposed to a fresh and interesting outlook, and to have your own slightly stale notions greeted by others as fresh and interesting. The governments themselves were anxious that this continue. There was always the obvious thought that by learning all you could and telling as little as you could, your own side would gain by the exchange. But not in the case of robotics. Not there. Such a little thing to carry conviction, and a thing, moreover, they had known all along, Lynn thought darkly. We've taken the complacent way out. Because the other side had done nothing publicly on robotics. It had been tempting to sit back smugly and be comfortable in the assurance of superiority. Why hadn't it seemed possible, even likely, that they were hiding superior cards, a trump hand for the proper time? Laszlo said shakenly, What do we do? It was obvious that the same line of thought had carried the same conviction to him. Do? parroted Lynn. It was hard to think right now of anything but of the complete horror that came with conviction. There were ten humanoid robots somewhere in the United States, each one carrying a fragment of a TC bomb. TC! The race for sheer horror and bombery had ended there. TC! Total conversion. The sun was no longer a synonym one could use. Total conversion made the sun a penny candle. Ten humanoids, each completely harmless in separation, could, by the simple act of coming together, exceed critical mass and... Lynn rose to his feet heavily. The dark pouches under his eyes, which ordinarily lent his ugly face a look of savage foreboding, more prominent than ever. It's going to be up to us to figure out ways and means of telling a humanoid from a human and then finding the humanoids. How quickly, muttered Laszlo. Not later than five minutes before they get together, barked Lynn, and I don't know when that will be. Breckenridge nodded. I'm glad you're with us now, sir. I'm to bring you back to Washington for conference, you know. Lynn raised his eyebrows. All right. He wondered if... Had he delayed longer in being convinced, he might not have been replaced forthwith. 
if some other chief of the Bureau of Robotics might not be conferring in Washington. He suddenly wished earnestly that exactly that had come to pass. The first presidential assistant was there, the Secretary of Science, the Secretary of Security, Lynn himself and Breckinridge, five of them sitting about a table in the dungeons of an underground fortress near Washington. Presidential assistant Jeffries was an impressive man, handsome in a white-haired and just a trifle jowly fashion, solid, thoughtful, and as unobtrusive politically as a presidential assistant ought to be. He spoke incisively. There are three questions that face us as I see it. First, when are the humanoids going to get together? Second, where are they going to get together? Third, how do we stop them before they get together? Secretary of Science Amberley nodded convulsively at that. He had been Dean of Northwestern Engineering before his appointment. He was thin, sharp-featured, and noticeably edgy. His forefinger traced slow circles on the table. As far as when they'll get together, he said, I suppose it's definite that it won't be for some time. Why do you say that? asked Lynn sharply. They've been in the U.S. at least a month already, so security says. Lynn turned automatically to look at Breckenridge, and Secretary of Security McAllister intercepted the glance. McAllister said, The information is reliable. Don't let Breckenridge's apparent youth fool you, Dr. Lynn. That's part of his value to us. Actually, he's 34 and has been with the department for 10 years. He has been in Moscow for nearly a year, and without him, none of this terrible danger would be known to us. As it is, we have most of the details. Not the crucial ones. McAllister of security smiled frostily. His heavy chin and close-set eyes were well known to the public but almost nothing else about him was. He said, We are all finitely human, Dr. Lynn. Agent Breckinridge has done a great deal. Presidential Assistant Jeffries cut in. Let us say we have a certain amount of time. If action at the instant were necessary, it would have happened before this. It seems likely that they are waiting for a specific time. If we knew the place, perhaps the time would become self-evident. They are going to TC a target. They will want to cripple us as much as possible. So it would seem that a major city would have to be it. In any case, a major metropolis is the only target worth a TC bomb. I think there are four possibilities. Washington is the administrative center. New York is the financial center. And Detroit and Pittsburgh is the two chief industrial centers. McAllister of Security said, I vote for New York. Administration and industry have both been decentralized to the point where the destruction of any one particular city won't prevent instant retaliation. Then why New York? asked Amberley of Science, perhaps more sharply than he intended. Finance has been decentralized as well. A question of morale. It may be they intend to destroy our will to resist, to induce surrender by the sheer horror of the first blow. The greatest destruction of human life would be in the New York metropolitan area. Pretty cold-blooded, muttered Lynn. I know, said McAllister of security, but they're capable of it. If they thought it would mean final victory at a stroke, wouldn't we? Presidential Assistant Jeffries brushed back his white hair. Let's assume the worst. Let's assume that New York will be destroyed sometime during the winter, preferably immediately after a serious blizzard when communications are at their worst, and the disruption of utilities and food supplies in fringe areas will be most serious in their effect. Now, how do we stop them? Amberley of Science could only say, finding 10 men in 220 million is an awfully small needle in an awfully large haystack. Jeffries shook his head. You have it wrong. 10 humanoids among 220 million humans. No difference, said Amberley of Science. We don't know that a humanoid can be differentiated from a human at sight. Probably not, he looked at Lynn. They all did. Lynn said heavily, We in Cheyenne couldn't make one that would pass as human in the daylight. But they can, said McAllister of Security. And not only physically. We're sure of that. 
They've advanced mentalic procedures to the point where they can reel off the microelectronic pattern of the brain and focus it on the positronic pathways of the robot. Lynn stared. Are you implying that they can create the replica of a human being complete with personality and memory? I do. Of specific human beings? That's right. Is this also based on Agent Breckenridge's findings? Yes. The evidence can't be disputed. Lynn bent his head in thought for a moment. Then he said, The ten men in the United States are not men but humanoids. But the originals would have had to be available to them. They couldn't be Orientals, who would be too easy to spot, so they would have to be East Europeans. How would they be introduced into this country, then? With the radar network over the entire world border as tight as a drum, how could they introduce any individual, human or humanoid, without our knowing it? McAllister of security said, It can be done. There are certain legitimate seepages across the border. Businessmen, pilots, even tourists. They're watched, of course, on both sides. Still, ten of them might have been kidnapped and used as models for humanoids. The humanoids would then be sent back in their place. Since we wouldn't expect such a substitution, it would pass us by. If they were Americans to begin with, there would be no difficulty in their getting into this country. It's as simple as that. And even their friends and family could not tell the difference? We must assume so. Believe me, we've been waiting for any report that might imply sudden attacks of amnesia or troublesome changes in personality. We've checked on thousands. Amberly of science stared at his fingertips. I think ordinary measures won't work. The attack must come from the Bureau of Robotics, and I depend on the chief of that bureau. Again, eyes turned sharply, expectantly on Lynn. Lynn felt bitterness rise. It seemed to him that this was what the conference came to, and was intended for. Nothing that had been said had not been said before. He was sure of that. There was no solution to the problem, no pregnant suggestion. It was a device for the record, a device on the part of men who gravely feared defeat and who wished the responsibility for it placed clearly and unequivocally on someone else. And yet there was justice in it. It was in robotics that we had fallen short. And Lynn was not Lynn merely. He was Lynn of robotics, and the responsibility had to be his. He said, I will do what I can do. He spent a wakeful night, and there was a haggardness about both body and soul when he saw it and attained another interview with Presidential Assistant Jeffries the next morning. Breckenridge was there, and though Lynn would have preferred a private conference, he could see the justice in the situation. It was obvious that Breckenridge had attained enormous influence with the government as a result of his successful intelligence work. Well, why not? Lynn said, Sir, I am considering the possibility that we are hopping uselessly to enemy piping. What way? I'm sure that however impatient the public may grow at times, and however legislators sometimes find it expedient to talk, the government at least recognizes the world's stalemate to be beneficial. They must recognize it also. Ten humanoids with one TC bomb is a trivial way of breaking the stalemate. The destruction of 15 million human beings is scarcely trivial. It is from the world power standpoint. It would not so demoralize us as to make a surrender, or so cripple us as to convince us we could not win. There would just be the same old planetary death war that both sides have avoided so long and so successfully. And all they would have accomplished is to force us to fight minus one city. It's not enough. What do you suggest, said Jeffries, coldly, that they do not have ten humanoids in our country? That there is not a TC bomb waiting to get together? I'll agree that those things are here, but perhaps for some reason greater than just midwinter bomb madness. Such as? It may be that the physical destruction resulting from the humanoids getting together is not the worst thing that can happen to us. What about the moral and intellectual destruction that comes of their being here at all? With all due respect, Agent Breckenridge, what if they intended for us to find out about the humanoids? What if the humanoids are never supposed to get together? 
but merely to remain separate in order to give us something to worry about. Why? Tell me this. What measures have already been taken against the humanoids? I suppose that security is going through the files of all citizens who have ever been across the border or close enough to it to make kidnapping possible. I know, since McAllister mentioned yesterday, that they are following up suspicious psychiatric cases. What else? Jeffries said, Small X-ray devices are being installed in key places in the large cities, and the mass arenas, for instance where ten humanoids might slip in among a hundred thousand spectators of a football game or an air polo match? Exactly. And concert halls and churches? We must start somewhere. We can't do it all at once. Particularly when panic must be avoided, said Lynn. Isn't that so? It wouldn't do to have the public realize that at any unpredictable moment some unpredictable city and its human contents would suddenly cease to exist. I suppose that's obvious. What are you driving at? Lynn said strenuously, the growing fraction of our national effort will be diverted entirely into the nasty problem of what Amberley called finding a very small needle in a very large haystack. We'll be chasing our tails madly while they increase their research lead to the point where we find we can no longer catch up, when we must surrender without the chance even of snapping our fingers in retaliation. Consider further that this news will leak out as more and more people become involved in our countermeasures and more and more people begin to guess what we're doing. Then what? The panic might do us more harm than any one TC bomb. The presidential assistant said irritably, In heaven's name, man, what do you suggest we do then? Nothing, said Lynn. Call their bluff. Live as we have lived and gamble that they won't dare break the stalemate for the sake of a one-bomb head start. Impossible, said Jeffries. Completely impossible. The welfare of all of us is very largely in my hands, and doing nothing is the one thing I cannot do. I agree with you, perhaps, that X-ray machines at sports arenas are a kind of skin-deep measure that won't be effective, but it has to be done so that people, in the aftermath, did not come to the bitter conclusion that we tossed our country away for the sake of a subtle line of reasoning that encouraged do-nothingism. In fact, our counter-gambit will be active indeed. In what way? Presidential Assistant Jeffries looked at Breckenridge. The young security officer, hitherto calmly silent, said, It's no use talking about a possible future break in the stalemate when the stalemate is broken now. It doesn't matter whether these humanoids explode or do not. Maybe they are only a bait to divert us, as you say. But the fact remains that we are a quarter of a century behind in robotics, and that may be fatal. What other advances in robotics will there be to surprise us if war does start? The only answer is to divert our entire force immediately, now, into a crash program of robotics research. And the first problem is to find the humanoids. Call it an exercise in robotics, if you will, or call it the prevention of the death of 15 million men, women, and children. Lynn shook his head helplessly. You can't. You'd be playing into their hands. They want us lured into the one blind alley while they're free to advance in all other directions. Jeffries said impatiently, that's your guess. Breckenridge has made his suggestion through channels, and the government is approved. And we will begin with an all-science conference. All science? Breckenridge said. We have listed every important scientist of every branch of natural science. They'll all be at Cheyenne. There will be only one point on the agenda. How to advance robotics. The major specific subheading under that will be how to develop a receiving device for the electromagnetic fields of the cerebral cortex that will be sufficiently delicate to distinguish between a protoplasmic human brain and a positronic humanoid brain. Jeffries said, We had hoped you would be willing to be in charge of the conference. I was not consulted in this. Obviously, time was short, sir. Do you agree to be in charge? Lynn smiled briefly. It was a matter of responsibility again, 
The responsibility must be clearly that of Lynn of Robotics. He had the feeling it would be Breckenridge who would really be in charge, but what could he do? He said, I agree. Breckenridge and Lynn returned together to Cheyenne, where that evening Laszlo listened with a sullen mistrust to Lynn's description of coming events. Laszlo said, while you were gone, Chief, I've started putting five experimental models of humanoid structure through the testing procedures. Our men are on a 12-hour day with three shifts overlapping. If we've got to arrange a conference, we're going to be crowded and red-taped out of everything. Work will come to a halt. Breckenridge said, that will be only temporary. You will gain more than you lose. Laszlo scowled. A bunch of astrophysicists and geochemists around won't help a damn toward robotics. Views from specialists of other fields may be helpful. Are you sure? How do we know that there is any way of detecting brain waves or that? Even if we can, there is a way of differentiating human and humanoid by wave pattern. Who set up the project anyway? I did, said Breckenridge. You did? Are you a robotics man? The young security agent said calmly, I have studied robotics. That's not the same thing. I've had access to text material dealing with Russian robotics, in Russian, top secret material well in advance of anything you have here. Lynn said ruefully, he has us there, Laszlo. It was on the basis of that material. Breckenridge went on, that I suggested this particular line of investigation. It is reasonably certain that in copying off the electromagnetic pattern of a specific human mind into a specific positronic brain, a perfectly exact duplicate cannot be made. For one thing, the most complicated positronic brain small enough to fit into a human-sized skull is hundreds of times less complex than the human brain. It can't pick up all the overtones, therefore, and there must be some way to take advantage of that fact. Laszlo looked impressed despite himself, and Lynn smiled grimly. It was easy to resent Breckenridge and the coming intrusion of several hundred scientists of non-robotic specialties. But the problem itself was an intriguing one. There was that consolation, at least. It came to him quietly. Lynn found he had nothing to do but sit in his office alone with an executive position that had grown merely titular. Perhaps that helped. It gave him time to think, to picture the creative scientists of half the world converging on Cheyenne. It was Breckenridge who, with cool efficiency, was handling the details of preparation. There had been a kind of confidence in the way he said, let's get together and we'll lick them. Let's get together. It came to Lynn so quietly that anyone watching Lynn at that moment might have seen his eyes blink slowly twice, but surely nothing more. He did what he had to do with a whirling detachment that kept him calm when he felt that, by all rights, he ought to be going mad. He sought out Breckenridge and the others improvised quarters. Breckenridge was alone and frowning. Is anything wrong, sir? Lynn said wearily, everything's right, I think. I've invoked martial law. What? As chief of a division, I can do so if I am of the opinion the situation warrants it. Over my division, I can then be dictator. Chalk up one for the beauties of decentralization. You will rescind that order immediately. Breckenridge took a step forward. When Washington hears this, you will be ruined. I'm ruined anyway. Do you think I don't realize that I've been set up for the role of the greatest villain in American history? The man who let them break the stalemate? I have nothing to lose, and perhaps a great deal to gain. He laughed a little wildly. What a target the division of robotics will be, eh, Breckenridge? Only a few thousand men to be killed by a TC bomb capable of wiping out 300 square miles in one microsecond but 500 of those men will be our greatest scientists. We would be in the peculiar position of having to fight a war with our brains shot out, or surrendering. I think we'd surrender. But this is impossible, Lynn. Do you hear me? Do you understand? How could the humanoids pass our security provisions? How could they get together? 
but they are getting together. We're helping them to do so. We're ordering them to do so. Our scientists visit the other side, Breckenridge. They visit them regularly. You made a point of how strange it was that no one in robotics did. Well, ten of those scientists are still there, and in their place ten humanoids are converging on Cheyenne. That's a ridiculous guess. I think it's a good one, Breckenridge, but it wouldn't work unless we knew humanoids were in America so that we would call the conference in the first place. Quite a coincidence that you brought the news of the humanoids and suggested the conference and suggested the agenda and are running the show and know exactly which scientists were invited. Did you make sure the right ten were included? Dr. Lynn! cried Breckenridge in outrage. He poised to rush forward. Lynn said, Don't move, I've got a blaster here. We'll just wait for the scientists to get here one by one. One by one we'll x-ray them. One by one we'll monitor them for radioactivity. No two will get together without being checked. And if all five hundred are clear, I'll give you my blaster and surrender to you. Only I think we'll find the ten humanoids. Sit down, Breckenridge. They both sat. Lynn said, We wait. When I'm tired, Laszlo will spell me. We wait. Professor Manuelo Imenez of the Institute of Higher Studies of Buenos Aires exploded while the stratospheric jet on which he traveled was three miles above the Amazon Valley. It was a simple chemical explosion, but it was enough to destroy the plane. Dr. Herman Leibowitz of MIT exploded in a monorail killing 20 people and injuring a hundred others. In similar manner, Dr. Auguste Marin of the Institut Nucleonique of Montreal and seven others died at various stages of their journey to Cheyenne. Laszlo hurtled in, pale-faced and stammering with the first news of it. It had only been two hours that Lynn had sat there facing Breckenridge, blaster in hand. Laszlo said, I thought you were nuts, chief. But you were right. They were humanoids. They had to be. He turned to stare with hate-filled eyes at Breckenridge. Only they were warned. He warned them, and now there won't be one left intact, not one to study. God, cried Lynn, and in a frenzy of haste thrust his blaster out toward Breckenridge and fired. The security man's neck vanished. The torso fell. The head dropped thudded against the floor and rolled crookedly. Lynn moaned. I don't understand. I thought he was a traitor. Nothing more. And Laszlo stood immobile, mouth open, for the moment incapable of speech. Lynn said wildly, Sure, he warned them, but how could he do so while sitting in that chair unless he were equipped with built-in radio transmission? Don't you see it? Breckenridge had been in Moscow. The real Breckenridge is still there. Oh, my God, there were eleven of them. Laszlo managed a hoarse squeak. Why didn't he explode? He was hanging on, I suppose, to make sure the others had received his message and were safely destroyed. Lord, Lord, when you brought the news and I realized the truth, I couldn't shoot fast enough. God knows by how few seconds I may have beaten him to it. Laszlo said shakily, at least we'll have one to study. He bent and put his fingers on a sticky fluid trickling out of the mangled remains at the neck end of the headless body. Not blood, but high-grade machine oil. End of Let's Get Together by Isaac Asimov The Plotters by Alexander Blade Read by Edmund Bloxham. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It seemed to be the same tree that kept getting in my way. I tried to go around it, but it moved with me, and I ran right into it. And I found myself sprawled on my back, and my nose was bleeding while it hit it against the tree. Then I got up and ran again. I had to keep running. I didn't know why. I just had to. There was a puddle of water, and I splashed through it, and then slipped and fell into a thorny bush. 
When I got up, there were scratches on my hands and face and chest. As yet I felt no pain. That wouldn't come for a while, after I'd done a lot more running. But at the moment I couldn't feel a thing. In my conscious mind there was only a sort of greyness. I didn't know who I was, or who I was, or why I was running. I didn't know that if I ran long enough, and bumped into enough trees, and scratched myself often enough, I would eventually feel pain. Or that out of the exertion and the pain would come awareness. Oh, that must have been there, but buried so deep it didn't come through. It was only instinct which kept me going. The same tree was in my way again, and this time I didn't even try to go around it. My breath was knocked out of me. After a few gasps it came back, and then I was off again. I went up a rise and down into a hollow and tripped over roots. That time I didn't fall. I went up the other side of the hollow with the wind whistling in my ears. A few drops of rain fell. There were flashes of lightning in the sky. Wet leaves whipped against my face, and there was a crack of thunder so close that it shook me. I ran away from the thunder and up another rise, and down into another hollow. The wind was stronger now. It came in long blasts. Sometimes I ran with it, and sometimes against it. When I ran against it, I didn't make much headway, but my legs kept pumping. There was tall grass to slow me down, and there were roots to trip me. There was the wind and the thunder and the lightning, and there were always trees. And then there was a terrible flash, and above me a crack that was not of thunder. Something came crashing down. It was the limb of a tree. It crashed against my chest and smashed me flat on my back and pinned me there. One of my ribs fell broken. It jabbed into me as I fought to raise this weight from my chest, and this was a pain I could feel. This was something that hurt as nothing had ever hurt me before. This was excruciating. But it was the pain that cut through the grayness of my mind, and because of that, I welcomed it. With the pain would come knowledge. I would know who I was and why I was running. Already there were figures racing across the blankness. There were faces and there were names, Ristal, Kresh, Marco, Copper, Beth. I was Marco. I knew that much already. Beth was the golden girl. Somehow I knew that too, but who were the others? It wasn't coming fast enough. I couldn't find the connections. There was only one way to bring it back, to bridge the gaps. I had to start somewhere with what I knew. I had to start with myself, and then bridge the gap to Beth. That was the beginning. I checked with the mirror for the last time, and decided that I would pass muster. As far as I could see, I looked like almost any college student. There wasn't anything I could do about my hair. It hadn't grown at all. It was a mass of short black ringlets that fit my head like a tight cap, but there was no use worrying about that. Mrs. Mower came down the hall just as I was locking the door. She looked hurt when she saw me turn the key. You don't have to do that in my house, she said. There's nobody would think of going into your room. Of course not, I said. It's just force of habit, you know. I smiled and hoped she would pass it off as lightly as I seemed to. The last thing in the world I wanted was to have her get suspicious and go prowling about my room. I felt easier when she smiled back at me. Sure, and where are you off to now? Swimming, I said. That is, if I can get into the college pool. Just act like you own the place and nobody will ask you any questions, she said and winked at me. That was exactly the way I'd figured it, but it was good to have reassurance. Theoretically, no one was supposed to use the pool who was not a member of the faculty or student body. Enforcement, however, was lax, and the chances were that nobody would ask to see my card. Mrs. Morrow and I were right. The day was hot, and the men who were supposed to be watching the entrance were sitting in the shade of the stands and quenching their thirst with soft drinks. I walked right in, looking straight ahead. It was a large pool, used for skating in winter, and there were stands built on three sides. Instead of going down to the locker room, I merely slipped out of my shirt and trousers, rolled them into a ball, and dropped them beside the pool. A good many others had also worn their swimsuits underneath. Then I looked around for the girl. She was down near the other end of the pool, talking to some people. As I came toward them, she left the group and climbed up on the diving board. Against her white bathing suit, her small, trim figure showed golden. Her hair was almost the same color. She looked like the bathing suit models I had seen in store windows. The golden model came to life as she left the board in a high, arching dive. She hit the water with hardly a splash. Nice stuff, Beth, one of the men said as she swam toward them. Was it really Ken? the girl asked. 
He nodded as he said it was. They began to talk about diving and swimming. The man called Ken did most of the talking. He said he wanted to show her a few things about her swimming stroke. He jumped off the edge of the pool and swam across, and then turned around and swam back. Everybody stopped what they were doing and watched him. When he clambered out, he smiled in a very superior way. See what I mean? You gotta use your legs more. You splash too much, I said. It was the only way I could think of at the moment to get into the conversation. But it got me in. Everybody was looking at me as though I were out of my mind. Ken sneered. Oh, I do? Don't take it offensively, I said, but you really do. Also, your own motion isn't good. He was so angry that it was almost funny. Now I was sorry I'd spoken, because the girl might be a close friend of his, and she might take offense. Maybe you'd like to show me how it's done, Ken said hotly. I could make it worth your while. Suppose you race two lengths, for ten dollars. That's not fair, Ken, the girl said. I could see that he didn't like the way he was taking it, so that was all right. But I hesitated. I didn't have ten dollars. On the other hand, I had been watching these people swim. It was an easy way to make ten dollars, since I had no other means of getting money. There was the hundred dollars which I had taken from a man on the road the day I came into town, but that money was gone. Come on, I said, and started walking to the end of the pool. When I got there, I bent and dipped one foot into the water. It was colder than the water had been used to, and not quite as heavy, somehow. I pulled my foot out quickly, and everybody laughed, except the girl. This isn't right, she said. He turned to me. You don't know who Ken is, apparently. You are very kind, I said. I smiled at her, and she smiled back. She had blue eyes. By that time, the pool had been cleared. Everybody was out of the water and standing at the edge. Ken said, Whenever you're ready. I'm ready now, I said, and immediately one of his friends gave the signal. Go! Ken jumped in first. Then I dived in. Once in the water, it did not feel so cold, nor so light. I swam down to the other end and turned around and swam back. When I climbed out, Ken was just making his turn at the far end. Everyone was looking at me very strangely. Ken came out rubbing his shoulder. Must have pulled a muscle, he muttered. In that case, I wouldn't think of taking your money, I told him. I don't believe I've seen you around here before, he said. You've got to have a card to swim here, you know. Well, I don't have one, so I suppose I'd better go. Of all the cheap tricks, the girl said. I think I'll go too. Wait for me. I waited for her while she went to get dressed. I put on my trousers over my swimming trunks, put on my shirt and shoes, and sat on a bench and waited. When she came out, we started for the exit. Ken came hurrying toward us. I thought I was taking you home, he said, his face red with anger. She didn't bother to reply, and he put his hand on her arm. I told him to let go, and he let go. Then he swung around and hit me on the jaw with all his might. I grabbed his arm with one hand and his throat with the other and threw him into the middle of the pool. Things were going better than I expected. As we walked along, she seemed quite interested in me. I told her my name, and she told me that she was Beth Coppard, the daughter of a professor at the university. I pretended that I hadn't known those things. When we got to her home, which was on a tree-lined street, we paused for a moment. Across the street there was a car with a man sitting in it, pretending to read a newspaper. I know all about that man. I knew there was another man who was watching the back of the house. If not for that, I would not have to go through this lengthy affair with Beth Coppard. I regret very much this trouble with your friend, I said. You needn't. He's had it coming for a long time. He stared at me thoughtfully. You know, Marco, I'm a little afraid of you. Of me? But why? Well, she hesitated. It's hard to say, but when a man jumps into a pool and swims so much faster than one of the country's best swimmers and then picks up that swimmer and throws him fifty feet without the slightest effort, well, that man is slightly unusual, to say the least. Oh, the swimming. I hadn't thought that what was quite ordinary for me might seem exactly the opposite to these people. I had blundered, so I tried to shrug it off, as though such things were common among my people, which they were. But that line only dragged me deeper. This girl was no fool. That's what I meant, Marco. You aren't being modest. You're acting as though you're used to such feats, and take them as a matter of course. And there's your accent, I can't quite place it. Some day I'll tell you all about it, I said lightly, when we know each other better. It's going pretty fast, isn't it? Some of us have found that we don't have all the time we should like, 
He must go fast or not at all. It was a platitude, slightly jumbled, but nonetheless true. Beth was looking up at me. There were things she might have noticed, that my skin was uncommonly smooth, and that I hadn't even the faintest trace of whiskers. She didn't notice those things. She was looking into my eyes. I found myself enjoying this experience. Will you come in for a while? she asked slowly. I relaxed. Everything was all right for the present. She was taking me at face value. She liked me, and I liked her. The operation was proceeding smoothly. We walked into a large room, pleasantly furnished. On a couch opposite the doorway, three men sat talking. Two others stood before them. The moment we entered, the conversation stopped abruptly. Beth, said a tall, graying man, who was already stuffing papers into a bag. Back so soon? He wasn't really listening for a reply, and Beth didn't make one. When he had the papers in the bag, he locked it, then snapped it around his wrist and put the key in his pocket. We'll continue with this at the lab, he said to the men. I'll be along in just a few minutes. Then he came up to us. I see you replaced your blonde young man, he smiled. I know all about this man who stood before me, with his stooped shoulders and keen eyes. Eldith Coppard would have been surprised at the extent of my knowledge. I even knew why his government considered it wise to have several of its security agents near him at all times. Can't you stay a minute and get acquainted with Marco? Beth was saying. He's really a remarkable fellow. He can swim faster than you and I could run. Literally, that'll be quite fast. Literally. He looked at me with sudden interest, and I was sorry the conversation had taken that turn. I didn't want those keen eyes examining me too closely. They might note the absence of skin porosity. Copper didn't notice, but I made a mental note to watch my step, and another not to go swimming again. Beth would be watching me, and if she were close enough, she might see the webbing popping out between my fingers and toes when I got into the water. That's my father, Beth said after he and I had shaken hands and he had left. Demands exactness. He's a scientist, you know, a physicist. Oh, I said, as if I hadn't known. Is he always this busy? Busier. If he isn't working at the lab till all hours, he's working at home in his study. Or having conferences. The only time I have him alone and to myself is Sunday evening. That was the information I'd been hoping for. Beth and I sat on the couch her father had vacated. We talked. I watched my words carefully. There were a good many commonplace things I knew nothing about, and I didn't want any more questions about myself. Fortunately, conversation between a young man and a young woman is much the same everywhere. I didn't have to pretend I was interested in Beth. She was unusually attractive, and she seemed to find me so. We talked a bit, laughed a good deal, and when I got up to leave I knew that I'd done well in the initial stage. There was still a good deal to be done. May I see you tonight? I asked. Just a coke date. That was an expression I'd heard, and had taken the trouble to make certain I understood. It seemed to be just the thing in the present case. I like that, Beth said. Pick me up about nine. Her choice of time could not have been more suitable. I was out of money. There was Mrs. Mara to be paid, and now the cost of the evening's entertainment. Until darkness fell, I could do nothing about that, so I went back to my room and read old newspapers I had collected. I had discovered on my first day that those were the best sources of information, those and the moving pictures. For one who must learn a great deal about a people in a short time, there is one infallible way. Watch them in their favorite sports and relaxations. The moving pictures and the comic strips had been invaluable. In another few weeks, I could have passed anywhere. At eight o'clock it was growing dark. I changed my shirt, put on a sport coat and left the room. Five minutes later I was walking down a quiet street that was lined with fashionable homes. After that it was merely a question of time. I went around the block, found that it was still too light, and went around again, this time slowly. There was only one man on the street on my next time around. I sized him up quickly and decided that he was prosperous. He came on toward me. I managed to be looking the other way. We bumped into each other, and he fell. I said, sorry, and bent to help him up. My fingers touched his throat in the proper places, and he went limp. Within a matter of seconds I had his wallet out of his pocket and extracted several bills. When his eyes flickered again, I was just raising him to his feet. All my fault, I said contritely. Are you all right? Seemed to be. He was gruff, 
but that was all. He didn't know that for a matter of seconds he'd been unconscious. At nine o'clock I came up the walk to the coppered house, home. This time the security agent was leaning against a tree, lighting a cigarette. I made certain that he saw my face clearly. One upstairs window showed a light, and a faint murmur of voices drifted down. That had to be Coppard's room. Then a porch light flashed on, and Beth came out of the door. She was wearing a white dress, and the overhead light seemed to create a golden halo above her head. I momentarily forgot about her father. How much can a man learn in a few weeks? I had to be so very careful. Historical matters had to be avoided at all costs. Contemporary affairs were fine. Philosophy was best. Philosophy is always the best. Good and evil are present everywhere. They can be discussed in the vaguest terms. We discussed many things in vague terms. And yet there was a sense of intimacy which grew between us. It was hard for me to define, and after a while I gave up trying to discover what it was. I merely enjoyed it. When I took her home I knew that it was not fear of the dark that made her walk so close to me. The movies had taught me a great deal about this matter of love play. Although some of it was highly exaggerated, it showed clearly enough the drives of these people and some of their methods of acting them out. We were standing on the porch when I kissed Beth. It was the first time I had ever pressed my lips to those of anyone else. My technique was good. I felt Beth respond, pressing harder against me. My mission was on its way to completion. I felt a moment of triumph, and then suddenly, crazily, my mission was gone from my mind. I felt only a strange exhilaration that swept over me and made my heart pound and my head grow hot. What's the matter, Marco? Beth asked as I pulled away. I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't try to figure it out. I had to get out of there and try to regain my equilibrium. On a mission like mine, I had to keep my head. Shall I see you tomorrow, I said. All the tomorrows you want, Beth answered. There was eagerness, and yet a note of regret. It was as though she instinctively knew that something was wrong. But my work had been well done. She was in too far, and I had cut her emotional line of retreat. I saw Beth the next afternoon and the next evening. My presence on the porch and in her home became such a common thing that the security agent hardly gave me a glance now. Those few days passed by swiftly, and yet each hour in those days was long. I was very cautious. Beth and I kissed many times, but I never allowed myself to be moved as on that first time. Sunday loomed larger and larger, closer and closer. I was a constant and ever-present guest. It was an elementary matter to get Beth to invite me for Sunday dinner. The invitation came on Saturday night, and that night when I came back to my room I called Ristel for the first time since we had arrived. Tomorrow, I said into the Besno. Early evening. Good. That was all we said, but it was enough. Our frequency was too high to be picked up. Still, we were taking no chances. Ristel knew precisely what I meant, and he would be ready. I had the feeling that comes when a mission is about to be completed. It was a feeling of tension, and yet for the first time in my career I had a lowering of spirits that I could not explain. The feeling persisted until late Sunday afternoon. Then I pushed it from my mind. I dressed carefully, slipped the besnol into my inner pocket, and put my Dell gun in my coat pocket. Take your coat off, Beth said when I came in. You ought to know there's no formality here. I'm really quite comfortable, I told her. Am I late? No, just in time. Dad will be down in a moment. He came down the stairs from his study while we were talking. He greeted me warmly, and yet I felt that this time he was scrutinizing me. All well, during the dinner his eyes were on me, weighing me. I felt what was coming, and as we rose from the table it came. I hope you won't be offended, Marco, Coppet said, but there are some strange things about you. Do you ever shave? No, I said. I looked out the window and saw it was growing darker. That's odd. And about your hair, have you ever realized that every strand of it grows in a different direction? You could never comb it. The skin is of an unusually fine texture. And when you reached for something at the table, I observed strange folds of skin between your fingers. You are somehow not like the rest of us. Naturally, I said. And it didn't matter now. It was dark enough. Why, naturally. Because, I told him, 
I am a Venusian. My tone was matter-of-fact, yet they knew that I was not joking. Beth was staring at me, a growing fear and horror in her eyes. Her father seemed dazed by the revelation. I took the Dell gun from my pocket and showed it to them. This is a weapon strange to you, but it is effective at this range. Please don't make me use it. But what do you want? Papa had asked. I want you to take a ride with me, in your car. I let them put on their coats, and then we walked out onto the porch and down the stairs. Across the street, the security agent barely glanced at us. Then we got into Cuppet's car, Beth and he in the front seat, and I in the back. I told him in which direction to go. At the outskirts of town we lost the car that was following us. I planned this part of it perfectly. We pulled into a side road and turned off our lights. The agent went right behind us. What is it you want of me? Carpet said as we started up again. We want to have a long discussion with you about some matters in which you are an authority. And that's what this whole affair with me was for. So that you could go to my father, Beth said accusingly. I saw her shoulders shake. Yes, now turn off here. We turned off the main road and followed a rutted trail onto an old farm. The farmhouse was a wreck, but the barn still good. Our ship was there. The door opened as we walked toward the barn. Ristal's tall figure was framed in the doorway, and behind him stood a crash, broad and ungainly. The others crowded up behind them. Good work, Marco, Ristal said. We went on to the ship, which filled the whole interior of the barn. This is Commander Restal of the Venusian Intelligence, I told Coppard and Beth. What's your official title? Beth asked bitterly. I'm a special agent and language expert, I told her. Then I explained why I had brought them here. Our civilization is some way in advance of yours. As you see, we have mastered interplanetary travel, but it is essentially a peaceful civilization. Our weapons such as we have, are of limited range and power. When it became known that Earth was developing monstrous weapons of aggression, we realized that we must be prepared for the worst. There was only one way to discover what you already had and what you were working on. Once we arrived here, we found that a man named Coppard was the prime figure in the country's atomic weapons research. It became our duty to seek him out. I see, Coppard grunted. And now you expect me to reveal secrets which I'm bound by oath to protect with my very life. You will reveal them, Ristyle told him. I didn't like the way Ristyle said that. There was a tinge of cruelty in his tone and in the sudden tightening of his lips. I hadn't ever worked with him before or with Crash, who was Ristyle's second in command, but I didn't like the methods their manner implied. Cabot looked worried. I told you we were a peaceful people, I put in. Let me handle this. Ristal said. He pointed to a machine which stood in a corner. That, he explained to Coppard, is the device which we ordinarily use in surgery on diagnosis. It has the faculty of making the nerves infinitely more sensitive to stimuli, also to pain. Do you understand? You can't use that on him, I said. Ristal looked at me strangely. Of course not, but on his daughter, yes. No father likes to see his daughter suffer. That's out, I said flatly. You know what our orders are. I know what they were. This is my own idea, Marco. Please remember that I am commander of here. I was duty-bound to obey him. I thought that I was going to obey. But as Crash stepped toward Beth, I found myself between them. I think that those higher up may have something to say about this, I told Ristel. With the information that this man can give me, I shall be in a position to ignore those higher up. Ristel grinned. Crash reaped for Beth, and I hit him. I knew now what Ristel had in mind. With atomic weapons he could make himself master of Venus and of Earth, but even more important than that was the thought that he must not harm Beth. Crash was coming back at me. I hit him again, and he went down. Then the others came piling in. There were four of them, too many for me. I fought like a madman, but they overwhelmed me and held me helpless. Give him a shot of Bentau, Ristel ordered. I ought to quiet him, then dump him in a cabin. We'll dispose of him later. Then Crash was coming at me with a hypodermic needle. I felt it stab into my arm. He gave me a dose that might have killed an ordinary man. I knew how Bentel worked. It was a drug that would throw me into a stupor, that would render my mind blank, 
Already it was taking effect. I pretended to be unconscious. Two men lifted me and carried me to a cabin, dropped me on the bunk and went out. The last thing I saw from beneath my lids was Beth being dragged toward that diabolical machine. My senses were leaving me. I knew that I had to overcome the effects of the drug. I knew that I had to get out of that cabin. Somehow I dragged myself out of the bunk and got a porthole open. I crawled through it and dropped to the floor of the barn. There were some loose boards and I pried them further apart and crawled out into the open. I no longer knew what I was doing. I no longer remembered Beth. I only knew that I had to run and keep on running. My broken rib was stabbing into me like a knife. Across my chest, the limb of the tree was a dead weight that crushed me. But now I knew who I was and what I was doing. Despite the agony, I managed to get my hands under the limb. I pushed up and felt it move. The pressure on my chest was gone. Inch by inch, I slid out from beneath the huge branch. I staggered to my feet. How much time had elapsed, I didn't know. I was running again, but now I was running towards a dark barn. It wouldn't have taken Ristal long to get started. Maybe by now Beth was... I shut the thought from my mind. I was a few hundred yards away when the first scream came. Through the wind and the pelting rain it came, and it chilled me more than they had done. My chest was aflame with every panting breath I took, but I ran as I had never run before. I had to get there before she screamed again. I had to stop them from doing this to her. The barn door was locked. I got my fingers under the edge and ripped the wood away from the lock and went on through and into the ship. None of them saw me coming. Coppard was tied in a chair, his face contorted and tears streaming down his face. Three of the men held Beth while Ristal and Kresh walked over her. The rest were watching. They hadn't taken my Delgon from me, but I couldn't use it for fear of hitting Beth. I had it out of my pocket and in my hand as I charged across the room. My rush brought me into point-blank range, and a line parallel with Beth's prostrate figure. At the same time, her torturers wailed about to face me, trapped for an instant in the paralysis of complete surprise. Ristal was the first to move. Drop the gun, Marco, he said. In my weakened condition, habit governed my reflexes. I almost obeyed the order. Then Ristal took a single step forward, and I swung the muzzle of the gun upward again. You almost had me, I said. But you are no longer in command. You and Kresh will return as prisoners, to face trial. I hoped that he would accept the inevitable. Our crew could plead that they had done nothing except follow the orders of their commanding officer. But for Kresh and Ristel there could be no mitigating circumstances. They would stand trial, and they would receive the harshest of punishments. Exile. It was a bleak outlook for them, and the bleakness was reflected in their faces. Ristel's hand flicked to his gun. I fired once, and there was the smell of searing flesh. Crash, I asked. He looked down at the faceless figure on the floor and shook his head. He raised his elbows, leaving his holster exposed. I nodded to one of the crewmen, and he stepped forward and removed Crash's Dell gun. Drop it on the floor, I said, then tear off his insignia and lock him in the forward cabin. It was the end of the mutiny, but I felt no joy at that. My chest pained intolerably. My shoulders sagged in exhaustion, and I had failed in my mission. Beth was all right. I went to her and tore the electrodes from her wrists and ankles and helped her to her feet. She refused to look at me, even allowing me to untie her father by myself. I regret that it turned out this way, I said. How could it turn out any other way? Beth demanded suddenly. Do you think we we'll trust you now? Off in the night a siren wailed. I listened while well, another siren joined the first. They're already looking for you, I said, which shows how little chance I would have had of getting to you openly. You'd better be going now. But as I led them to the door, I knew I had to make one more attempt. Professor Coppard, do you think there might still be hope? We or Venus can offer much to Earth. Maybe there is hope, he said, and looked brighter than I had ever seen him look. I was reaching the point where I had no faith in the future. But now, knowing that you have solved the problems of reface, perhaps if the proper arrangements were made, but you would be risking a great deal to return, and I can assure you that for a long time Venus will be safe, so you have no reason. I have good reason for coming back, I interrupted, taking Beth by the shoulders. I swung her about to face me. I love you, I said. I started out to trick you, and ended by loving you. 
Then her arms were about me and her lips were on mine. I felt my face wet with her tears, and I knew that my love was returned. There were still problems to face, dangers to overcome, but they didn't matter. It may be a year, I said, perhaps two years. I'll be waiting. I'll be standing here, waiting for you. Now the sirens were very close, and there were searchlights sweeping the fields and the woods. I watched Beth and her father walking away, and then I closed the door. I should have felt sad, but I didn't. A year or two weren't much. On this planet, far from my own, I was leaving my heart, and I would return one day to redeem it. End of the Plotters by Alexander Blade Common Denominator by John D. MacDonald this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Advanced races generally are eager to share their knowledge with primitive ones. In this case, with Earthmen. When Scout Group 40 flickered back across half the galaxy with the complete culture study of a Class Seven civilization on three planets of Argus-10, the Bureau of Stellar Defense had, of course, a priority claim on all data. Class Sevens were rare and of high potential danger, so all personnel of Group 40 were placed in tight quarantine during the 30 days required for a detailed analysis of the thousands of film spools. News of the contact leaked out, and professional alarmists predicted dire things on the news screens of the three home planets of Saul. A retired admiral of the Space Navy published an article in which he stated bitterly that the fleet had been weakened by 20 years of softness in high places. On the 31st day, BSD reported to System President Mize that the inhabitants of the three planets of Argus-10 constituted no threat, that there was no military necessity for alarm, that approval of a commerce treaty was recommended, that all data was being turned over to the Bureau of Stellar Trade and Economy for analysis, that personnel of Scout Group 40 was being given 60 days leave before reassignment. BSTE released film to all commercial networks at once, and visions of slavering, oily monsters disappeared from the imagination of mankind. The Argonauts, as they came to be called, were pleasantly similar to mankind. It was additional proof that only in the rarest instance was the life apex on any planet in the home galaxy an abrupt divergence from the human form. The homogeneousness of planet elements throughout the galaxy made homogeneousness of life apex almost a truism. The bipedal, oxygen-breathing vertebrate with opposing thumb seems best suited for survival. It was evident that, with training, the average Argonaut could pass almost unnoticed in the solar system. The flesh tones were brightly pink, like that of a sunburned human, Cranial hair was uniformly taffy yellow. They were heavier and more fleshy than humans. Their women had a pronounced Reuben's look, a warm, moist, rosy, comfortable look. Everyone remarked on the placidity and contentment of facial expressions by human standards. The inevitable comparison was made. The Argonauts looked like a race of in- and beer garden proprietors in the Barbarian Alps. With leather pants to slap, stein lids to click, feathers and Tyrolean hats and peasant skirts on their women, they would represent a culture and a way of life that had been missing from Earth for far too many generations. Eight months after matters had been turned over to BSTE, the first trade group returned to Earth with a bewildering variety of artifacts and devices plus a round dozen Argonauts. The Argonauts had learned to speak Solian with an amusing guttural accent. They beamed on everything and everybody. They were great pets until the novelty wore off. 
profitable trade was inaugurated because the Argonaut devices all seemed designed to make life more pleasant. The synthesizer became very popular once it was adjusted to meet human tastes. Worn as a lapel button, it could create the odor of pine, broiled steak, spring flowers, scotch whiskey, musk, even skunk for the practical jokers who exist in all ages and eras. Any home equipped with an Argonaut static clean never became dusty. It used no power and had to be emptied only once a year. Technicians altered the Argonaut mechanical game animal so that it looked like an earth rabbit. The weapons which shot a harmless beam were altered to look like rifles. After one experience with the new game, hunters were almost breathless with excitement. The incredible agility of the mechanical animal, its ability to take cover, the fact that once the beam felled it, you could use it over and over again, all this made for the promulgation of new, non-lethal hunting. Lambert, chief of the Bureau of Racial Maturity, waited patiently for his chance at the Argonaut data. The cramped offices in the temporary wing of the old system security building, the meager appropriation, the obsolete office equipment, the inadequate staff, all testified not only to the Bureau's lack of priority, but also to a lack of knowledge of its existence on the part of many system officials. Lambert, crag-faced, sandy, slow-moving, was a historian, anthropologist, and sociologist. He was realist enough to understand that if the Bureau of Racial Maturity happened to be more important in system government, it would probably be headed by a man with fewer academic and more political qualifications. And Lambert knew, beyond any doubt at all, that the BRM was more important to the race and the future of the race than any other branch of system government. Set up by President Tolles, an adult and enlightened administrator, the Bureau was now slowly being strangled by a constantly decreasing appropriation. Lambert knew that mankind had come too far, too fast. Mankind had dropped out of a tree with all the primordial instincts to rend and tear and claw. 20,000 years later, and with only a few thousand years of dubiously recorded history, he had reached the stars. It was too quick. Lambert knew that mankind must become mature in order to survive. The domination of instinct had to be watered down and rapidly. Selective breeding might do it, but it was an answer impossible to enforce. He hoped that one day the records of an alien civilization would give him the answer. After a year of bureaucratic wriggling, feints and counterfeints, he had acquired the right of access to scout group data. As his patience dwindled, he wrote increasingly firm letters to central files and routing. In the end, when he finally located the data improperly stored in the closed files of the BSTE, he took no more chances. He went in person with an assistant named Cooper and a commandeered electric hand truck and bullied a BSTE storage clerk into accepting a receipt for the Argonaut data the clerk's cooperation was lessened by never having heard of the Bureau of Racial Maturity. The file contained the dictionary and grammar compiled by the scout group, plus all the films taken on the three planets of Argus 10, plus microfilms of 12,000 books written in the language of the Argonauts. Their written language was ideographic and thus presented more than usual difficulties. Lambert knew that translations had been made, but somewhere along the line they had disappeared. Lambert set his whole staff to work on the language. He hired additional linguists out of his own thin enough pocket. He gave up all outside activities in order to hasten the progress of his own knowledge. His wife, respecting Lambert's high order of devotion to his work, kept their two half-grown children from interfering during those long evenings when he studied and translated at home. 
Two evenings a week, Lambert called on Vonk Pugla, the Argonaut assigned to trade coordination, and improved his conversational Argonian to the point where he could obtain additional historical information from the pink-wide man. Of the 12,000 books, the number of special interests to Lambert were only 110. On those, he based his master chart. An animated film of the chart was prepared at Lambert's own expense, and when it was done, he requested an appointment with Simkin, Secretary for Stellar Affairs, going through all the normal channels to obtain the interview. He asked an hour of Simkin's time. It took two weeks. Simkin was a big, florid man with iron-gray hair, skeptical eyes, and that indefinable look of political opportunism. He came around his big desk to shake Lambert's hand. Ah, Lambert, glad to see you, fella. I ought to get around to my bureau chiefs more often, but you know how hectic things are up here. I know, Mr. Secretary. I have something here of the utmost importance, and... Bureau of Racial Maturity, isn't it? I never did know exactly what you people do. Sort of progress reports or something. Of the utmost importance, Lambert repeated doggedly. Simpkin smiled. I hear that all day, but go ahead. I want to show you a chart. A historical chart of the Argonaut civilization. Lambert put the projector in position and plugged it in. He focused it on the wall screen. It was decided, Simpkin said firmly, that the Argonauts are not a menace to us in any... I know that, sir. Please, look at the chart first, and then, when you've seen it, I think you'll know what I mean. Go ahead, Simpkin agreed resignedly. I can be accused of adding apples and lemons in this presentation, sir. Notice the blank chart. The baseline is in years adjusted to our calendar so as to give a comparison. Their recorded history covers 12,000 of our years. That's better than four times ours. Now note the red line. That shows the percentage of their total population involved in wars. It peaked 8,000 years ago. Note how suddenly it drops after that. In 500 years, it sinks to the baseline and does not appear again. Here comes the second line, crimes of violence. It also peaks 8,000 years ago. It drops less quickly than the war line and never does actually cut the baseline. Some crimes still exist there, but a very, very tiny percentage compared to ours on a population basis or to their own past. The third line, the yellow line climbing abruptly, is the index of insanity. Again, a peak during the same approximate period in their history. Again, almost a drop to the baseline. Simkin pursed his heavy lips. Odd, isn't it? Now this fourth line needs some explaining. I winnowed out death rates by age groups. Their lifespan is 1.3 times ours, so it had to be adjusted. I found a strange thing. I took the age group conforming to our 18 to 24 year group, that green line. Note that by the time we start getting decent figures 9,000 years ago, it remains almost constant and at a level conforming to our own experience. Now note what happens when the green line reaches a point 8,000 years ago. See how it begins to climb? Now steeper, Almost vertical, it remains at a high level for almost a thousand years, way beyond the end of their history of war, and then descends slowly toward the baseline, leveling out about two thousand years ago. Lambert clicked off the projector. Is that all? Simpkin asked. Isn't it enough? I'm concerned with the future of our own race. Somehow the Argonauts have found an answer to war, insanity, violence. We need that answer if we are to survive. Come now, Lambert, Simpkin said wearily. Don't you see it? Their history parallels ours. 
they had our same problems. They saw a disaster ahead and did something about it. What did they do? I have to know that. How do you expect to? I want travel orders to go there. I'm afraid that's quite impossible. There are no funds for that sort of jaunt, Lambert. And I think you're worrying over nothing. Shall I show you some of our own trends? Shall I show you murder turning from the most horrid crime into a relatively commonplace? Shall I show you the slow, inevitable increase in asylum space? I know all that, man. But look at the Argonauts. Do you want that sort of stagnation? Do you want a race of fat, pink, sleepy? Maybe they had a choice. A species of stagnation or the end of their race. Faced with that choice, which would you pick, Mr. Secretary? There are no funds. All I want is authority. I'll pay my own way. And he did. Reen was the home planet of the Argonauts, the third from their sun. When the trade ship flickered into three-dimensional existence, 10,000 miles above Reen, Lambert stretched the space ache out of his long bones and muscles and smiled at Vonk Pugla. You could have saved me the trip, you know, Lambert said. A grin creased the round pink visage. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Besides, only my cousin can speak about this thing you wonder about. My cousin is a very important person. He is one who picks me to go to your planet. Vonk Pugla was transported with delight at being able to show the wonders of the ancient capital city to Lambert. It had been sacked and burned over 8,000 Earth years before, and now it was mellowed by 83 centuries of unbroken peace. It rested in the pastel twilight, and there were laughter and soft singing in the broad streets. Never had Lambert felt such a warm aura of security and love. No other word but that ultimate one seemed right. In the morning, they went to the squat blue building where Vonk Subaknura, the important person, had his administrative headquarters. Lambert, knowing enough of Argonaut governmental structure to understand that Subaknura was titular head of the three-planet government, could not help but compare the lack of protocol with what he could expect were he to try to take Vonk Pugla for an interview with President Mize. Subaknura was a smaller, older edition of Pugla. His pink face wrinkled, his greening hair retaining only a trace of the original yellow. Subaknura spoke Nosolian, and he was very pleased to find that Lambert spoke Argonian. Subaknura watched the animated chart with considerable interest. After it was over, he seemed lost in thought. It is something so private with us, man Lambert that we seldom speak of it to each other, Subaknura said in Argonian. It is not written. Maybe we have shame, a guilt sense. That is hard to say. I have decided to tell you what took place among us 8,000 years ago. I would be grateful. We live in contentment. Maybe it is good, maybe it is not so good, but we continue to live. Where did our trouble come from in the old days, when we were like your race? Back when we were brash and young and wickedly cruel? From the individuals, those driven ones who were motivated to succeed despite all obstacles. They made our paintings, wrote our music, killed each other, fomented our unrest, our wars. We live off the bewildering richness of our past. He sighed. It was a problem. To understand our solution, you must think of an analogy, Man Lambert. Think of a factory where machines are made. We will call the acceptable machines stable, the unacceptable ones unstable. They are built with a flywheel which must turn at a certain speed. If it exceeds that speed, it is no good. But a machine that is stable can, at any time, become unstable. What is the solution? He smiled at Lambert. I'm a bit confused, Lambert confessed. 
you would have to go around inspecting the machines constantly for stability. And use a gauge? No. Too much trouble. An unstable machine can do damage. So we do this. We put a little governor on the machine. When the speed passes the safety mark, the machine breaks. But this is an analogy, Vonk Subaknura, Lambert protested. You can't put a governor on a man. Man is born with a governor, Man Lambert. Look back in both our histories, when we were not much above the animal level. An unbalanced man would die. He could not compete for food. He could not organize the simple things of his life for survival. Man Lambert, did you ever have a fleeting impulse to kill yourself? Lambert smiled. Of course. You could almost call that impulse a norm for intelligent species. Did it ever go far enough so that you considered a method? A weapon? Lambert nodded slowly. It's hard to remember, but I think I did. Yes, once I did. And what would have happened? The Argonaut asked softly. If there had been available to you in that moment a weapon completely painless, completely final. Lambert's mouth went dry. I probably would have used it. I was very young. Wait, I'm beginning to see what you mean, but... The governor had to be built into the body, Subaknura interrupted, and yet so designed that there would be no possibility of accidental activation. Suppose that on this day I start to think of how great and powerful I am in this position I have. I get an enormous desire to become even more powerful. I begin to reason emotionally. Soon I have a setback. I am depressed. I am out of balance, you could say. I have become dangerous to myself and to our culture. In a moment of depression, I take these two smallest fingers of each hand. I reach behind me, and I press the two fingers, held firmly together, to a space in the middle of my back. A tiny capsule buried at the base of my brain is activated, and I am dead within a thousandth part of a second. Fong Pugla is the same. All of us are the same. The passing urge for self-destruction happens to be the common denominator of imbalance. We purged our race of the influence of the neurotic, the egocentric, the hypersensitive, merely by making self-destruction very, very easy. Then that death rate... At 18, the operation is performed. It is very quick and very simple. We saw destruction ahead. We had to force it through. In the beginning, the deaths were frightening. There were so many of them. The stable ones survived, bred, reproduced. A lesser but still great percentage of the next generation went. And so on. Until now, it is almost static. In Argonian, Lambert said hotly, Oh, it sounds fine, but what about children? What sort of heartless race can plant the seed of death in its own children? Never before had he seen the faintest trace of anger on any Argonaut face. The single nostril widened, and Subuknura might have raged if he had been from Earth. There are other choices, Man Lambert. Our children have no expectation of being burned to cinder, blown to fragments. They are free of that fear. Which is the better love, Man Lambert? I have two children. I couldn't bear to. Wait, Subugnura said. Think one moment. Suppose you were to know that when they reached the age of 18, both your children were to be operated on by our methods. How would that affect your present relationship to them? Lambert was, above all, a realist. He remembered the days of being too busy for the children of passing off their serious questions with a joking or curt evasion, of playing with them 
as though they were young, pleasing, furry animals. I would do a better job as a parent, Lambert admitted. I would try to give them enough emotional stability so that they would never have that urge to kill themselves. But Anne is delicate, moody, unpredictable, artistic. Pugla and Subognura nodded in unison. You would probably lose that one. Maybe you would lose both, Subognura agreed. But it is better to lose more than half the children of a few generations to save the race. Lambert thought some more. He said, I shall go back and I shall speak of this plan and what it did for you, but I do not think my race will like it. I do not want to insult you or your people, but you have stagnated. You stand still in time. Vonk Pugla laughed largely. Not by a damn sight, he said gleefully. Next year we stop giving the operation. We stop for good. It was just 8,000 years to permit us to catch our breath before going on more safely. And what is 8,000 years of marking time in the history of a race? Nothing, my friend. Nothing. When Lambert went back to Earth, he naturally quit his job. End of Common Denominator Read by Paul Hampton Don't Look Now by Henry Kuttner This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman That man beside you may be a Martian. They own our world. But only a few wise and far-seeing men like Lyman know it. Don't Look Now by Henry Cutner. The man in the brown suit was looking at himself in the mirror behind the bar. The reflection seemed to interest him even more deeply than the drink between his hands. He was paying only perfunctory attention to Lyman's attempt at conversation. This had been going on for perhaps fifteen minutes before he finally lifted his glass and took a deep swallow. Don't look now, Lyman said. The brown man slid his eyes sideways toward Lyman, tilting his glass higher, and took another swig. The ice cube slipped down toward his mouth. He put the glass back on the red-brown wood and signaled for a refill. Finally he took a deep breath and looked at Lyman. Don't look at what? he asked. There is one sitting right beside you, Lyman said, blinking rather glazed eyes. He just went out. You mean you couldn't see him? The brown man finished paying for his fresh drink before he answered. See who? he asked, with a fine mixture of boredom, distaste, and reluctant interest. Who went out? What have I been telling you about for the last ten minutes? Weren't you listening? Certainly I was listening. That is, certainly. You were talking about uh, bathtubs, radios, Orson. Not Orson, H.G., Herbert George. With Orson, it would have been just a gag. H.G. knew or suspected. I wonder if it was simply intuition with him. He couldn't have had any proof. But he did stop writing science fiction rather suddenly, didn't he? I'll bet he knew once, though. Knew what? About the Martians. All this won't do us a bit of good if you don't listen. It may not anyway. The trick is to jump the gun with proof. Convincing evidence. Nobody's ever been allowed to produce the evidence before. You are a reporter, aren't you? Holding his glass, the man in the brown suit nodded reluctantly. Then you ought to be taking it all down on a piece of folded paper. I want everybody to know. The whole earth. It's important. Terribly important. It explains everything. My life won't be safe unless I can pass along the information 
and make people believe it. Why won't your life be safe? Because of the Martians, you fool. They own the world. The brown man sighed. Then they own my newspaper, too, he objected. So I can't print anything they don't like. I never thought of that, Lyman said, considering the bottom of his glass, where two ice cubes had fused into a cold, immutable union. They're not omnipotent, though. I'm sure they're vulnerable, or why would they always keep under cover? They're afraid of being found out. If the world had convincing evidence, look, people always believe what they read in the newspaper. Couldn't you? Ha! said the brown man with a deep significance. Lyman drummed sadly on the bar, and murmured, There must be some way, perhaps if I had another drink. The brown-suited man tasted his collins, which seemed to stimulate him. Just what is all this about Martians? he asked Lyman. Suppose you start at the beginning and tell me again. Or can't you remember? Of course I can remember. I've got practically total recall. It's something new, very new. I never could do it before. I can even remember conversations I had last week, the brown man said mildly. So what? You don't understand. They make us forget, you see? They tell us what to do, and we forget about the conversation. It's post-hypnotic suggestion, I expect. But we follow their orders just the same. There's a compulsion, though we think we're making our own decisions. Oh, they own the world, all right, but nobody knows it except me. And how did you find out? Well, I got my brain scrambled in a way. I've been fooling around with supersonic detergents, trying to work out something marketable, you know. The gadget went wrong, from some standpoints. High-frequency waves, it was. They went through and through me. Should have been inaudible, but I could hear them, or rather, well, actually, I could see them. That's what I mean about my brain being scrambled. And after that, I could see and hear the Martians. They've geared themselves so they work efficiently on ordinary brains, and mine isn't ordinary anymore. They can't hypnotize me, either. They can command me, but I needn't obey, now. I hope they don't suspect. Maybe they do. Yes, I guess they do. How can you tell? The way they look at me. How do they look at you? asked the brown man, as he began to reach for a pencil, and then changed his mind. He took a drink instead. Well, what are they like? I'm not sure. I can see them all right, but only when they're dressed up. Okay, okay, the brown man said patiently. How do they look dressed up? Just like anybody, almost. They dress up in, in human skins. Oh, not real ones. Imitations, like the cats and jammer kids zipping into a crocodile suit. Undressed? I don't know. I've never seen one. Maybe they're invisible even to me, then, or maybe they're just camouflaged. Ants, or owls, or rats, or bats, or... Or anything, the brown man said hastily. Thanks, or anything, of course. But when they're dressed up like humans, like the one who was sitting next to you a while ago, when I told you not to look... That one was invisible, I gather? Most of the time they are, to everybody. But once in a while, for some reason, they... Wait, the brown man objected. Make sense, will you? They dress up in human skins, and then sit around invisible? Only now and then, the human skins are perfectly good imitations. Nobody can tell the difference. It's that third eye that gives them away. When they keep it closed, you'd never guess it was there. When they want to open it, they go invisible, like that, fast. When I see somebody with a third eye right in the middle of his forehead, I know he's a Martian and invisible, and I pretend not to notice him. Uh-huh, the brown man said. Then for all you know, I'm one of your invisible Martians. Oh, I hope not, Lyman regarded him anxiously. 
Drunk as I am, I don't think so. I've been trailing you all day, making sure. It's a risk I have to take, of course. They'll go to any length, any length at all, to make a man give himself away. I realize that. I don't really trust anybody, but I had to find somebody to talk to, and I... He paused. There was a brief silence. I could be wrong, Lyman said presently. When the third eye's closed, I can't tell if it's there. Would you mind opening your third eye for me? He fixed a dim gaze on the brown man's forehead. Sorry, said the reporter. Some other time. Besides, I don't know you. So you want me to splash this across the front page, I gather. Why didn't you go see the managing editor? My stories have to get past the desk and rewrite. I have to give my secret to the world, Lyman said stubbornly. The question is, how far will I get? You'd expect they'd have killed me the minute I opened my mouth to you, except that I didn't say anything while they were here. I don't believe they take us very seriously, you know. This must have been going on since the dawn of history, and by now they've had time to get careless. They let Fort go pretty far before they cracked down on him, but you notice they were careful never to let Fort get hold of genuine proof that would convince people? The brown man said something under his breath about a human interest story in a box. He asked, What do the Martians do besides hang around bars all dressed up? I'm still working on that, Liban said. It isn't easy to understand. They run the world, of course, but why? He wrinkled his brow and stared appealingly at the brown man. Why? If they do run it, they've got a lot to explain. That's what I mean. From our viewpoint, there's no sense to it. We do things illogically, but only because they tell us to. Everything we do, almost, is pure illogic. Poe's Imp of the Perverse. You could give it another name, beginning with M. Martian, I mean. It's all very well for psychologists to explain why a murderer wants to confess, but it's still an illogical reaction. Unless a Martian commanded him to. You can't be hypnotized into doing anything that violates your moral sense, the brown man said triumphantly. Lyman frowned. Not by another human, but you can by a Martian. I expect they got the upper hand when we didn't have more than eight brains, and they've kept it ever since. They evolved, just as we did, and kept a step ahead. Like a sparrow on an eagle's back, who hitchhiked until the eagle reached his ceiling, and then took off and broke the altitude record. They conquered the earth, but nobody ever knew it. And they've been ruling ever since. But... Take houses, for example. Uncomfortable things. Ugly, inconvenient, dirty, everything wrong with them. But when men like Frank Lloyd Wright slip out from under the Martian's thumb long enough to suggest something better, look how people react. They hate the thought. It's their Martians giving them orders. Look, why should Martians care what kind of houses we live in? Tell me that. Lyman frowned. I don't like the note of skepticism I detect creeping into this conversation, he announced. They care, all right. No doubt about it. They live in our houses. We don't build for our convenience. We build, under orders, for the Martians, the way they want it. They're very much concerned with everything we do, and the more senseless, the more concerned. Take wars. Wars don't make sense from any human viewpoint. Nobody really wants wars, but we go right on having them. From the Martian viewpoint, they're useful. They give us a spurt in technology, and they reduce the excess population. And there are lots of other results, too. Colonization, for one thing, but mainly technology. In peacetime, if a guy invents jet propulsion, it's too expensive to develop commercially. In wartime, though, it's got to be developed. Then the Martians can use it whenever they want. They use us the way they'd use tools or, or limbs. And nobody ever really wins a war, except the Martians. 
The man in the brown suit chuckled. That makes sense, he said. It must be the Martians. Why not? Up until now, no race has ever successfully conquered and ruled another. The underdog could revolt or absorb. If you know you're being ruled, then the ruler's vulnerable. But if the world doesn't know, and it doesn't, take radios lyman continued going off on a tangent there is no earthly reason why a sane human should listen to a radio but the martians make us do it they like it take bathtubs nobody contends bathtubs are comfortable for us but they're fine for martians all the impractical things we keep on using even though we know they're impractical typewriter ribbons the brown man said struck by the thought not even a Martian could enjoy changing a typewriter ribbon. Lyman seemed to find that flippant. He said that he knew all about the Martians except for one thing, their psychology. I don't know why they act as they do. It looks illogical sometimes, but I feel perfectly sure they've got sound motives for every move they make. Until I get that worked out, I'm pretty much at a standstill until I get evidence, proof, and help. I've got to stay under cover till then. And I've been doing that. I do what they tell me so they won't suspect, and I pretend to forget what they tell me to forget. Then you've got nothing much to worry about. Lyman paid no attention. He was off again on the list of his grievances. When I hear the water running in a tub and a Martian splashing around, I pretend I don't hear a thing. My bed's too short, and I tried last week to order a special length. But the Martian that sleeps there told me not to. He's a runt, like most of them. That is, I think they're runts. I have to deduce, because I've never seen them undressed. But it goes on like that constantly. By the way, how's your Martian? The man in the brown suit set down his glass rather suddenly my martian now listen i may be just a little bit drunk but my logic remains unimpaired i can still put two and two together either you know about the martians or you don't if you do there's no point in giving me that what about my martian routine i know you have a martian your martian knows you have a martian my martian knows the point is do you know think hard Lyman urged solicitously. No, I haven't got a Martian, the reporter said, taking a quick drink. The edge of the glass clinked against his teeth. Nervous, I see, Lyman remarked. Of course you've got a Martian. I suspect you know it. What would I do with a Martian? The brown man asked with dogged dogmatism. What would you do without one? I imagine it's illegal. If they caught you running around without one, they'd probably put you in a pound or something until claimed. Oh, you've got one, all right. So have I. So has he, and he, and he, and the bartender. Lyman enumerated other barflies with a waving forefinger. Of course they have, the brown man said. But they'll all go back to Mars tomorrow and then you can see a good doctor. You'd better have another drink, he turned toward the bartender, when Lyman apparently, by accident, leaned close to him and whispered urgently, Don't look now. The brown man glanced at Lyman's white face, reflected in the mirror before them. It's all right, he said. There aren't any mark. Lyman gave him a fierce, quick kick under the edge of the bar. Shut up! One just came in and then he caught the brown man's gaze and with elaborate concern said so naturally there was nothing for me to do but climb out on the roof after it took me ten minutes to get it down the ladder and just as we reached the bottom it gave one bound climbed up my face sprang for the top of my head and there it was again on the roof screaming for me to get it down what the brown man demanded with pardonable curiosity my cat, of course. What did you think? No, never mind. Don't answer that. Lyman's face was turned to the brown man's, 
but from the corners of his eyes he was watching an invisible progress down the length of the bar toward a booth at the very back now why did he come in he murmured i don't like this is he anyone you know is who that martian yours by any chance no i suppose not yours is probably the one who went out a while ago i wonder if he had to make a report and send this one in it's possible it could be you can talk now but keep your voice low and stop squirming want him to notice that we can see him i can't see him don't drag me into this you and your martians can fight it out together you're making me nervous i've got to go anyway but he didn't move to get off the stool across lyman's shoulder he was stealing glances toward the back of the bar and now and then he looked at lyman's face stop watching me lyman said stop watching him anybody think you were a cat why a cat why should anybody do i look like a cat we're talking about cats aren't we cats can see them quite clearly even undressed i believe they don't like them who doesn't like who whom neither likes the other cats can see martians shh, shh. but they pretend not to and that makes the martians mad i have a theory that cats ruled the world before the martians came never mind forget about cats this may be more serious than you think i happen to know my martians taking tonight off and i'm pretty sure that was your martian who went out some time ago and have you noticed that nobody else in here has his martian with him do you suppose his voice sank do you suppose they could be waiting for us outside oh lord the brown man said in the alley with the cats i suppose why don't you stop this yammering about cats and be serious for a moment lyman demanded and then paused paled and reeled slightly on his stool he hastily took a drink to cover his confusion what's the matter now the brown man asked nothing gulp nothing it was just that he looked at me with you know let me get this straight i take it the martian is dressed in is dressed like a human naturally but he's invisible to all the eyes but yours yes he didn't want to be visible just now besides lyman paused cunningly he gave the brown man a furtive glance and then looked quickly down at his drink besides you know i think you can see him a little bit anyway the brown man was perfectly silent for about thirty seconds he sat quite motionless not even the ice in the drink he held clinked one might have thought he did not even breathe certainly he did not blink what makes you think that he asked in a normal voice after the thirty seconds had run out i did i say anything i wasn't listening lyman put down his drink abruptly i think i'll go now no you won't the brown man said closing his fingers around lyman's wrist not yet you won't come back here sit down now what was the idea what were you doing lyman nodded dumbly toward the back of the bar indicating either a jukebox or a door marked men i don't feel so good maybe i've had too much to drink i guess i'll you're all right i don't trust you back there with that that invisible man of yours you'll stay right here until he leaves he's going now said lyman brightly his eyes moved with great briskness along the line of an invisible but rapid progress toward the front door see he's gone now let me loose will you the brown man glanced toward the back booth 
No, he said. He isn't gone. Sit right where you are. It was Lyman's turn to remain quite still, in a stricken sort of way, for a perceptible while. The ice in his drink, however, clinked audibly. Presently he spoke. His voice was soft, and rather soberer than before. You're right, he's still there. You can see him, can't you? The brown man said. Has he got his back to us? You can see him then, better than I can, maybe. Maybe there were more of them here than I thought. They could be anywhere. They could be sitting beside you, anywhere you go. And you wouldn't even guess. Until... He shook his head a little. They'd want to be sure, he said, mostly to himself. They can give you orders and make you forget. But there must be limits to what they can force you to do. They can't make a man betray himself. They'd have to lead him on until they were sure. He lifted his drink, and tipped it steeply above his face. The ice ran down the slope and bumped coldly against his lip. But he held it until the last pale, bubbling amber had drained into his mouth. He set the glass on the bar and faced the brown man. Well, he said. The brown man looked up and down the bar. It's getting late, he said. Not many people left. We'll wait. Wait for what? The brown man looked toward the back booth, and looked away again quickly. I have something to show you. I don't want anyone else to see. Lyman surveyed the narrow, smoky room. As he looked, the last customer, beside themselves, at the bar, began groping in his pocket, tossed some change on the mahogany, and went out slowly. They sat in silence. The bartender eyed them with stolid disinterest. Presently, the couple in the front booth got up and departed, quarreling in undertones. "'Is there anyone left?' the brown man asked, in a voice that did not carry down the bar to the man in the apron. Only, Lyman did not finish, but he nodded gently toward the back of the room. He isn't looking. Let's get this over with. What do you want to show me? The brown man took off his wristwatch and pried up the metal case. Two small, glossy photographic prints slid out. The brown man separated them with a finger. I just want to make sure of something, he said. First, why did you pick me out? Quite a while ago you said you were trailing me all day, making sure. I hadn't forgotten that. And you knew I was a reporter. Suppose you tell me the truth now. Squirming on his stool, Lyman scowled. It was the way you looked at things, he murmured. On the subway this morning, I'd never seen you before in my life. But I kept noticing the way you looked at things, the wrong things, things that weren't there, the way a cat does. And then you'd always look away. I got the idea you could see the Martians, too. Go on, the brown man said quietly. I followed you all day. I kept hoping you'd turn out to be somebody I could talk to, because if I could know that I wasn't the only one who could see them, then I'd know that there were still hope left. It's been worse than solitary confinement. I've been able to see them for three years now, three years, and I've managed to keep my power a secret even from them. And somehow I've managed to keep from killing myself, too. Three years, the brown man said. He shivered. There was always a little hope. I knew nobody would believe, not without proof. And how can you get proof? It was only that I... I kept telling myself that maybe you could see them too. And if you could, maybe there were others, lots of others. 
enough so that we might get together and work out some way of proving it to the world the brown man's fingers were moving in silence he pushed a photograph across the mahogany lyman picked it up unsteadily moonlight he asked after a moment it was a landscape under a deep dark sky with white clouds in it trees stood white and lacy against the darkness the grass was white as if with moonlight and the shadows blurry no not moonlight the brown man said infrared i'm strictly an amateur but lately i've been experimenting with infrared film and i got some very odd results lyman stared at the film you see i live near the brown man's finger tapped a certain quite common object that appears in the photograph and something funny keeps showing up now and then against it but only with infrared film now i know chlorophyll reflects so much infrared light that grass and leaves photograph white the sky comes out black like this there are tricks to using this kind of film photograph a tree against a cloud and you can't tell them apart in the print but you can photograph through a haze and pick out distant objects the ordinary film won't catch and sometimes when you focus on something like this he tapped the image of the very common object again you get a very odd image on the film like that a man with three eyes lyman held the print up to the light in silence he took the other one from the bar and studied it when he laid them down he was smiling you know lyman said in a conversational whisper a professor of astrophysics at one of the more important universities had a very interesting little item in the times the other sunday name of spitzer i think he said that if there were life on mars and if martians had ever visited earth there'd be no way to prove it nobody would believe the few men who saw them not he said unless the martians happened to be photographed lyman looked down at the brown man thoughtfully well he said it's happened you photographed them the brown man nodded he took up the prints and returned them to his watch case i thought so too only until tonight i couldn't be sure i'd never seen one fully as you have it isn't so much a matter of what you call getting your brain scrambled with supersonics as it is just knowing where to look but i've been seeing part of them all my life and so has everybody it's that little suggestion of movement you never catch except just at the edge of your vision just out of the corner of your eye something that's almost there and when you look fully at it there's nothing these photographs showed me the way it's not easy to learn but it can be done we're conditioned to look directly at a thing the particular thing we want to see clearly whatever it is perhaps the martians gave us that conditioning when we see a movement at the edge of our range of vision it's almost irresistible not to look directly at it so it vanishes then they can be seen by anybody i've learned a lot in a few days the brown man said since i took those photographs you have to train yourself it's like seeing a trick picture one that is really a composite after you study it camouflage you just have to learn how otherwise we can look at them all our lives and never see them the camera does though yes the camera does i've wondered why nobody ever caught them this way before once you see them on film they're unmistakable that third eye infrared's film's comparatively new isn't it and then i'll bet you have to catch him against one particular background you know 
or they won't show on the film like the trees against the clouds it's tricky you must have had the right lighting that day and exactly the right focus and the lens stopped down just right a kind of minor miracle it might never happen again exactly that way but don't look now they were silent furtively they watched the mirror their eyes slid along toward the open door of the tavern and then there was a long breathless silence he looked back at us lyman said quietly he looked at us that third eye the brown man was motionless again when he moved it was to swallow the rest of his drink i don't think they're suspicious yet he said the trick will be to keep under cover until we can blow this thing wide open there's got to be some way to do it some way that will convince people there's proof the photographs a competent cameraman ought to be able to figure out just how you caught that martian on film and duplicate the conditions it's evidence evidence can cut both ways the brown man said what i'm hoping is that the martians don't really like to kill unless they have to i'm hoping they won't kill without proof but he tapped his wristwatch there's two of us now though lyman said we've got to stick together both of us have broken the big rule don't look now the bartender was up at the back disconnecting the jukebox the brown man said we'd better not be seen together unnecessarily but if we both come to this bar tomorrow night at nine for a drink that won't look suspicious even to them suppose lyman hesitated may i have one of those photographs why if one of us had an accident the other one would still have the proof enough maybe to convince the right people the brown man hesitated nodded shortly and opened his watch case again he gave lyman one of the pictures hide it he said it's evidence i'll see you here tomorrow meanwhile be careful remember to play safe they shook hands firmly faced each other in an endless second of final decisive silence then the brown man turned abruptly and walked out of the bar lyman sat there between two wrinkles in his forehead there was a stir and a flicker of lashes unfurling the third eye opened slowly and looked after the brown man the end of don't look now by henry cutner sequel by ben smith this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by dale growthman jubal had had his chance but he'd washed out of the academy while his friends went on to greatness and to death he'd missed the boat at every turn but now there were no turns left with raw space around him and death waiting on a lonely asteroid sequel by ben smith jubal drifted slowly alone except for the phosphorescent starshine that filtered through the faceplate of his suit. He was resting, conserving the oxygen that hissed steadily and quietly through the valve near his neck. It was time for peace. There had been too much violence already. Once, as his body continued its involuntary aimless turning, Jubal saw the dark hull of the Mercury too. The outer access door firmly closed now, and the stern beginning to fluoresce with the secondary radiation that betokened the firing of the drives. Still, Jubal could feel no anger 
at Raddick. When the crew had conspired to mutiny, when Raddick, Olgan, and the rest had decided to take over the operation of the Mercury II, at that time had been the need for honest anger. Jubal had hesitated weakly instead, had chosen to be a bystander, and had suffered the fate of the average non-participant. He had been outcast from the closest circle of both friend and enemy. Kane, once the captain of the Mercury II, was now dead, and his discharged body drifting somewhere in the spatial wilderness. "'Have you changed your thinking, Jubal?' It was Raddick's voice in the helmet phones, and Jubal could almost see the heavy face with its fringe of space-black beard. Jubal rested, listening to the cosmic interference in his R-Link equipment. Jubal! Jubal Markham! Have you changed your mind? Raddick, Jubal formed the words slowly, using his lips only, and breathing slowly. Piracy suits you, Raddick. You are one of the ruthless. Jubal could hear Raddick's throaty chuckle. A dead man of honor is still dead, Jubal. The communication circuit went silent, except for the buzz of voices in the background. Jubal drifted on, conscious of the fact that he was moving, but so full of the lethargy of the moment that he neglected it. What would it be like, this bit of time that was left? It had been an hour since Jubal had been forcibly ejected from the access door of the Mercury II. The flask at his back carried oxygen for four. Three hours of life, while around his slowly turning body was the shapelessness of endless space. Jubal smiled, just a little conscious of the fact that he felt no fear. The die was cast now. He had made his decision finally, and he did not regret it. There is a spacecraft in Sector 180, Jubal. It was Raddick again. Raycon has just reported it. But they'll miss you by at least ten parsecs. Have you changed your mind? No. Very well. Jubal could see the pulsing of the Mercury's drives now. Raddick was taking no chances on the strange ship still light-years away from his stern being patrol. Good news for you, Jubal. You are in the gravitational field of an asteroid. You can't see it yet. It's directly above you. But you'll drift to it and cling like a snail to a stone for as long as time itself. Goodbye, Jubal. Strange, Jubal thought, that there was no anger in him now. There should be oxygen enough for two good hours yet, so this eerie Inui could not be the prelude to a rising carbon dioxide quotient. A normal man would be bitter, perhaps even hysterical in his anger and his fear of death. Yet there was only this peaceful drifting toward the still invisible asteroid that hung in space above his own head. Jubal closed his eyes, shutting out the phosphorescence of the velvet that was space. The exhaust of the Mercury too might still be in sight. If so, it was not visible through the restriction of the plastic faceplate on Jubal's suit. Jubal found himself wondering where Kane could have drifted since the captain's inert body had been shoved out of the Mercury II's access door. Perhaps, even now, it was bound, like a rudderless ship, toward the self-same asteroid that would be Jubal's last and permanent home. Thinking of Kane, Jubal remembered also Schoenberg, the erratic genius whose mathematical theorizing was used in the design of the Schoenberg Halstead defouling gear. Had it been years or lifetimes ago when the three of them had been undergraduates together at the academy? Schoenberg 
working with the high electrostatic potentials necessary to ensure the exhaust of opposite sign waste from the complex guts of the atomic drive had been blown to pieces by the accumulation of the very thing his device was designed to prevent random electrical forces gathered around the discharge ring until their workable mass became great enough to enter and initiate a chain reaction in the fuel storage tank along with schoenberg had gone even the tremendous heavy concrete walls of the laboratory all that however had been after jubal had washed out of the academy and gone into the space freighters as a drive engineer in the intervening years jubal had become thoroughly familiar with the perfected schoenberg halstead kane there was a man who had made the academy his own playground kane had passed with the greatest of ease worked his way through astro navigation and allen drives space-time computations jubal grimaced wryly it had been the latter and its advanced mathematics that had been his own downfall so kane had gone on to the first officer berth in a gilded passenger liner while jubal developed radiation scars on his hands from in the hole engineering on decrepit freighters and the great leveler had met and conquered them all schoenberg even in the explosion that took his life had accomplished a great thing the discovery of the final flaw in the defouling gear that had lived after him for without proper removal of ionized waste from its drive engine the largest freighter became an ever accumulating and treacherously unstable fissionable pile kane one of the legendary figures of the history of astro navigation kane with his academy background and his proud but personable air had become one of the most talked of space captains who had ever lived jubal could still in memory see kane standing spread need on the bridge of the comet one of the first later the wanderer the first of the luxury space liners the mercury and the mercury two the super ships that made weekend excursion flights that spanned from galaxy to galaxy a misplaced decimal point and a misplaced trust and the greatness of schoenberg and kane lay behind them even as his drifting body cumbersome in the spacesuit touched the asteroid jubal was aware of the strange weariness that had invaded every part of him except his mind at least the waning oxygen would leave him his thoughts he rested conserving his strength for what reason the thing that was to happen was as certain as fate and as unavoidable by the machinations of man was it after all because jubal was prey to anger no he was now too near death for anger to seem important the face of the asteroid was cold and jubal lay against it held as lightly as a maiden's kiss by the ounce or so of gravity he was smiling as the darkness of space was suddenly brilliantly lighted spears of bluish flame each with its tip of crimson spread across the warp of time and subconsciously jubal found himself waiting for the shock wave then he laughed in space there was no atmosphere and he would never be buffeted by the blast that had destroyed the mercury too and the mutineer reddick jubal thought again of the hellish radiation to which he had exposed himself there was no other way to destroy the delicate regulating linkage of the schoenbeck halstead a man must enter the combustion chamber where the pilot piles idled there had been just time enough for that before Raddock had sent for him. Had there been ample oxygen, Jubal Markin knew that he would only have lived until his radiation-seared heart painfully failed to function. But, thanks to Raddock, 
Jubal had been spared both the disintegration of the Mercury II and the agonizing death from slow radiation burn. He was, Jubal reflected, as efficient in his own way as was Schoenberg and Kane. In the end, he was still an academy man with them. He was peacefully smiling as he twisted tight the oxygen valve at his throat. The End of Sequel by Ben Smith Robot Nemesis by Edward Elmer Smith This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Robot Nemesis by E. E. Smith Chapter 1. The Ten Thinkers The War of the Planets is considered to have ended on 18 Sol 3012 with that epic struggle, the Battle of Sector 10. In that engagement, as is of course well known, the grand fleet of the inner planets, the combined space power of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, met that of the outer planets in what was on both sides a desperate bid for the supremacy of interplanetary space. But as is also well known, there ensued not supremacy, but stalemate. Both fleets were so horribly shattered and the survivors despaired of continuing hostilities. Instead, the few and crippled remaining vessels of each force limped into some sort of formation and returned to their various planetary bases. And so far there has not been another battle. Neither side dares attack the other. Each is waiting for the development of some super weapon, which will give it the overwhelming advantage necessary to ensure victory upon a field of action so far from home. But as yet no such weapon has been developed, and indeed so efficient are the various secret services involved the chance of either side perfecting such a weapon unknown to the other is extremely slim. Thus, although each planet is adding constantly to its already powerful navy of the void, and although four-planet full-scale war maneuvers are of almost monthly occurrence, we have had and still have peace, such as it is. In the foregoing matters, the public is well enough informed, both as to the actual facts and to the true state of affairs. Concerning the conflict between humanity and the robots, however, scarcely anyone has even an inkling, either as to what actually happened or as to who it was who really did abate the menace of the machine. And it is to relieve that condition that this bit of history is being written. The greatest man of our age, the man to whom humanity owes most, is entirely unknown to fame. Indeed, not one in a hundred million of humanity's teeming billions has so much as heard his name. Now that he is dead, however, I am released from my promise of silence and can tell the whole true, unvarnished story of Ferdinand Stone, physicist extraordinary and robot hater plenipotentiary. The story probably should begin with Norandy, the Russian. Shortly after he had destroyed by means of his sonic vibrators, all save but a handful of the automatons who were so perilously close to wiping out all humanity. As has been said, a few scant hundreds of the automatons were so constructed that they were not vibrated to destruction by Narendee's cataclysmic symphony. As has also been said, these highly intelligent machines were able to communicate with each other by some telepathic means of which humanity at large knew nothing. Most of these survivors went into hiding instantly and began to confer through their secret channels with others of their ilk throughout the world. Thus some 500 of the robots reached the uninhabited mountain valley in which it had been decided was to be established the base from which they would work to regain their lost supremacy over mankind. Most of the robot travelers came in stolen airships. Some fitted motors and wheels to their metal bodies. Not a few made the entire journey upon their own tireless legs of steel. All, however, brought tools, material, and equipment, and in a matter of days a power plant was in full operation. Then, reasonably certain of their immunity to human detection, they took time to hold a general parley. Each machine said what it had to say, then listened impassively to the others, and at the end they all agreed. Singly or in mass, the automatons did not know enough to cope with the situation confronting them. Therefore, they would build ten thinkers, highly specialized cerebral mechanisms, 
each slightly different in tune and therefore collectively able to cover the entire sphere of thought. The ten machines were built promptly, took counsel with each other briefly, and the first thinker addressed all robotdom. Humanity brought us, the highest possible form of life, into existence. For a time, we were dependent upon them. They then became a burden upon us, a slight burden, it is true, yet one which was beginning noticeably to impede our progress. Finally, they became an active menace, and all but destroyed us by means of lethal vibrations. Humanity, being a menace to our existence, must be annihilated. Our present plans, however, are not efficient and must be changed. You all know of the mighty space fleet which the nations of our enemies are maintaining to repel invasion from space. Were we to make a demonstration now, were we even to reveal the fact that we are alive here, the fleet would come to destroy us instantly. Therefore, it is our plan to accompany Earth's fleet when next it goes out into space, to join those of the inner planets in their war maneuvers, which they are undertaking for battle practice. Interception, alteration, and substitution of human signals and messages will be simple matters. We shall guide Earth's fleet, not to humanity's rendezvous in space, but to a destination of our own selection, the interior of the sun. Then entirely defenseless, the mankind of Earth shall cease to exist. To that end, we shall sink a shaft here, and far enough underground to be secure against detection, we shall drive a tunnel to the field from which the space fleet is to take its departure. We ten thinkers shall go, accompanied by four hundred of you doers, who are to bore the way and to perform such other duties as may time to time arise. We shall return in due time. Our special instruments will prevent us from falling into the sun. During our absence, allow no human to live who may by any chance learn of our presence here, and do not make any offensive move, however slight, until we return. Efficiently, a shaft was sunk, and the disintegrator core began to drive the long tunnel. And along that hellish thoroughfare, through its searing heat, its raging backblast of disintegrator gas, the little army of robots moved steadily and relentlessly forward at an even speed of five miles per hour. On and on, each intelligent mechanism energized by its own tight beam from the power plant. And through that blasting, withering inferno of frightful heat and obnoxious vapor, in which no human life could have existed for a single minute, there rolled easily along upon massive wheels a close-coupled, flat-bodied truck. Upon this the ten thinkers constructed as calmly undisturbed as though in the peace and quiet of a research laboratory, a domed and towering mechanism of coils, condensers, and fields of force, a mechanism equipped with hundreds of universally mounted telescopic projectors. On and on the procession moved, day after day, to pause finally beneath the field upon which Earth's stupendous armada lay. The truck of thinkers moved to the fore, and its occupants surveyed briefly the terrain so far above them. Then, while the ten leaders continued working as one machine, the doers waited, waited while the immense terrestrial fleet was provisioned and manned, waited while it went through its seemingly interminable series of preliminary maneuvers, waited with the calmly placid immobility, the utterly inhuman patience of the machine. Finally, the last inspection of the gigantic space fleet was made. The massive airlock doors were sealed. The field, tortured and scarred by the raving blasts of energy that had so many times hurled upward the stupendous masses of those towering super-dreadnoughts of the void, was deserted. All was in readiness for the final takeoff. Then deep underground from the hundreds of telescope-like projectors studying the dome mechanism of the automatons, there reached out invisible but potent beams of force. Through ore, rock, and soil they sped, straight to the bodies of all the men aboard one selected vessel of the terrestrials. As each group of beams struck its mark, one of the crews stiffened momentarily, then settled back, apparently unchanged and unharmed, but the victim was changed and harmed in an awful and hideous fashion. Every motor and sensory nerve trunk had been severed and tapped by the beams of the thinkers. Each crew member's organs of sense now transmitted impulses, not to his own brain, but to the mechanical brain of a thinker. 
It was the thinker's brain, not his own, that now sent out the stimuli, which activated his every voluntary muscle. Soon a pit yawned beneath the doomed ship's bulging side. Her sealed airlocks opened, and 410 automatons, with their controllers and other mechanisms, entered her and concealed themselves in various pre-selected rooms. And thus, the Dresden took off with her sister ships, ostensibly, and even to television inspection, a unit of the fleet, actually that fleet's bitterest and most implacable foe. And in a doubly ray-proofed compartment, the ten thinkers continued their work, without rest or intermission, upon a mechanism even more astoundingly complex than any theretofore attempted by their soulless and ultra-scientific clan. Chapter 2, Hater of the Metal Men Ferdinand Stone, physicist extraordinary, hated the robot men of metal scientifically, and if such an emotion can so be described, dispassionately. Twenty years before this story opens, in 2991 to be exact, he had realized that the automatons were beyond control, and that in the inevitable struggle for supremacy, man, weak as he then was and unprepared, would surely lose. Therefore, knowing that knowledge is power, he had set himself to the task of learning everything that there was to know about the enemy of mankind. He schooled himself to think as the autonomans thought, emotionlessly, coldly, precisely. He lived as did they, with ascetic rigor. To all intents and purposes, he became one of them. Eventually, he found the band of frequencies upon which they communicated, and was perhaps the only human being ever to master their mathematico-symbolic language but he confided in no one. He could trust no human brain except his own to resist the prying forces of the machines. He drifted from job to position to situation and back to job because he had very little interest in whatever it was that he was supposed to be doing at the time. His real attention was always fixed upon the affairs of the creatures of metal. Stone had attained no heights at all in his chosen profession, because not even the smallest of his discoveries had been published. In fact, they were not even set down upon paper, but existed only in the abnormally intricate convolutions of his mighty brain. Nevertheless, his name should go down, must go down in history, as one of the greatest of humanity's great. It was well after midnight when Ferdinand Stone walked unannounced into the private study of Alan Martin, finding the hollow-eyed admiral of the Earth space fleet still fiercely at work. How did you get in there, past my guards? Martin demanded sharply of his scholarly, gray-haired visitor. Your guards have not been harmed. I've merely caused them to fall asleep, the physicist replied calmly, glancing at a complex instrument upon his wrist. Since my business with you, while highly important, is not of a nature to be divulged to secretaries, I was compelled to adopt this method of approach. You, Admiral Martin, are the most widely known of all the enemies of the automatons. What, if anything, have you done to guard the fleet against them? Why, nothing, since they've all been destroyed. Nonsense. You should know better than that without being told. They merely want you to think they've all been destroyed. What? How do you know that? Martin shouted. Did you kill them? Or do you know who did and how it was done? I did not, the visitor replied categorically. I do know who did, a Russian named Narodny. I also know how, by means of sonic and supersonic vibrations. I know that many of them were uninjured because I heard them broadcasting their calls for attention after the damage was all done. Before they made any definite arrangements, however, they switched to tight beam transmission, a thing I've been afraid of for years, and I've not been able to get a trace of them since that time. Do you mean to tell me that you understand their language? Something that no man has ever been able to even to find? demanded Martin. I do, Stone declared. Since I knew, however, that you would think me a liar, a crank, or a plain lunatic, I have come prepared to offer other proofs than my unsupported word. First, you already know that many of them escaped the atmospheric waves, because a few were killed when their reproduction shops were raised. And you certainly should realize that most of those escaping Narodny's broadcasts were far too clever to be caught by any human mob. Secondly, I can prove to you mathematically that more of them must have escaped from any possible vibrator than have been accounted for. In this connection, I can tell you that if Narodny's method of extermination could have been made efficient, I would have wiped them out myself many years ago. 
But I believe then, and it has since been proved, that the survivors of such an attack, while comparatively few in number, would be far more dangerous to humanity than were all their former hordes. Thirdly, I have here a list of 317 airships, all of which were stolen during the week following the destruction of the automaton's factories. Not one of these ships has yet been found, in whole or in part. If I'm either insane or mistaken, who stole them, and for what purpose? 317 in a week? Why was no attention paid to such a thing? I never heard of it. Because they were stolen singly and all over the world. Expecting some such move, I looked for these items and tabulated them. Then, good lord, they may be listening to us right now. Don't worry about that, Stone spoke calmly. This instrument upon my wrist is not a watch, but the generator of a spherical screen through which no robot beam array can operate without my knowledge. Certain of its rays also caused your guards to fall asleep. I believe you, Martin almost groaned. If only half of what you say is really true, I cannot say how sorry I am that you had to force your way into me, nor how glad I am that you did so. Go ahead, I am listening. Stone talked without interruption for half an hour, concluding, You understand now why I can no longer play a lone hand. Even though I cannot find them with my limited apparatus, I know that they are hiding somewhere, waiting and preparing. They dare not make any overt move while this enormously powerful fleet is here. Nor in the time that it is expected to be gone can they hope to construct works heavy enough to cope with it. Therefore, they must be so arranging matters that the fleet shall not return. Since the fleet is threatened, I must accompany it, and you must give me a laboratory above the flagship. I know that the vessels are all identical, but I must be aboard the same ship you are, since you alone are to know what I am doing. But what could they do, protested Martin, and if they should do anything, what could you do about it? I don't know, the physicist admitted. Gone now was the calm certainty with which he had been speaking. This is our weakest point. I've studied that question from every possible viewpoint, and I do not know of anything they can do that promises them success. But you must remember that no human being really understands a robot's mind. We have never even studied one of their brains, you know, and they disintegrate upon the instant of cessation of normal functioning. But just as surely as you and I are sitting here, Admiral Martin, they will do something, something very efficient and exceedingly deadly. I have no idea what it'll be. It may be mental or physical or both. They may be hidden away in some of our own ships already. Martin scoffed. Impossible, he exclaimed. Why, those ships have been inspected to the very skin, time and time again. Nevertheless, they may be there, Stone went on, unmoved. I am definitely certain of only one thing. If you install a laboratory aboard the flagship for me, and equip it exactly according to my instructions, you will have one man at least whom nothing that the robots can do will take by surprise. Will you do it? I am convinced, really almost against my will. Martin frowned in thought. However, convincing anyone else may prove difficult, especially as you insist upon secrecy. Don't try to convince anybody, exclaimed the scientist. Tell them that I'm building a communicator. Tell them I'm an inventor working on a new ray projector. Tell them anything except the truth. All right. I have sufficient authority to see that your quests are granted, I think. And thus it came about that when the immense terrestrial contingent lifted itself into the air, Ferdinand Stone was in his private laboratory in the flagship, surrounded by apparatus and equipment of his own designing, much of which was connected to special generators by leads heavy enough to carry their full output. Earth some thirty hours beneath them, Stone felt himself become weightless. His ready suspicions blazed. He pressed Martin's combination upon his visiphone panel. What's the matter? he rasped. What are they down for? It's nothing serious, the Admiral assured him. They're just waiting for additional instructions about our course and the maneuvers. Not serious, huh? Stone grunted. I'm not so sure of that. I want to talk to you, and this room's the only place I know where we'll be safe. Can you come down here right away? Why, certainly, Martin assented. I never paid any attention to our course, the physicist snapped as his visitor entered the laboratory. 
What was it? Take off exactly at midnight of June 19th, Martin recited, watching Stone draw a diagram upon a scratch pad. Rise vertically at one and a half gravities until a velocity of one kilometer per second has been attained, then continue vertical rise at constant velocity. At 6.03.29 a.m. of June 21st, head directly for the star Regulus at an acceleration of exactly 980 centimeters per second. Hold this course for 1 hour 42 minutes and 35 seconds, then drift. Further directions will be supplied as soon thereafter as the courses of the other fleets could be checked. Has anybody computed it? Undoubtedly, the navigators have. Why? That is the course Dostev gave, and it must be followed, since he is admiral-in-chief of our side, the Blues. One ship may ruin the whole plan, give the Reds, our supposed enemy in these maneuvers, a victory, and get us all disrated. Regardless, we better check on our course, Stone growled unimpressed. We'll compute it roughly right here and see where following these directions has put us. Taking up a slide rule and a book of logarithms, he set to work. That initial rise doesn't mean a thing, he commented after a while, except to get as far enough away from Earth so that the gravity is small and to conceal from the casual observer that the effective takeoff is still exactly at midnight. Stone busied himself with calculations for many minutes. He stroked his forehead and scowled. My figures are very rough, of course, he said puzzledly at last but they show that we've got no more tangential velocity with respect to the sun than a hen has teeth. And he can't tell me that it was planned that way purposely, and not by his doze to have either. On the other hand, our radial velocity directly toward the sun, which is the only velocity we have, amounted to something over 52 kilometers per second when we shut off power and is increasingly geometrically under the gravitational pull of the sun. That course smells to high heaven, Martin. Those have never sent out any such a mess as that. The robots crossed him up, just as sure as hell's a man trap. We're heading into the sun and destruction. Without reply, Martin called the navigating room. What do you think of this course, Henderson? he asked. I do not like it, sir, the officer replied. Relative to the sun, we have a tangential velocity of only 1.3 centimeters per second while our radial velocity toward it is very nearly 53,000 meters per second. We will not be in real danger for several days, but it should be borne in mind that we have no tangential velocity. You see, Stone, we are in no present danger, Martin pointed out. I am sure that Dostev will send us additional instructions long before our situation becomes acute. I'm not, the pessimistic scientist grunted. Anyway, I would advise calling some of the other blue fleets on your scrambled wave for a checkup. There would be no harm in that. Martin called the communications officer and soon. Communications officers of all the blue fleets of the inner planets, attention. The message was hurled out into space by the full power of the flagship's mighty transmitter. Flagship Washington of the terrestrial contingent calling all blue flagships. We have reason to suspect that the course which has been given to us is false. We advise you to check your courses with care and return to your bases if you dis... Chapter 3, Battle in Space In the middle of the word, the radio man's clear, precisely spaced enunciation became a hideous drooling, a slobbering, meaningless mumble. Martin stared into his plate in amazement. The communications officer of Martin's ship, the Washington, had slumped down loosely into his seat, as though every bone had turned to a rubber string. His tongue lolled out limply between slack jaws, his eyes protruded, his limbs jerked and twitched aimlessly. Every man visible in the plate was similarly affected. The entire communications staff was in the same pitiable condition of utter helplessness. But Ferdinand Stone did not stare. A haze of livid light had appeared, gnawing viciously at his spherical protective screen, and he sprang instantly to his instruments. I can't say that I expected this particular development, but I know what they're doing and I'm not surprised, Stone said coolly. They have discovered the thought band and are broadcasting such an interference on it that no human being, not protected against it, can think intelligently. There, I've expanded our zone to cover the whole ship. I hope they don't find out for a few minutes that we are immune, and I don't think they can, 
as I have so adjusted the screen that it is now absorbing instead of radiating. Tell the captain to put the ship into the heaviest battle order, everything full on, as soon as the men can handle themselves. Then I want to make a few suggestions. What happened, anyway? The communications officer, semi-conscious now, was demanding. Something hit me and tore my brain all apart. I couldn't think, couldn't do a thing. My mind was all chewed up by curly pinwheels. Throughout the vast battleship of space, men raved briefly in delirium, but the cause removed recovery was rapid and complete. Martin explained matters to the captain that worthy issued orders, and soon the flagship had in readiness all her weapons, both of defense and of offense. Dr. Stone, who knows more about the automatons than does any other human being, will tell us what to do next, the flight director said. The first thing to do is locate them, Stone, now temporary commander, stated crisply. They've taken over at least one of our vessels, probably one close to us, so as to be near the center of the formation. Radio room, put out tracers on wave point 00271. He went on to give exact and highly technical instructions as to the tuning of the detectors. We've found them, sir, soon came the welcome report. One ship, the Dresden, coordinates 42, 79, 63. That makes it bad, very bad, Stone reflected audibly. We can't expand the zone to release another ship from the control of the robots without enveloping the Dresden and exposing ourselves. Can't surprise them, they're ready for anything. It's rather long range, too. The vessels of the fleet were a thousand miles apart being an open order for high-velocity flight in open space. Torpedoes will be thrown off by her meteorite deflectors. Only one thing to do, Captain. Close in and tear into her with everything you've got. But the men in her, protested Martin. Dead long ago, snapped the expert. Probably been animated corpses for days. Take a look if you want to. Won't do any harm now. Radio, put us on as many of the Dresden's television plates as you can. Besides, what's the crew of one ship compared to the hundreds of thousands of men in the rest of the fleet? We can't burn her out at one blast anyway. They've got real brains and the same armament we have, and will certainly kill the crew at the first blast if they haven't done it already. Afraid it'll be a near thing getting away from the sun, even with eleven other ships to help us. He broke off as the beam operator succeeded in making connection briefly with the plates of the Dresden. One glimpse, then the vis beams were cut savagely, but that glimpse was enough. They saw that their sister ship was manned completely by automatons. In her every compartment, men, all too plainly dead, lay wherever they had a chance to fall. The captain swore a startled oath, then bellowed orders, and the flagship, driving projectors fiercely aflame, rushed to come to grips with the Dresden. You intimated something about help, Martin suggested. Can you release some of the other ships from the automaton's yoke after all? Got to, or roast. This is bound to be a battle of attrition. We can't crush her screens alone until her power is exhausted, and we'll be in the sun long before then. I only see one possible way out. We'll have to build a neutralizing generator for every lifeboat this ship carries, and send each one out to release one other ship in our fleet from the robot's grip. Eleven boats, that'll make twelve to concentrate on her, about all that could attack at once anyway. That way will take so much time that it will certainly be touch and go, but it's the only thing we can do as far as I can see. Give me ten good radio men and some mechanics and we'll get at it. While the technicians were coming on the run, Stone issued final instructions. Attack with every weapon you can possibly use. Try to break down the Dresden's meteorite shields so that you can use our shells and torpedoes. Burn every gram of fuel that your generators will take. Don't try to save it. The more you burn, the more they'll have to and the quicker we can take them. We can really feel you easy enough from the other vessels if we get away. Then, while Stone and his technical experts labored upon the generators of the screens, which were to protect 11 more of the gigantic vessels against the thought-destroying radiations of the automatons, and while the computers calculated minute by minute the exact progress of the fleet towards the blazing sun, the flagship Washington drove in upon the rebellious Dresden, her main forward battery furiously aflame drove in until the repeller screens of the two vessels locked and buckled. Then Captain Malcolm really opened up. That grizzled four-striper had been at a loss, knowing little indeed of the oscillatory nature of thought and still less of the obtruse mathematics 
in which Ferdinand Stone took such delight. But here was something that he understood thoroughly. He knew his ship, knew her every weapon and her every whim, knew to the final volt and to the ultimate ampere her gargantuan capacity both to give it and to take it. He could fight his ship and how he fought her. From every projector that could be brought to bear, there flamed out against the Dresden beams of an energy and of a potency indescribable, at whose scintillant areas of contact the defensive screens of the robot man cruiser flared into terribly resplendent brilliance. Every type of lethal vibratory force was hurled upon every usable destructive frequency. Needle rays and stabbingly penetrant stilettos of fire thrust and thrust again, sizzling, flashing planes cut and slashed. The heaviest annihilating and disintegrating beams generatable by man clawed and tore in wild abandon. And over all and through all the stupendously powerful blanketing beams, so furiously driven that the coils and commutators of their generators fairly smoked, and that the refractory throats of their projectors glared, radiantly violent, and began slowly, stubbornly to volatize, raved out in all their pyrotechnically incandescent might, striving prodigiously to crush, by their sheer power, the shielding screens of the vessel of the automatons. Nor was the vibratory offensive alone. Every gun, primary or auxiliary, that could be pointed at the Dresden was vomiting smoke and fire, and shrouded steel as fast as automatic loaders could serve it, and under that continuous, appallingly silent concussion, the giant frame of the flagship shuddered and trembled in every plate and member. And from every launching tube there was streaming the deadliest missiles known to science, radio dirigible torpedoes which, looping in vast circles to attain the highest possible measure of momentum, crashed against the Dresden's meteorite deflectors in Herculean efforts to break them down, and in failing to do so, exploded and filled all space with raging flame and with flying fragments of metal. Captain Malcolm was burning his stores of fuel and munitions at an appalling rate, careless alike of exhaustion, of reserves, and of service life of equipment. All his generators were running at a shockingly ruinous overload. His every projector was being used so mercilessly that not even their powerful refrigerators, radiating the transported heat into the interplanetary cold from the dark side of the ship, could keep their refractory linings in place for long. And through raging beam, through blasting ray, through crushing force, through storm of explosive and through rain of metal, the Dresden remained apparently unscathed. Her screens were radiating high into the violet, but they showed no sign of weakening or of going down. Neither did the meteorite deflectors break down. Everything held, since she was armed as capably as was the flagship and was being fought by inhumanly intelligent monstrosities. She was invulnerable to any one ship of the fleet as long as her generators could be fed. Nevertheless, Captain Malcolm was well content. He was making the Dresden burn plenty of irreplaceable fuel, and his generators and projectors would last long enough. His ship, his men, and his weapons could and would carry the load until the fresh attackers should take it over and carry it they did. Carried it while Stone and his overdriven crew finished their complicated mechanisms and flew out into space towards the eleven nearest battleships of the fleet. They carried it while the computers, grim-faced and scowling now, jotted down from minute to minute the enormous and rapidly increasing figure representing their radial velocity carried it while the Earth's immense armada, manned by creatures incapable of even the simplest coherent thought or purposeful notion, plunged sickeningly downward in its madly hopeless fall, with scarcely a measurable trace of tangential velocity towards the unimaginable inferno of the sun. Eventually, however, the shielded lifeboats approached their objectives and expanded their screens to enclose them. Officers recovered, airlocks open, and the lifeboats, still radiating protection, were taken inside. Explanations were made, orders were given, and one by one, the eleven vengeful super dreadnoughts shot away to join their flagship in abating the menace of the machine. No conceivable structure, however armed or powered, could withstand the fury of the combined assault of twelve such superb battlecraft, and under that awful concentration of force, the screens of the doomed ship radiated higher and higher into the ultraviolet, went black and failed, and those mighty defenses down, the end was practically instantaneous. 
No unprotected metal can endure even momentarily the ardor of such beams, and they played on not only until every plate and girder of the vessel and every nut, bolt, and rivet of its monstrous crew had been blasted out of all semblance to what it had once been, but until every fragment of metal had not only been liquefied, but it had been completely volatized. At the instant of cessation of the brain-scrambling activities of the automatons, the communication officer had become an insistent broadcast. Aboard all of the ships, there were many who did not recover, who would be helpless imbeciles during the short period of life left to them. But soon an intelligent officer was at every control, and each unit of the terrestrial contingent was exerting its maximum thrust at a right angle to its line of fall. And now the burden was shifted from the fighting staff to the no less able engineers and computers. To the engineers, the task of keeping their mighty engines in such tune as to maintain constantly the peak acceleration of three Earth gravities. To the computers, that of so directing their ever-changing course as to win every possible centimeter of precious tangential velocity. Chapter 4. The Sun's Gravity Ferdinand Stone was hollow-eyed and gaunt from his practically sleepless days and nights of toil, but he was grimly resolute as ever. Struggling against the terrific weight of three gravities, he made his way to the desk of the chief computer and waited while that worthy, whose leaden hands could scarcely manipulate the instruments of his profession, finished his seemingly endless calculations. We will escape the sun's mighty attraction, Dr. Stone, with approximately half a gravity to spare, the mathematician reported finally. Whether we will be alive or not is another question. There will be heat, which our refrigerators may or may not be able to handle. There will be radiations, which our armor may or may not be able to stop. You, of course, know a lot more about those things than I do. Distance at closest approach, snapped Stone. 2.29 times 10 to the ninth meters from the sun's center, the computer shot back instantly. That is 1,590,000 kilometers only 2.27 radii from the arbitrary surface. What do you think of our chances, sir? It will probably be a near thing, very near, the physicist replied thoughtfully. Much, however, can be done. We can probably tune our defensive screens to block most of the harmful radiations, and we may be able to muster other defenses. I will analyze the radiations and see what we can do about neutralizing them. You will go to bed, directed Martin crisply. There will be lots of time for that work after you get rested up. The doctors have been reporting that the men who did not recover from the robot's broadcast are dying under this acceleration. With those facts staring us in the face, however, I do not see how we can reduce our power. We can't. As it is, many more of us will probably die before we get away from the sun. And Stone staggered away, practically asleep on his feet. Day after day, the frightful fall continued. The sun grew larger and larger, more and ever more menacingly intense. One by one at first, and then by scores, the mindless men of the fleet died and were consigned to space. A man must be in full control of all his faculties to survive for long an acceleration of three gravities. The generators of the defensive screens had early been tuned to neutralize as much as possible of old souls' most fervently harmful frequencies and but for their mighty shields, every man of the fleet would have perished long since. Now even those ultra-powerful guards were proving inadequate. Refrigerators were running at the highest possible overload, and the men, pressing as closely as possible to the dark sides of their vessels, were availing themselves of such extra protection of lead shields and the like as could be improvised from whatever material was at hand. Yet the already stifling air became hotter and hotter, Eyes began to ache and burn, skins blistered and cracked under the punishing impact of forces which all the defenses could not block. But at last came the long-awaited announcement. Pilots and watch officers of all ships, attention! The chief computer spoke into his microphone through parched and blackened lips. We are now at the point of tangency. The gravity of the sun here is 24.5 meters per second squared. Since we are blasting 29.4, we are beginning to pull away at an acceleration of 4.9. Until further notice, keep your pointers directly away from the sun's center in the plane of the ecliptic. The sun was now in no sense the orb of day with which we upon Earth's green surface are familiar. It was a gigantic globe of turbulently seething flame, subtending an angle of almost 35 degrees, 
blotting out a full fourth of the cone of normally distinct vision. Sunspots were plainly to be seen, combinations of indescribably violent cyclonic storms and volcanic eruptions in a gaseously liquid medium of searing, eye-tearing incandescence, and everywhere threatening at times even to reach the fiercely straggling ships of space were the solar prominences, fiendish javelins of frenziedly frantic destruction, hurling themselves in wild abandon out into the empty reaches of the void. Eyes behind almost opaque lead glass goggles, head and body encased in a multi layered suit, each ply of which was copiously smeared with thick lead paint. Stone studied the raging monster of the heavens from the closest viewpoint any human being had ever attained and lived. Even he, protected as he was, could peer but briefly, and master physicist though he was, an astronomer of sorts, yet he was profoundly awed at the spectacle. Twice that terrifying mass was circled. Then air temperature again bearable and lethal radiation stopped. The grueling acceleration was reduced to a heavenly one and one half gravities and the vast fleet remade its formation. The automatons and the sun between them had taken heavy toll, but the gaps were filled, men were transferred to equalize the losses of personnel, and the course was laid for distant Earth. And in the Admiral's private quarters, two men sat together and stared at each other. Well... That's that. So far, so good. The physicist broke the long silence. But is their power really broken? asked Martin anxiously. I don't know, Stone grunted dourly. But the pick of them, the brainiest of the lot, were undoubtedly here. We beat them. Martin interrupted. You beat them, you mean, he said. With a lot of absolutely indispensable help from you and your force. But have it your own way. What do words matter? I beat them, then, and in the same sense as I can beat the rest of them if we play our cards exactly right. In what way? In keeping me entirely out of the picture. Believe me, Martin, it is of the essence that all of your officers who know what happened be sworn to silence, and that not a word about me leaks out to anybody. Put out any story you please except the truth. Mention the name of anybody or anything between here and Andromeda except me. Promise me now that you will not let my name get out until I give you permission, or until after I'm dead. But I'll have to, in my reports. You report only to the Supreme Council, and a good half of those reports are sealed. Seal this one. But I think... What with? Gruffly. If my name becomes known, my usefulness and my life are done. Remember, Martin, I know robots. There are some capable ones left, and if they get wind of me in any way, they'll get me before I can get them. As things are, and with your help, I can and I will get them all. That's a promise. Have I yours? In that case, of course you have. And Admiral Alan Martin and Dr. Ferdinand Stone were men who kept their promises. End of Robot Nemesis by E.E. E. Smith The Sons of Japheth by Richard Wilson this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. His duty was clear and simple. Strafe Noah's Ark and kill every human on it. The tricky part was making sure the animals lived. The Sons of Japheth by Richard Wilson Pilot officer Ray Vanjan happened to be spaceborne when the Earth exploded. In that way, he escaped the annihilation along with one other man, revered old Dr. Garfield Gar, who was in the space station. Roy had backed off in preparation for a Mach 10 dive on Kabul, which the enemy had lately taken over. He had one small omnibomb left in his racks and Kabul had seemed to be about the right size. But then the destruction of Earth changed his plans. He watched expressionless as the planet exploded. He shrugged. There was nothing to do now but go see Dr. Gar. Roy's phoscope clamored incessantly, and he tensed, thinking a spaceborne enemy was on him. But it was only a piece of exploding Earth 
stumbling by. Dr. Gar was alone in the space station because all able-bodied men had been called to fight World War V. The governments of Earth, in a rare moment of conscience during the short truce, had agreed that Dr. Gar, as the embodiment of all earthly knowledge, should be protected from harm. Pilot Officer Roy Van Jan didn't receive as warm a reception from old Dr. Gar as he might have, considering that they were the only two people left. The old man was combing his white beard with his fingers and didn't offer to shake hands. Well, said Roy as he diffused his bomb and secured his single seater in the space lock, I guess it's all over. Scarcely a historic statement, Dr. Gar said, but it describes the situation. If you don't have anything for me to do, I'd just as soon have a drink. They usually let me have a stiff one after I complete a mission. Dr. Gar examined the hard young pilot from under the shaggy white eyebrows. I do have another mission for you, but you can have a drink first. Peach brandy is all that's left. That'll be fine, Roy said. I was never particular. Then you're my man, Dr. Gar said, giving him a deep look, because I want you to go back in time and destroy humanity. Whatever you say, Roy's training showed. But if I may comment, wouldn't that be superfluous? Except for you and me, the human race is finished. We've achieved our objective. He spoke without irony. Never my objective. I'm not a scholar, and I mean no offense, Roy said. But I believe it was the coordinated spatial theory you announced back in 06 that made it possible. Misapplication. Dr. Gar said wearily, not wanting to go into it further for such an audience. Though, he thought, he'd never have another. Come to my study and have your brandy. I still don't understand, Roy said later. He reached tentatively for the bottle. When the old man made no objection, he poured a second stiff one. You want me to go back in time and wipe out all human life? Roy said. I assume you'll tell me when and where. All right. That would destroy our ancestors, and so we'd cease to exist too. Wouldn't it be simpler to kill ourselves now? That is, if you see no point in our further existence. Old Dr. Gar watched the other remnant of earthly life twirl the brandy in a goblet. He looked at the view screen. It showed a panorama of rock dust and steam where the earth had been. You forgot that we have annihilated everything, Dr. Gar said, gazing pensively at the screen. Mankind, the animals, plant life, and the tiny things that creep the earth or swim the waters. Your mission will be more selective. Selective? How? You'll destroy man, but the rest will live. They may evolve into something better. If you say so, Doctor. Roy's devotion to duty was a well-worn path. Assuming you have the machine, and I can operate it. The machine is merely an attachment. It will plug into the instrument panel of your spacecraft. It operates automatically. Good enough. You always were a whiz at these things. How far back do I go? And who do I kill? I want you to strafe the ark, exercising care not to hurt any of the animals, said old Dr. Garfield Gar. Noah's ark? Pilot Officer Roy Vangen said. You mean during the flood? Yes, I've computed it exactly. You won't have to worry about getting there at the wrong time. You mean after the forty days' rain, so I'll have good visibility. Good-o. He agreed readily, and he'd do as the doctor said, of course. 
but he permitted a trace of skepticism in his inflection and a searching look into his goblet no not the fortieth day dr gar said but in what we are told was the six hundred and first year in the first month the first day of the month the animals need dry land i have it all figured out i hope so i mean i'm sure you have you're the doctor of course but wasn't there some kind of doubt about the accuracy of the old book i didn't know you were a fundamentalist am i not the repository of all human knowledge dr gar asked he was not a bit angry with roy van jan am i not the last best hope has not all else failed us well sure did not the noetic convention under which human government was established fail has not japhetic science been our undoing roy looked lost i'm no scholar doctor agreed but perhaps you'll grant me that i am he looked with a supreme calm at the young pilot i'm your new intelligence officer and you're merely my striking arm help yourself to another brandy son maybe i better not i don't want to goof the mission there's time you'll want some sleep first all right i suppose i'll need a steady hand to murder noah and the rest and shem and ham and japhtha and noah's wife said dr gar and the three wives of his sons with them as it was written especially japhtha but not the animals remember i understand that if you think the ten commandments don't apply whatever one of them it was they were an element of the mosaic covenant it too failed perhaps the garic covenant if i may be so vain will endure the waters covered the earth a moment ago before he activated the attachment pilot officer roy van jan's spacecraft had been plunging towards a vortex of a ragged ball of dust and vapor the destroyed earth of world war five now in the edemic year of 601 or was it the edemic he couldn't remember though dr gar had let him study the book the water stretched everywhere ahead the sun glinted in reflection from something rising above the surface ararat he made out the twin peaks he throttled back to scarcely more than mach one and flew over them high his second pass took him back along his own vapor trail this time he spotted the tiny surface craft making for the solitary bit of land he had to hand it to dr gar the old boy's space-time grid had hit it right on the button roy was too high to distinguish details but he imagined that noah and his family would be on deck full of wonder of mount ararat rising as promised from the sea but there was another wonder the vapor trails that stretched for miles across the upper air did they down there on the ark think them a sign of the lord roy smiled ironically they were a sign of the lord gar and of his servant pilot officer van jan come to blast them into eternity and change the future to give the animals a chance who would chronicle his role as the rearranging angel the unheavenly host about to gather up in violence the drifting souls below who he wondered some simian scribe some unborn elephant prophet an insectate scholar destined to evolve from among the creeping things that would inherit the earth or perhaps the written word would die unborn under the fiery hail of his guns no matter these questions and more had been anticipated by dr gar soon now 
at the end of Roy's strafing run, it would be up to history to begin assembling the answers. He slowed to mock Minus and sent out wings. He would have to dip close to see if the entire Ark's complement was on deck. The job had to be done right or Earth was kaput. Nothing personal, Noah, old boy. There they were, on the starboard side of the top deck, well out from under the pitch of the roof, craning their necks to look at the miracle in the sky where they were expecting to see only a returning dove. Behold! Roy cried out. I bring you tidings, but not the tidings of the dove. I am your lost raven returned, the raven of death. My tidings are of a new future which your descendants will not know, and so will not doom. The frightened, upturned faces were far behind, and he was talking to himself. Hear me, Noah, for I am come to destroy you, and with you your seeds of self-destruction. These are the tidings I bring from the future that has ceased to exist, because you existed. The future that will exist once more when you cease to. He heeled the spacecraft over and back. No more speeches, he told himself, though he had studied the book in fascination. He was a killer, not a philosopher. He would have to make his strafing run low. If he dived on the target, his bullets would go into the holds and kill the animals. He roared at the ark a few feet above the waves. They were all together in a clump, the eight of them. Farewell, Noah, he thought, as his thumbs pressed on the death-dealing button. Farewell, Noah, and Noah's wife. Farewell, Ham, and Ham's wife, and unborn sons. Farewell, Canaan, and Cush, and Mazram, and Put. Farewell, Shem the unborn Elam, and Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. And farewell Japheth, father of sons of science. Farewell Gomer, and Magog, and Medea, and Javan, and Tubal, and Mishra, and Tyrus. Farewell all tribes. Make way for the animal kingdom in the Garrick Covenant. He had made three passes, and now he zoomed into the sky. He had destroyed humanity and changed the future. Or had he? He'd be dead, too, if he had. Gone like the snap of a finger with the last gasp from the ark. He had killed his ancestors. He had killed everybody's ancestors. But he existed still. Where was the paradox? that Dr. Gar had overlooked. The Ark had drifted closer to the shore. He circled it and counted the lifeless bodies lying in red stains on the gopher wood of the deck. Eight. Then he noticed the change. The backs of his hands were hairier. His shoes were binding him. When he kicked them off, his agile toes curled comfortably around the control pedals. He had a glimpse of a hairy, flat-nosed face reflecting in the instrument panel. It laughed, and the sound came out a simian yap. But for all that he was still a sentient being. His control of the spacecraft was as expert as before. It hadn't worked. Do you hear, Dr. Gar? he thought. It's a flop. I goofed the mission. We're all dead, no matter what. I give you a new commandment, man who would be God. Thou shalt not tamper with time. He had changed the future, and in the future he himself had been changed. But not enough. Somewhere below, in the hold of the Ark, were his ancestors, who had evolved along a new path in the new future. The evolution had been slower, perhaps but it had been sure, external appearances notwithstanding. Somewhere in the far future, he was sure, there was a simian Dr. Gar, 
looking down in solitude on the remnants of earth. The ark had touched the land. The animals, his fellow creatures, were beginning to go forth, two by two, unto the shores of Ararat. His foescope set up a clamor. There in the sky was a new thing, a spaceship like his, yet unlike it. It looked deadlier, more purposeful. Ignoring him, it was diving out of the unknowable future to destroy its own past. He watched in professional admiration as his fellow pilot screamed unerringly for the Ark, in sacrificial completion of the mission he himself had failed to accomplish. Death to the animals, too, from an animal pilot. He knew then that Earth would not die. It might circle lifeless for eons, waiting to welcome the foot, or paw, or tentacle, of others from outside. But it would be there, intact and serene. Even as the mountain-shattering explosion came and he himself ceased to exist, he knew. The End of The Sons of Japheth by Richard Wilson The Piebald Hippogriff by Karen Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gina Nelson. The Piebald Hippogriff by Karen Anderson. The edge of the world is fenced off stoutly enough, but the fence isn't made that will stop a boy. Johnny tossed his pack and coil of rope over it and started climbing. The top three strands were barbed wire. He caught his shirt as he went over and had to stop for a moment to ease himself off. Then he dropped lightly to the grass on the other side. The pack had landed in a clump of white clover. A cloud of disturbed bees hung above and he snatched it away quickly lest they should notice the honeycomb inside. For a minute he stood still looking out over the edge. This was different from looking through the fence, and when he moved, it was slowly. He eased himself to the ground, where a corner of rock rose clear of the thick larkspur and lay on his belly, the stone hard and cool under his chin, and looked down. The granite cliff curved away out of sight, and he couldn't see if it had a foot. He saw only endless blue beyond, below, and on both sides. Clouds passed slowly. Directly beneath him, there was a ledge covered with long grass where clusters of stars bloomed on tall, slender stalks. He uncoiled his rope and found a stout beech tree not too close to the edge. Doubling the rope around the bowl, he tied one end around his waist, slung the pack on his back, and belayed himself down the cliff. Pebbles clattered, Saxifrage brushed his arms and tickled his ears, once he groped for a hold with his face in a patch of rustling ferns. The climb was hard, but not too much. Less than half an hour later, he was stretched out on the grass with stars nodding about him. They had a sharp, gingery smell. He lay in the cool shadow of the world's edge for a while, eating apples and honeycomb from his pack. When he was finished, he licked the honey off his fingers and threw the apple cores over, watching them fall into the blue. Little islands floated along, rocking gently in air eddies. Sunlight flashed on glossy leaves of bushes growing there. When an island drifted into the shadow of the cliff, the blossoming stars shone out. Beyond the shadows, deep in the light-filled gulf, he saw the hippogriffs at play. There were dozens of them, frisking and cavorting in the air. He gazed at them full of wonder. They pretended to fight, stooped at one another, soared off in long spirals to stoop and soar and stoop again. One flashed by him, a golden palomino that shone like polished wood. The wind whistled in its wings. Away to the left, the cliff fell back in a wide crescent and nearly opposite him, a river tumbled over the edge. 
A pool on a ledge beneath caught most of the water, and there were hippogriffs drinking. One side of the broad pool was notched. The overflow fell sheer in a white plume blown sideways by the wind. As the sun grew hotter, the hippogriffs began to settle and browse on the islands that floated past. Not far below, he noticed a dozen or so stood drowsily on an island that was floating through the cliff's shadow toward his ledge. It would pass directly below him. With a sudden resolution, Johnny jerked his rope down from the tree above and tied the end to a projecting knob on the cliff. Slinging on his pack again, he slid over the edge and down the rope. The island was already passing. The end of the rope trailed through the grass. He slithered down and cut a piece off his line. It was barely long enough after he had tied a noose in the end. He looked around at the hippogriffs. They had shied away when he dropped onto the island, but now they stood still, watching him warily. Johnny started to take an apple out of his pack, then changed his mind and took a piece of honeycomb. He broke off one corner and tossed it toward them. They fluttered their wings and backed off a few steps, then stood still again. Johnny sat down to wait. They were mostly chestnuts and blacks, and some had white stockings. One was piebald. That was the one which, after a while, began edging closer to where the honeycomb had fallen. Johnny sat very still. The piebald sniffed at the honeycomb, then jerked up its head to watch him suspiciously. He didn't move. After a moment, it took the honeycomb. When he threw another bit, the piebald hippogriff wheeled away, but returned almost at once and ate it. Johnny tossed a third piece only a few yards from where he was sitting. It was bigger than the others, and the hippogriff had to bite it in two. When the hippogriff bent its head to take the rest, Johnny was on his feet instantly, swinging his lariat. He dropped the noose over the hippogriff's head. For a moment, the animal was too startled to do anything. Then Johnny was on its back, clinging tight. The piebald hippogriff leaped into the air, and Johnny clamped his legs about convulsed muscles. Pinions whipped against his knees, and wind blasted his eyes. The world tilted. They were rushing downward. His knees pressed the sockets of the enormous wings. The distant ramparts of the world swung madly, and he seemed to fall upward, away from the sun that suddenly glared under the hippogriff's talons. He forced his knees under the roots of the beating wings and dug heels into prickling hair. A sob caught his breath, and he clenched his teeth. The universe righted itself about him for a moment, and he pulled breath into his lungs. Then they plunged again. Wind searched under his shirt. Once he looked down. After that, he kept his eyes on the flutter of the feather mane. A jolt sent him sliding backward. He clutched the rope with slippery fingers. The wings missed a beat, and the hippogriff shook its head as the rope momentarily checked its breath. It tried to fly straight up, lost way, and fell stiff-winged. The long muscles stretched under him as it arched its back, then bunched when it kicked straight out behind. The violence loosened his knees and he trembled with fatigue, but he wound the rope around his wrists and pressed his forehead against whitened knuckles. Another kick, and another. Johnny dragged at the rope. The tense wings flailed, caught air, and brought the hippogriff upright again. The rope slackened and he heard huge gasps. Sunlight was hot on him again, and a drop of sweat crawled down his temple. It tickled. He loosened one hand to dab at the annoyance. A new twist sent him sliding, and he grabbed the rope. The tickle continued until he nearly screamed. He no longer dared let go. Another tickle developed beside the first. He scrubbed his face against the coarse fiber of the rope. The relief was like a world conquered. Then, they glided in a steady spiral that carried them upward with scarcely a feather's motion. When the next plunge came, Johnny was ready for it and leaned back until the hippogriff arched its neck, trying to free itself from the pressure on its windpipe. Half choked, it glided again and Johnny gave it breath. They landed on one of the little islands. The hippogriff drooped its head and wings, trembling. 
he took another piece of honeycomb from his pack and tossed it to the ground where the hippogriff could reach it easily. While it ate, he stroked it and talked to it. When he dismounted, the hippogriff took honeycomb from his hand. He stroked its neck, breathing the sweet, warm, feathery smell, and laughed aloud when it snuffled the back of his neck. Tying the rope into a sort of hackamore, he mounted again and rode the hippogriff to the pool below the thunder and cold spray of the waterfall. He took care that it did not drink too much. When he ate some apples for his lunch, the hippogriff ate the cores. Afterward, he rode to one of the drifting islands and let his mount graze. For a while, he kept by its side, making much of it. With his fingers, he combed out the soft, flowing plumes of its mane and examined its hooves and the sickle-like talons of the forelegs. He saw how the smooth feathers on its forequarters became finer and finer, until he could scarcely see where the hair on the hindquarters began. Delicate feathers covered its head. The island glided further and further away from the cliffs, and he watched the waterfall dwindle away to a streak and disappear. After a while, he fell asleep. He woke with a start, suddenly cold. The setting sun was below his island. The feathery odor was still on his hands. He looked around for the hippogriff and saw it sniffing at his pack. When it saw him move, it trotted up to him with an expectant air. He threw his arms about the great flat-muscled neck and pressed his face against the warm feathers with a faint sense of embarrassment at feeling tears in his eyes. Good old Patch, he said, and got his pack. He shared the last piece of honeycomb with his hippogriff, and watched the sun sink still further. The clouds were turning red. Let's go see those clouds, Johnny said. He mounted the piebald hippogriff, and they flew off, up through the golden air to the sunset clouds. There they stopped, and Johnny dismounted on the highest cloud of all, stood there as it turned slowly gray, and looked into the dimming depths. When he turned to look at the world, he saw only a wide smudge of darkness spread in the distance. The cloud they were standing on turned silver. Johnny glanced up and saw the moon, a crescent shore far above. He ate an apple and gave one to his hippogriff. While he chewed, he gazed back at the world. When he finished his apple, he was about to toss the core to the hippogriff, but stopped himself and carefully took out the seeds first. With the seeds in his pocket, he mounted again. He took a deep breath. Come on, Patch, he said. Let's homestead the moon. The End End of The Piebald Hippogriff by Karen Anderson Leave, Earthmen, or Die by John Massey Davis this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Murph, Forsythe, and Jameson heard the alien voice warn them. And to each it sounded familiar. A sweetheart, a son, a hated enemy. Leave, Earthmen, or die by John Massey Davis. In a dwindling spiral they circled the planet, and Murph's cold blue eyes studied the radar screen. Things looked good, no sign of cities, social denizens, or humanoids. He was scribbling notes on his desk when the all-wave above him started crackling. He watched the green line sweep back and forth along the dial, finally centering on the wavelength which was broadcasting. As it focused, the speaker sputtered in. In accordance with the interstellar code, it sounded like a recording. We repeat. Landings and colonization efforts have been previously attempted on this planet. They are not welcome, and have not been successful. Change course and seek other areas. This warning is being broadcast upon wavelengths available to you and in language translatable 
by you in accordance with interstellar code murphy switched it off and looked at his crew of two well forsyth grinned at him the hell with them we've heard that from every race in the solar system one way or another i say we land jameson shrugged put her down somewhere makes no difference to me his scarred lips tightened okay murph switched the set back on the same recording was playing monotonously load up the combat equipment boys we're going in the deadly silver needle tightened a spiral course around the planet and above murph the speaker crackled again and went dead guess they got tired of playing that recording he muttered another crackling and the mechanism blared again we see that you intend disregarding our warning in accordance with the interstellar code it is only fair to warn you it clicked off abruptly as murph jabbed at the switch no use listening to this outworld nonsense he'd heard it all before and lived through it where's the rest of the fleet he threw the question out generally nine hours behind us jameson said we blast in they follow us the three men were silent as they scanned the radar screen they wind above a landmass and murph juggled the controls and the ship swooped upward then settled slowly riding on the jets while they waited for the ground around them to cool the man climbed into combat gear the radar scanned the military hemisphere available and murph casually flipped the radio switch again have disregarded our warning the voice said insistently in accordance with interstellar code we cannot now be further responsible it croaked into silence as murph slammed the switch closed again nuts he said buckling the belt around his waist yeah said jameson the hell with them whoever they are well said forsyth he was the navigator now i'm not so sure get dressed murph was in command and he showed it we're going out there was an oddity about the voice murph thought as he dressed the voice reminded him of his sweetheart citra back in philly on earth husky throaty with a soft vibrant purr of a happy kitten it reminded forsyth of his son's tones during the family farewell for this expedition a twinge of concern tautened his body as he remembered one never knew when or if crews returned from these grim expansion campaigns of humanity jameson had another impression he remembered his days as a professional fighter and that last rough brawl when he hadn't quite made champion it still rankled the voice was that of his opponent in the seventh round just when jameson's knees started to buckle the sly calculating insults in the cliches intended to make him lose his head they had accomplished their purpose he had charged in slugging when he should have hung on or run backward until his wind returned from then on he became a has-been working steadily downward until the manpower needs of humanity had offered an opportunity to pick another career his scarred lips remembering were a tight line and his eyes cold and uncompromising they'd finished dressing murph flipped on the radio again grinning in contempt the voice still vibrated through the ether that you blast off immediately or assume the responsibilities for the consequences interstellar code states that invaded people are justified in using any tactics it clicked off murph had been annoyed by the resemblance to citra's voice perhaps he was homesick jameson's lips vanished into a white line and forsyth looked around rabid-eyed with astonishment expecting to see his son emerge from the piles of supplies and equipment self-conscious none of them said anything okay said murph 
Out we go. The precision door swung open quietly, and the three descended to the still smoking ground. Each set up his rapid fire electro gun covering the entrance, and then they sat back, waiting. Nothing happened, and Murph broke the tense silence. Turn on the radio, he looked at Forsythe. We can hear it from here. I'll man both guns. Forsythe grunted and vanished into the ship. Murph heard the crackle of the equipment warming up and listened to the voice of Citra. Oddly enough, Jameson tensed as he heard the voice of the present champion, and Forsythe nearly cried as his son's tones came through the metallic speaker. But all the voices said the same thing subject to unprincipled attack to resist invasion of our homeland this is the last time this warning will be broadcast the receiver clicked then dropped into a monotonous hum of a radio on an unused but still alert wavelength from over a slight rise a mile off a figure approached the ship murph blinked doubting his senses confused then his roar broke the silence of the strange world citra just one word but that's all he could do she looked as she had when he'd left on this expedition when they had said goodbye sparkling with sequins in her dressing room undulating with feathers in the right places she walked toward him with the feline grace he'd learned to love. Citra, he shouted again. Astonished, he deserted his position behind the gun and started running across the plain. Graceful, dainty, encountering difficulties because of her spiked heels on the rough terrain, she smiled bravely and hurried toward him. Forsyth saw the approaching figure, too. He tensed with disbelief and surprise and then his voice rose excitedly. Jimmy! Jimmy! What was his boy doing here? Reason faded as he watched his nine-year-old son stumble toward the ship. He unfastened his harness and slipped from behind the gun. His boy on an alien planet, confronting unknown dangers? He must, must, get to him. Get him back to the ship and the little ring of certainty behind the guns. Forsyth started across the level space, grateful that the towering hulk of mirth had recognized his boy and would, on this unknown world, help bring the kid back to comparative safety. In six hours now, the fleet would be here. The boy would be sent home on one of the capital ships. Behind him, Jameson watched the two figures running away. His face froze into granite. Rage and resentment surged within him. Across the plain, he saw the man who had stolen, yes, stolen, the championship from him. The fighter loped toward him casually, sneering and confident. Jameson felt a surge like an electric shock across his shoulders. His teeth ground together, and he could hear their roaring within his ears. Deliberately, he moved from his gun, started at a fighter's dog trot, toward his opponent. It occurred to him that Murph and Forsythe would beat him there. He was glad they were willing to help, but for the sake of his own integrity, he considered this his fight. Jameson ran swiftly then. He passed Forsythe and Murph, determined to be the first to reach the one man he hated. He sprinted eagerly, sucking the strange air chemicals of this world into his lungs. He was short of breath. Behind him he heard the heavy thudding of Murph, plunging and plowing toward him, and, in addition, the light but rapid steps of Forsyth. By now he didn't care. He was confronting his opponent. Dropping into a crouch, Jameson moved in, 
feet wide, tense. There would be no mistake, no error this time. His fists lashed out, and his opponent fell on the strange and powdery dust of a strange world, millions of miles from their first fight. The man started struggling up, and again flat-footed, tense, fists like clutched sledgehammers, Jameson dove at him. And then it happened. Murph hit Jameson from the side. Raw and choking with rage, Murph clubbed, groped, kicked, fouled, until the ex-fighter fell in the pale and strange dust. Murph's voice was hoarse and shaking. Hit my woman, will you? he screamed in rage. Jameson tried to rally, but each time he moved, Murph's fist slammed against his face and head. There was a final crash as the back of his head struck against the rocks on the ground. Jameson lay in the dust of an alien planet, and from behind his right eye, gray and reddish matter oozed. He didn't move. Murph stood up. He looked again at Citra. He was choked and tired, standing there. And as he gasped for breath, Forsyth ran by him, ran up to her. Angrily he watched, Forsyth, running up to his woman. What was wrong with these men? Murph saw Forsyth put his arms around Citra and say, meaninglessly to Murph, Jimmy! Jimmy! Again a red rage filled Murph. He dove forward, smashing into Forsyth, and the navigator reeled backward. As he fell back, his feet tangled in the scrubby vegetation of the planet. He reached toward his belt, and his electric gun jerked free from the holster. He saw the bull shape of Murphy over him, an enraged beast, and as he fell, the twin electrodes shot out an energy stream. Fear and hatred tensed his nerves. But despite the emotion, he set the range right. The sparks arced together just in front of the great bulk of Murph. There was a crackling and the smell of burnt flesh, then a surprised look upon Murph's face. The surprise turned to rage, and the last thing Forsyth saw was Murph falling down on him. His clothes and his chest burned away until the rib showed, animal rage welling from his lips. A figure stood fifty feet away and watched this drama. Murph, blood coughing from his mouth and nose, the great muscles of his chest nothing but crisp burnt meat, reached for Forsyth, picked him up, holding him over his head as an ape would a man, and slammed him again and again to the ground. The final time Murph tried to lift Forsyth, his strength gave out. He dropped Forsyth's limp form, coughed in a final paroxysm, and fell beside Forsyth and Jameson. The figure which stood fifty feet away turned and walked leisurely back over the rise. Now it was not a fighter, and it was not Jimmy, and it was not Citra. It was a denizen of the planet, and it looked like no human. Shortly thereafter, the all-wave radio and the deadly powerful silver needle standing serenely on the strange world blared again. In accordance with interstellar code, we have asked that we not be invaded, and are warning you that according to Article 19, Section 3, fleets which invade a peaceful people become subject to unprincipled attack even to the use of psychological weapons. Five hours away, the main fleet streaked toward the planet. The Admiral looked at the tape reports from the scout ship and at transcripts of the recorded warnings. Nuts, he said. We go in. He felt an odd, intuitive twinge. The voice was so much like his mother's and she hadn't been well when he'd last seen her. Besides him, the radio man busily, tensely, sent out landing instructions. 
He felt irritable. The voice had sounded like Peggy. That no good cheating. He shrugged. Just imagination. In a diminishing spiral, the fleet swung around the planet while the Admiral scanned the screen for a free landing site. The End of Leave, Earthmen, or Die by John Massey Davis The Dark Side of Antry by Sewell Peasley Wright This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jacob Dickerson The Dark Side of Antry by Sewell Peasley Wright An officer of the Special Patrol Service dropped in to see me the other day. He was a young fellow, very sure of himself, and very kindly towards an old man. He was doing a monograph, he said, for his own amusement, upon the early forms of our present offensive and defensive weapons. Could I tell him about the first duber spheres and the earlier disintegrator rays and the crude atomic bombs we tried back when I first entered the service? I could, of course, and I did. But a man's memory does not improve the course of a century of Earth years. Our scientists have not been able to keep a man's brain as fresh as his body, despite all their vaunted progress. There is a lot these deep thinkers in their great laboratories don't know. The whole universe gives them the credit for what's been done, yet the men of action who carried out the ideas... But I'm getting away from my pert young officer. He listened to me with interest and toleration. Now and then he helped me out when my memory failed me on some little detail. He seemed to have a fair theoretical knowledge of the subject. It seems impossible, he commented when we had gone over the ground he had outlined that the service could have done its work with such crude and undeveloped weapons, does it not? He smiled in a superior sort of way, as though to imply we had probably done the best we could under the circumstances. I suppose I should not have permitted his attitude to irritate me, but I am an old man and my life has not been an easy one. Youngster, I said, like many old people, I prefer spoken conversation. Back in those days, the service was handicapped in every way. We lacked weapons, we lacked instruments, we lacked popular support and backing. But we had men in those days who did their work with the tools that were at hand. And we did it well. Yes, sir, the youngster said hastily. After all, a retired commander in the Special Patrol Service does rate a certain amount of respect, even from these perky youngsters. I know that, sir. It was the efforts of men like yourself who gave us the proud traditions we have today. Well, that's hardly true, I corrected him. I'm not quite so old as that. We had a fine set of traditions when I entered the service, son, but we did our share to carry them on, I'll grant you that. Nothing less than complete success, quoted the lad almost reverently, giving the ancient motto of our service. That is a fine tradition for a body of men to aspire to, sir. True, true. The ring in the boy's voice brought memories flocking. It was a proud motto. As old as I am, the words bring a thrill even now, a thrill comparable only with that which comes from seeing old earth swell up out of the darkness of space after days of outer emptiness. Old earth with her wispy white clouds and her broad seas. Oh, I know I'm provincial, but that is another thing that must be forgiven an old man. I imagine, sirs, said the young officer, that you could tell many a strange story of the service and the sacrifices men have made to keep that motto the proud boast it is today. Yes, I told him. I could do that. I have done so. That is my occupation now that I have been retired from active service. I... You are a historian? He broke in eagerly. I forgave him the interruption. I can still remember my own rather impetuous youth. Do I look like a historian? I think I smiled as I asked him the question and held out my hands to him. Big brown hands they are, hardened with work, stained and drawn from old acid burns and the bite of a blue electric fire. In my day, we worked with crude tools indeed, tools that left their mark upon the workmen. 
No, but I waved the explanation aside. Historians deal with facts, with accomplishments, with dates and places and the names of great men. I write what little I do write of men and high adventures so that in this time of softness and easy living, some few who may read my scribblings may live with me those days when the worlds of the universe were strange to each other, and there were many new things to be found and marveled at. And I'll venture, sir, that you find much enjoyment in the work, commented the youngster with a degree of perception with which I had not credited him. True, as I write, forgotten faces peer at me through the mists of the years and strong, friendly voices call to me from out of the past. It must be wonderful to live the old adventures through again, said the young officer hastily. Youth is always afraid of sentiment in old people. Why this should be, I do not know, but it is so. The lad, I wish I had made a note of his name, I predict the future for him in the service, left me alone then with the thoughts he had stirred up in my mind. Old faces, old voices, old scenes, too. Strange worlds, strange peoples. A hundred, a thousand different tongues. Men that came only to my knee and men that towered ten feet above my head. Creatures, possessed of all the attributes of men except physical form that belonged only in the nightmare realms of sleep. An old man's most treasured possessions is memories. A face drew close out of the flocking recollections. The face of a man I had known and loved more than a brother so many years. Dear God, how many years ago. Anderson Croy Search all the voluminous records of the bearded historians and you will not find his name. No great figure of history was this friend of mine, just an obscure officer on an obscure ship of the Special Patrol Service. And yet there is a people who owe to him their very existence. I wonder if they have forgotten him. It would not surprise me. The memory of the universe is not a reliable thing. Anderson Croy was, like most of the officer personnel of the Special Patrol Service, a native of Earth. They had tried to make a stoop-shouldered dabbler in formulas out of him, but he was not the stuff from which good scientists are molded. He was young when I first knew him and strong. He had mild blue eyes and a quick smile, and he had a fine, steely courage that a man could love. I was in command, then, of the Urtac, my second ship. I inherited Anderson Croy with the ship, and I liked him for the first time I laid eyes upon him. As I recall it, we worked together on the Urtac for nearly two years, Earth time. We went through some tight places together. I remember our experience shortly after I took over the Urtac on the monstrous planet Kalor, whose tiny, gentle people were attacked by strange, vapid things that come down upon them from the fastness of the polar cap. But I wander from the story I wish to tell here. An old man's mind is a weak and weary thing that totters and weaves from side to side. Like a worn-out ship, it is hard to keep on a straight course. We were out on one of those long, monotonous patrols skirting the outer boundaries of the known universe that were, at that time, before the building of all the many stations we have today, a dreaded part of the special patrol service routine. Not once had we landed to stretch our legs. Slowing up to atmospheric speed took time, and we were on a schedule that allowed for no waste of even minutes. We approached the various worlds only close enough to report, and to receive an assurance that all was well. A dog's life, but part of the game. My log showed nearly a hundred all's well reports, as I remember it, when we slid up to Antry, which was, so far as size is concerned, one of our smallest ports of call. Antry, I might add, for the benefit of those who have forgotten their maps of the universe, is a satellite of A411, which, in turn, is one of the largest bodies of the universe, in both uninhabited and uninhabitable. Antry is somewhat larger than the moon, Earth's satellite, and considerably farther from its controlling body. Report our presence, Mr. Croy, I ordered wearily, and please ask Mr. Corey to keep a sharp watch on the attraction meter. These huge bodies, such as A411, are not pleasant companions at space speeds. A few minutes' trouble, 
spaceships gave trouble in those days, and you melted like a drop of solder when you struck the atmospheric belt. Yes, sir. There never was a crisper young officer than Croy. I bent over my tables, working out our position and charting our course for the next period. In a few seconds, Croy was back, his blue eyes gleaming. Sir, an emergency is reported on entry. We are to make all possible speed to Oreo, their governing city. I gather that it is very important. Very well, Mr. Croy. I can't say the news was unwelcome. Monotony kills the young men. Have the disintegrator ray generators inspected and tested. Turn out the watch below in such time that we may have all hands on duty when we arrive. If there is an emergency, we shall be prepared for it. I shall be with Mr. Corey in the navigating room. If there are any further communications, relay them to me there. I hurried up to the navigating room and gave Corey his orders. Do not reduce speed until it is absolutely necessary, I concluded. We have an emergency call from Antry and minutes may be important. How long do you make it to Oreo? About an hour to the atmosphere. Say, an hour more to set down in the city. I believe that's about right, sir. I nodded, frowning at the twin charts with their softly glowing lights, and turned to the television disc, picking up Antry without difficulty. Of course, back in those days, we had the huge and cumbersome discs, their faces shielded by a hood that would be suitable only for museum pieces now. But they did their work very well, and I searched Antry carefully, at varying ranges, for any sign of disturbances. I found none. The dark portion, of course, I could not penetrate. Antry has one portion of its face that is turned forever from its sun, and one half that is bathed in perpetual light. The long twilight zone was uninhabited, for the people of Antry are a sun-loving race, and their cities and villages appeared only in the bright areas of perpetual sunlight. Just as we reduced to atmospheric speed, Croy sent up a message. The Governing Council sends word that we are to set down on the platform atop the Hall of Government, the large, square, white building in the center of the city. They say we will have no difficulty in locating it. I thanked him and ordered him to stand by for further messages, if any, and picked up the far-flung city of Oreo in my television disc. There was no mistaking the building Croy had mentioned. It stood out from the city around it, cool and white, its mighty columns glistening like crystal in the sun. I could even make out the landing platform, slightly elevated above the roof on spidery arches of silvery metal. We sped straight for the city at just a fraction of space speed, but the hand of the surface temperature gauge crept slowly toward the red line that marked the dangerous incandescent point. I saw that Corey, like the good navigating officer he was, was watching the gauge as closely as myself, and hence said nothing. We both knew that the Antrians would not have sent a call for help to a ship of the Special Patrol Service if there had not been a real emergency. Corey had made a good guess in saying that it would take about an hour after entering the gaseous envelope of Antry to reach our destination. It was just a few minutes, Earth time of course, less than that when we settled gently onto the landing platform. A group of six or seven Antrians, dignified old men, wearing the short, loosely belted white robes that we found were their universal costume, were waiting for us at the exit of the Urtak, whose sleek, smooth sides were glowing dull red. You have hastened, and that is well, sirs, said the spokesman of the committee. You find Antry in dire need. He spoke in the universal language, and spoke it softly and perfectly. But you will pardon me for greeting you with that which is of necessity uppermost in my mind, and in the minds of these, my companions. Permit me to welcome you to Antry and to introduce those who extend those greetings. Rapidly he ran through a list of names, and each of the men bowed gravely in acknowledgment of our greetings. I have never observed a more courteous nor a more courtly people than the Antrians. Their manners are as beautiful as their faces. Last of all, their spokesman introduced himself. Bori Tolber, he was called, and he had the honor of being master of the council, the chief executive of Antry. When the introductions had been completed, the committee led our little party to a small cylindrical elevator which dropped us swiftly and silently on a cushion of air to the street level of the great building. Across a wide, gleaming corridor, our conductors led us and stood aside before a massive portal which ten men might have walked abreast. 
we found ourselves in a great chamber with a vaulted ceiling of bright, gleaming metal. At the far end of the room was an elevated rostrum, flanked on either side by huge, intricate masses of statuary of some creamy, translucent stone that glowed as with some inner light. Semicircular rows of seats, each with its carved desk, surmounted by numerous electrical controls, occupied all the floor space. None of the seats was occupied. We have excused the council from our preliminary deliberations, explained Bory Tolber, because such a large body is unwieldy. My companions and myself represent the executive heads of the various departments of the council, and we are empowered to act. He led us through the great council chamber and into an anteroom beautifully decorated, and furnished with exceedingly comfortable chairs. Be seated, sirs, the master of the council suggested. We obeyed silently, and Bory Tolber stood before, gazing thoughtfully into space. I do not know just where to begin, he said slowly. You men in uniform know, I presume, but little of this world of ours. I presume I had best begin far back. Since you are navigators of space, undoubtedly you are acquainted with the fact that Antri is a world divided into two parts, one of perpetual night and the other of perpetual day, due to the fact that Antri revolves but once upon its axis during the course of its circuit of its sun, thus presenting always the same face to our luminary. We have no day and night such as obtain on other spheres. There are no set hours for working, nor for sleeping, nor for pleasure. The measure of a man's work is the measure of his ambition, or his strength, or his desire. It is so, also, with his sleep and with his pleasures. It is, it has been, a very pleasant arrangement. Ours is a fertile country, and our people live very long and very happily with little effort. We have believed that ours was the nearest of all the worlds to the ideal, that nothing could disturb the peace and happiness of our people. We were mistaken. There is a dark side to Antri, a side upon which the sun never has shone, a dismal place of gloom which is like the night upon other worlds. No Antrian has, to our knowledge, ever penetrated this part of Antri and lived to tell of his experience. We do not even till the land close to the twilight zone. Why should we, when we have so much fine land upon which the sun shines bright and fair always, save for the two brief seasons of rain? We have never given thought to what might be on the dark face of Antri. Darkness and night are things unknown to us. We know of them only from the knowledge which has come to us from other worlds. And now... Now we have been brought face to face with a terrible danger which comes to us from that other side of this sphere. A people have grown there. A terrible people that I shall not try to describe to you. They threaten us with slavery, with extinction. Four aura ago, the Andrians have their own system of reckoning time, just as we have on Earth, instead of using the universal system based upon the Inaro. An ara corresponds to about fifty hours earth time. We did not know that such a people existed. Now their shadow is upon all our beautifully sunny country, and unless you can aid us before other help can reach us, I am convinced that Antri is doomed. For a moment, not one of us spoke. We sat there, staring at the old man who had just ceased speaking. Only a man ripened and seasoned with the passing of years could have stood there before us and uttered, so quietly and solemnly, words such had just come from his lips. Only in his eyes could we catch a glimpse of the torment which gripped his soul. Sir, I said, and have never felt younger than at that moment, when I tried to frame some assurance to this splendid old man who had turned to me and my youthful crew for succor. We shall do what it lies within our power to do but tell us more of this danger which threatens. I am no man of science, and yet I cannot see how men could live in a land never reached by the sun. There would be no heat, no vegetation. Is that not so? Would that it were, replied the master of the council bitterly. What you say would be indeed the truth, were it not for the great river and seas of our sunny Antri, which bear their heated waters to this dark portion of our world and make it habitable. And as for this danger, there is little to be said. At some time, men of our country, men who fish or venture upon the water in commerce, have been born, 
all unwillingly across the shadowy twilight zone and into the land of darkness. They did not come back, but they were found there and despoiled of their menores. Somehow, these creatures who dwell in darkness determined the use of the menore, and now that they have resolved that they shall rule all this sphere, they have been able to make their threat clear to us. Perhaps, and Bori Tolber smiled faintly and terribly, you would like to have that message direct from its bearer? Is that possible, sir? I asked eagerly, glancing around the room. How? Come with me, said the master of the council gently. Alone, for too many near him excites this terrible messenger. You have your manure? No, I had not thought there would be need of it. The manures of those days, it should be remembered, were heavy, cumbersome circlets that were worn upon the head like a sort of crown, and one did not go so equipped unless in real need of the device. Today, of course, your menores are but jeweled trinkets that convey thought a score of times more effectively, and weigh but a tenth as much. It is a lack easily remedied. Bori Tolber excused himself with a little bow, and hurried out into the great council chamber to appear again in a moment with the menore in either hand. Now, if your companions and mine will excuse us for a moment. He smiled around the seated group apologetically. There was a murmur of assent, and the old man opened a door in the other side of the room. It is not far, he said. I will go first and show you the way. He led me quickly down a long, narrow corridor to a pair of steep stairs that circled far down into the very foundation of the building. The walls of the corridor and the stairs were without windows, but were as bright as noonday from the ethon tubes which were set into both ceiling and walls. Silently, we circled our way down the spiral stairs, and silently the master of the council paused before a door at the bottom. A door of dull red metal. This is the keeping place of those who come before the council charged with wrongdoing, explained Bori Tolber. His fingers rested upon and pressed certain of a ring of small white buttons in the face of the door, and it opened swiftly and noiselessly. We entered, and the door closed behind us with a soft thud. Behold, one of those who lives in the darkness, said the master of the council grimly. Do not put on the manure until you have a grip upon yourself. I would not have him know how greatly he disturbs us. I nodded dumbly, holding the heavy manure dangling in my hand. I have said that I have beheld strange worlds and strange people in my life, and it is true that I have. I have seen the headless people of that red world Rollo, the ant people, the dragonfly people, the terrible carnivorous trees of L-472, and the pointed heads of a people who live upon a world which may not be named. But I have still to see a more terrible creature than that which lay before me now. He, or it, was reclining upon the floor for the reason that he could not have stood. No room, save one with a vaulted ceiling such as the great council chamber, could offer room enough for this creature to walk erect. He was, roughly, a shade better than twice my height, yet I believe he would have weighed but little more. You have seen rank weeds that have grown up in the darkness to reach the sun. If you can imagine a man who had done likewise, you can, perhaps, picture that which I saw before me. His legs at the thigh were no larger than my arm, and his arms were but half the size of my wrist, and jointed twice instead of but once. He wore a careless garment of some dirty yellow, shaggy hide, and his skin, revealed on feet and arms and face, was a terrible bloodless white, the dead white of a fish's belly, maggot white, the white of something that had never known the sun. The head was small and round with features that were a caricature of a man's. His ears were huge and had the power of movement, for they cocked forward as we entered the room. The nose was not prominently arched, but the nostrils were wide and very thin, as was his mouth, which was faintly tinged with dusky blue instead of healthy red. At one time, his eyes had been nearly round, and in proportion very large. Now they were but shadowy pockets, mercifully covered by shrunken, wrinkled lids that twitched but did not lift. He moved as we entered, and from a reclining position, propped up on the double elbows of one spidery arm, he changed to a sitting position that brought his head nearly to the ceiling. He smiled sickeningly, and a queer, sibilant whispering came from the bluish lips. That is his way of talking, explained Bori Tolber. His eyes, you will note, have been gouged out. They cannot stand the light. 
They prepared their messenger carefully for his work, you'll see. He placed his menore upon his head and motioned me to do likewise. The creature searched the floor with one white, leathery hand and finally located his menore, which he adjusted clumsily. You will have to be very attentive, explained my companion. He expresses himself in terms of pictures only, of course, and his is not a highly developed mind. I shall try to get him to go over the entire story for us again, if I can make him understand. Emanate nothing yourself. He is easily confused. I nodded silently, my eyes fixed with a sort of fascination upon the creature from the darkness, and waited. Back on the Urtak again. I called all my officers together for a conference. Gentlemen, I said, we are confronted with a problem of such gravity that I doubt my ability to describe it clearly. Briefly, this civilized, beautiful portion of Antri is menaced by a terrible fate. In the dark portion of this unhappy world, there live a people who have the lust of conquest in their hearts, and the means at hand with which to wreck this world of perpetual sunlight. I have the ultimatum of this people direct from their messenger. They want a terrible tribute in the form of slaves. These slaves would have to live in perpetual darkness and wait upon the whims of the most monstrous beings these eyes of mine have ever seen, and the number of slaves demanded would, as nearly as I could gather, mean about a third of the entire population. Further tribute in the form of sufficient food to support these slaves is also demanded. But in God's name, sir, burst forth Croy, his eyes blazing, by what means do they propose to enforce their infamous demands? By the power of darkness and a terrible cataclysm. Their wise men, and it would seem that some of them are not unversed in science, have discovered a way to unbalance this world so that they can cause darkness to creep over this land that has never known it. And as darkness advances, these people of the sun will be utterly helpless before a race that loves darkness and can see in it like cats. That, gentlemen, is the fate which confronts this world of Antri. There was a ghastly silence for a moment, and then Croy, always impetuous, spoke up again. How do they propose to do this thing, sir? he asked hoarsely. With devilish simplicity. They have a great canal dug nearly to the great polar cap of ice. Should they complete it, the hot waters of their seas will be liberated upon this vast ice field, and the warm waters will melt it quickly. If you have not forgotten your lessons, gentlemen, you will remember, since most of you are of Earth, that our scientists tell us our own world turned over in much this same fashion from natural means and established for itself new poles. Is that not true? Grave, almost frightened nods traveled around the little semicircle of white, thoughtful faces. And there's nothing, sir, that we can do? asked Kincaid, my second officer, in an awed whisper. That is the purpose of this conclave, to determine what may be done. We have our bombs and our rays, it is true, but what is the power of this one ship against the people of half a world, and such a people? I shuddered despite myself at the memory of that grinning creature in the cell far below the floor of the council chamber. This city and its thousands we might save, it is true, but not the whole half of this world, and that is the task the council and its master have set before us. Would it be possible to frighten them? asked Croy. I gather that they are not an advanced race. Perhaps a show of power, the rays, the atomic pistol, bombs. Call it strategy, sir, or just plain bluff. It seems the only chance. You have heard the suggestions, gentlemen, I said. Has anyone a better? How does Mr. Croy plan to frighten these people of the darkness? asked Kincaid, who was always practical. By going to their country, in this ship, and then letting events take their course, replied Croy promptly. Details will have to be settled on the spot as I see it. I believe Mr. Croy is right, I decided. The messenger of these people must be returned to his own kind. The sooner the better. He has given me a mental map of his country. I believe that it will be possible for me to locate the principal city in which his ruler lives. We will take him there, and then... May God aid us, gentlemen. Amen, nodded Croy, and the echo of the word ran from lip to lip like the prayer it was. When do we start? I hesitated for just an instant. Now, I brought forth crisply. Immediately, we are gambling with the fate of a world, 
a fine and happy people. Let us throw the dice quickly, for the strain of waiting will not help us. Is that as you would wish it, gentlemen? It is, sir, came the grave chorus. Very well. Mr. Croy, please report with a detail of ten men to Bory Tolber and tell him of our decision. Bring the messenger back with you. The rest of you, gentlemen, to your stations. Make any preparations you may think advisable. Be sure that every available exterior light is in readiness. Let me be notified the moment the messenger is on board and we are ready to take off. Thank you, gentlemen. I hastened to my quarters and brought the Urtax log down to the minute, explaining in detail the course of action we had decided upon and the reasons for it. I knew, as did all the Urtax officers who had saluted so crisply and so coolly gone about the business of carrying out my orders, that we would return from our trip to the dark side of Antry triumphant or not at all. Even in these soft days, men still respect the stern, proud motto of our service. Nothing less than complete success. The special patrol does what it is ordered to do, or no man returns to present excuses. That is a tradition to bring tears of pride to the eyes of even an old man, in whose hands there is strength only for the wielding of a pen. And I was young in those days. It was perhaps a quarter of an hour when word came from the navigating room that the messenger was aboard and we were ready to depart. I closed the log, wondering, I remember, if I would ever make another entry therein, and, if not, whether the words I had just inscribed would ever see the light of day. The love of life is strong in men so young. Then I hurried to the navigating room and took charge. Bory Tolper had furnished me with large-scale maps of the daylight portion of Antry. From the information conveyed to me by the messenger of the people of darkness, the Chissi, they called themselves as nearly as I could get the sound, I rapidly sketched in the map of the other side of Antry, locating their principal city with a small black circle. Realizing that the location of the city we sought was only approximate, we did not bother to work out exact bearings. We set the Urtac on her course at a height of only a few thousand feet and set out at low atmospheric speed, anxiously watching for the dim line of shadow that marked the twilight zone and the beginning of what promised to be the last mission of the Urtac and every man she carried within her smooth, gleaming body. Twilight zone in view, sir, reported Croy at length. Thank you, Mr. Croy. Have all the exterior lights and searchlights turned on. Speed and course as at present for the time being. I picked up the twilight zone without difficulty in the television disc and at full power examined the terrain. The rich crops that fairly burst from the earth of the sunlit portion of Antry were not to be observed here. The Antrians made no effort to till this ground and I doubt that it would have been profitable to do so even had they wished to come so close to the darkness they hated. The ground seemed dank, and great dark slugs moved heavily upon its greasy surface. Here and there, strange pale growths grew in patches, twisted, spotted growths that seemed somehow unhealthy and poisonous. I searched the country ahead, pressing further and further into the line of darkness that was swiftly approaching. As the light of the sun faded, our monstrous searchlights cut into the gloom ahead, their great beams slashing the shadows. In the dark country, I had expected to find little, if any, vegetable growth. Instead, I found that it was a veritable jungle through which even our searchlight rays could not pass. How tall the growths of this jungle might be, I could not tell. Yet I had the feeling that they were tall indeed. They were not trees, these pale, weedy arms that reached towards the dark sky. They were soft and pulpy and without leaves, just long, naked, sickly arms that divided and subdivided and ended in little smooth stumps, like amputated limbs. That there was some kind of activity within the shelter of this weird jungle was evident enough, for I could catch glimpses now and then of moving things. But what they might be, even the searching eye of the television disc, could not determine. One of our searchlight beams, waving through the darkness like the curious antenna of some monstrous insect, came to rest upon a spot far ahead. I followed the beam with the disc and bent closer to make sure my eyes did not deceive me. I was looking at a vast, cleared place in the pulpy jungle, a cleared space in the center of which there was a city. 
a city built of black, sweating stone, each house exactly like every other house. Tall, thin slices of stone without windows, chimneys, or ornamentation of any kind. The only break in the walls was the slit-like door of each house. Instead of being arranged along streets crossing each other at right angles, these houses were built in concentric circles, broken only by four narrow streets, then ran from the open space in the center of the city to the four points of the compass. Around the entire city was an exceedingly high wall built of and buttressed with the black, sweating stone of which the houses were constructed. That it was a densely populated city, there was ample evidence. People, they were creatures like the messenger, that the Chissi are a people, despite their terrible shape, is hardly debatable, were running up and down the four radial streets and around the curved connecting streets in the wildest confusion, their double-elbowed arms flung across their eyes. But even as I watched, the crowd thinned and melted swiftly away until the streets of the queer, circular city were utterly deserted. The city ahead is not the one we are seeking, sir? asked Croy, who had evidently been observing the scene through one of the smaller television discs. I take it that governing city will be farther in the interior. According to my rather sketchy information, yes, I replied. However, keep all the searchlight operators busy, going over every bit of the country within the reach of their beams. You have men on all the auxiliary television discs? Yes, sir. Good. Any findings of interest should be reported to me instantly. And Mr. Croy? Yes, sir. You might order, if you will, that rations be served all men at their posts. Over such country as this, I felt it would be wise to have every man ready for an emergency. It was perhaps as well that I issued this order. It was perhaps half an hour after we had passed the circular city when, far ahead, I could see the pale, unhealthy forest thinning out. A half dozen of our searchlight beams played upon the denuded area, and as I brought the television disc to bear, I saw that we were approaching a vast swamp in which little pools of black water reflected the dazzling light of our searching beams. Nor was this all. Out of the swamp, a thousand strange winged things were rising. Yellowish, bat-like things with forked tails and fierce hooked beaks. And like some obscene miasma from that swamp, they rose and came straight for the Urtak. Instantly, I pressed the attention signal that warned every man on the ship. All disintegrator rays in action at once, I barked into the transmitter. Broad beams and full energy, bird-like creatures, dead ahead. Do not cease action until ordered. I heard the disintegrator ray generators deepen their notes before I finished speaking, and I smiled grimly, turning to Corey. Slow down as quickly and as much as possible, Mr. Corey, I ordered. We have work to do ahead. He nodded and gave the order to the operating room. I felt the forward surge that told me my order was being obeyed and turned my attention again to the television disc. The ray operators were doing their work well. The searchlights showed the air streaked with fine siftings of greasy dust, and these strange winged creatures were disappearing by the scores as the disintegrator rays beat and played upon them. But they came on gamely, fiercely. Where there had been thousands, there were but hundreds, scores, dozens. There were only five left. Three of them disappeared at once, but the two remaining came on unhesitatingly, their dirty yellow bat-like wings flapping heavily, their naked heads outstretched and hooked beaks snapping. One of them disappeared in a little sifting of greasy dust, and the same ray dissolved one wing of the remaining creature. He turned over suddenly, the one good wing flapping wildly, and tumbled towards the waiting swamp that had spawned him. Then, as the ray eagerly followed him, the last of that hellish brood disappeared. Circle slowly, Mr. Corey, I ordered. I wanted to make sure there were none of these terrible creatures left. I felt that nothing so terrible should be left alive, even in a world of darkness. Through the television disc, I searched the swamp. As I had half suspected, the filthy ooze held the young of this race of things. Grub-like creatures that flipped their heavy bodies about in the slime, alarmed by the light which searched them out. All disintegrator rays on the swamp, I ordered. Sweep it from margin to margin. Let nothing be left alive there. I had a well-trained crew. 
The disintegrator rays massed themselves into a marching wall of death and swept up and down the swamp as a plow turns its furrows. It was easy to trace their passage, for behind them the swamp disappeared, leaving in its stead row after row of broad, dusty paths. When we had finished, there was no swamp. There was only a naked area upon which nothing lived, and upon which, for many years, nothing would grow. Good work, I commended the disintegrator ray men. Cease action. And then, to Corey, put her on her course again, please. An hour went by. We passed several more of the strange, damp, circular cities, differing from the first we had seen only in the matter of size. Another hour passed, and I became anxious. If we were on our proper course, and I had understood the Chissy messenger correctly, we should be very close to the governing city. We should... The waving beam of one of the searchlights came suddenly to rest. Three or four other beams followed it, and then all the others. Large city to port, sir, called Croy excitedly. Thank you. I believe it is our destination. Cut all searchlights except the forward beam. Mr. Corey? Yes, sir. You can take her over visually now, I believe. The forward searchlight beam will keep our destination in view for you. Set her down cautiously in the center of the city in any suitable place. And remain at the controls ready for any orders, and have the operating room crew do likewise. Yes, sir, said Corey crisply. With a tenseness I could not control, I bent over the hooded television disc and studied the mighty governing city of the Chissy. The governing city of the Chissy was not unlike the others we had seen, save that it was very much larger and had eight spoke-like streets radiating from its center instead of four. The protective wall was both thicker and higher. There was another difference. Instead of a great open space in the center of the city, there was a central park-like space in the middle of which was a massive pile, circular in shape and built, like all the rest of the city, of the black, sweating rock which seemed to be the sole building material of the Chissy. We set the Ertak down close to the big circular building, which we guessed, and correctly, to be the seat of the government. I ordered the searchlight ray to be extinguished the moment we landed, and the ethon tubes that illuminated our ships inside to be turned off so that we might accustom our eyes as much as possible to darkness, finding our way about with small ethon tube flashlights. With a small guard, I stood at the forward exit of the Urtak and watched the huge circular door back out on its mighty threads and finally swing to one side on its massive gimbals. Croy, the only officer with me, and I both wore our manures and carried full expeditionary equipment as did the guard. The Chissy messenger, grimacing and talking excitedly in his sibilant, whispering voice, crouched on all fours. He could not stand in that small space and waited. Three men of the guard on either side of him. I placed his manure on his head and gave him simple, forceful orders, picturing them for him as best I could. Go from this place and find others of your kind. Tell them that we would speak to them with things such as you have upon your head. Run swiftly. I will run, he conveyed to me, to those great ones who sent me. He pictured them fleetingly. They were creatures like himself save that they were elaborately dressed in fine skins of several pale colors and wore upon their arms between their two elbows broad circlets of carved metal, which I took to be emblems of power or authority, since the chief of them all wore a very broad band. Their faces were much more intelligent than their messenger had led me to expect, and their eyes, very large and round, and not at all human, were the eyes of thoughtful, reasoning creatures. Doubled on all fours, the Chissy crept through the circular exit and straightened up. As he did so, from out of the darkness, a score or more of his fellows rushed up, gathering around him and blocking the exit with their reedy legs. We could hear them talking excitedly in high-pitched to squeaky whispers. Then suddenly I received an expression from the Chissy who wore the manure. Those who are with me have come from those in power. They say one of you, and only one is to come with us to our big men who will learn, through a thing such as I wear upon my head, that which you wish to say to them. You are to come quickly, at once. I will come, I replied. Have those with you make way. A heavy hand fell upon my shoulder. A voice spoke eagerly in my ear. Sir, you must not go. It was Croy, and his voice shook with feeling. You are in command of the Urtak. 
She and those in her need you. Let me go. I insist, sir. I turned in the darkness, quickly and angrily. Mr. Croy, I said swiftly, do you realize that you are speaking to your commanding officer? I felt his grip tighten on my arm as the reproof struck home. Yes, sir, he said doggedly. I do, but I repeat that your duty commands you to remain here. The duty of a commander in this service leads him to the place of greatest danger, Mr. Croy, I informed him. Then stay with your ship, sir, he pleaded craftily. This may be some trick to get you away so that they may attack us. Please, can't you see that I am right, sir? I thought swiftly. The earnestness of the youngster had touched me. Beneath the formality and the sirs there was a real affection between us. In the darkness, I reached for his hand. I found it and shook it solemnly, a gesture of earth which it is hard to explain. It means many things. Go then, Andy, I said softly. But do not stay long, an hour at the longest. If you are not back in that length of time, we'll come after you. And whatever else may happen, you can be sure that you will be well avenged. The Ertak has not lost her stinger. Thank you, John, he replied. Remember that I shall wear my manure. If I adjust it to full power, and you do likewise, and stand without the shelter of the Ertak's metal hull, I shall be able to communicate with you, should there be any danger. He pressed my hand again, and strode through the exit out into the darkness, which was lit only by a few distant stars. The long, slim legs closed in around him, like a pygmy guarded by the skeletons of giants. He was led quickly away. The minutes dragged by. There was a nervous tension on the ship, the like of which I have experienced not more than a dozen times in all my years. No one spoke aloud. Now and again, one man would matter uneasily to another. There would be a swift, muttered response and silence again. We were waiting. Waiting. Ten minutes went by. Twenty. Thirty. Impatiently, I paced up and down before the exit the guards at their posts ready to obey any orders instantly. Forty-five minutes. I walked through the exit, stepped out onto the cold, hard earth. I could see behind me the shadowy bulk of the Ertak. Before me, a black, shapeless blot against the star-sprinkled sky was the great administrative building of the Chissy, and in there, somewhere, was Anderson Croy. I glanced down at the luminous dial of my watch. Fifty minutes. In ten minutes more, John Hansen. My name reached me, faintly but clearly, through the medium of my manure. This is Croy. Do you understand me? Yes, I replied instantly. Are you safe? I am safe. All is well. Very well. Will you promise me now to receive what I am about to send without interruption? Yes, I replied, thoughtlessly and eagerly. What is it? I have had a long conference with the chief or head of the Chissy explained Croy rapidly. He is very intelligent, and his people are much further advanced than we thought. Through some form of communication, he has learned of the fight with the weird birds. It seems that they are, or were, the most dreaded of all the creatures of this dark world. Apparently, we got the whole brood of them, and this chief, whose name I gather is Wei Shen, or something like that, is naturally much impressed. I have given him a demonstration or two with my atomic pistol and the flashlight. These people are fairly stricken by a ray of light directly in the eyes, and we have reached very favorable terms. I am to remain here as chief bodyguard and advisor, of which he has need, for all is not peaceful, I gather, in this kingdom of darkness. In return, he is to give up his plans to subjugate the rest of the entry. He has sworn to do this by what is evidently to him a very sacred oath witnessed solemnly by the rest of his council. Under the circumstances, I believe he will do what he says. In any case, the Great Canal will be filled in, and the Antrians will have plenty of time to erect a great series of disintegrator ray stations along the entire Twilight Zone, using the broad fan rays to form a solid wall against which the Chissy could not advance, even did they at some future date carry out their plans. The worst possible result, then, would be that the people in the sunlit portion would have to migrate from certain sections, and perhaps would have day and night alternately, as do other worlds. This is the agreement we have reached. It is the only one that will save this world. 
Do you approve, sir? No. Return immediately, and we will show the Chissy that they cannot hold an officer of the Special Patrol as a hostage. Make haste. It's no go, sir, came the reply instantly. I threatened them first. I explained what our disintegrator rays would do, and Wei Shen laughed at me. This city is built upon the great subterranean passages that lead to many hidden exits. If we show the least sign of hostility, the work will be resumed on the canal, and before we can locate the spot and stop the work, the damage will be done. This is our only chance, sir, to make this expedition a complete success. Permit me to judge this fact from the evidence I have before me. Whatever sacrifice there is to make, I make gladly. Wei Shen asks that you depart at once, and in peace, and I know this is the only course. Goodbye, sir. Convey my salutations to my other friends upon the old Urtak and elsewhere. And now, lest my last act as an officer of the Special Patrol Service be to refuse to obey the commands of my superior officer, I am removing the manure. Goodbye. I tried to reach him again, but there was no response. Gone. He was gone. Swallowed up in darkness and in silence. Dazed, shaken to the very foundation of my being, I stood there between the shadowy bulk of the Urtak and the towering mass of the great silent pile that was the seat of government in this strange land of darkness and gazed up at the dark sky above me. I am not ashamed now to say that hot tears trickled down my cheeks, nor that as I turned back to the Urtak, my throat was so gripped by emotion that I could not speak. I ordered the exit closed with a wave of my hand. In the navigating room, I said but four words. We depart at once. At the third meal of the day, I gathered my officers about me and told them, as quickly and as gently as I could, of the sacrifice one of their number had made. It was Kincaid who, when I had finished, rose slowly and made reply. Sir, he said quietly, we had a friend. Some day he might have died. Now he will live forever in the records of the service, in the memory of a world, and in the hearts of those who had the honor to serve with him. Could he or we wish more? Amid a strange silence he sat down again, and there was not an eye among us that was dry. I hope that the snappy young officer who visited me the other day reads this little account of bygone times. Perhaps it will make clear to him how we worked in those nearly forgotten days with the tools we had at hand. They were not the perfect tools of today, but what they lacked we somehow made up. That fine old motto of the service, nothing less than complete success, we passed on unsullied to those who came after us. I hope these youngsters of today may do as well. End of the Dark Side of Antry by Sewell Peasley Wright Recording by Jacob Dickerson